forward to Buff, A Collie, and other stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Buff, A Collie, and other dog stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Forward. A swirl of gold and white and gray and black, rackety, vibrant, glad with life's hot zest. Sunnybank collies, gaily surging pack, these are my chums, the chums that love me best. Not chums alone, but courtiers, zealots too, clean white of soul, too wise for fraud or sham, yet senseless in their worship ever new. These are the friendly folk whose god I am, a blatant, foolish, stumbling, purblind god, a pinchbeck idol clogged with feet of clay, yet eager at my lightest word or nod, they crave but leave to follow and obey. We humans are so slow to understand, swift in our wrath, deaf to the justice plea, meeting out punishment with lavish hand. What but a dog would serve such gods as we? Heaven gave them souls, I'm sure, but dulled the brain, lest they should sadden at so brief a span of heedless, honest life as they sustain, or doubt the godhead of their master, man. To-day a pup, to-morrow at life's prime, then old and fragile, dead at fourteen years, at best a meagre little inch of time. Oblivion, then, sans mourners, memories, tears, service that asks no price, forgiveness free, for injury or for injustice hard, staunch friendship, wanting neither thanks nor fee, save privilege to worship and to guard. That is their creed. They know no shrewder way to travel through their hour of lifetime here. Would man but deign to serve his God as they? Millennium must dawn within the year. End of Forward Section 1 of Buff, a Collie and Other Dog Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Buff a Collie and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Buff a Collie, The Fighting Strain, Part 1. She was a mixture of the unmixable. Not one expert in eighty could have guessed at her breed or breeds. Her coat was like a chow's, except that it was black and white and tan, as is no chow's between here and the Chinese wall. Her deep chest was as wide as a bulldog's, her queer little eyes slanted like a collie's. Her foreface was like a Great Dane's, with its barrel muzzle and dewlaps. She was as big as a mastiff. She was Nina, and she belonged to a well-to-do farmer named Shaw a man who went in for registered cattle and, as a sideline, for prize collies. To clear up, in a handful of words, the mystery of Nina's breeding, her dam was Shaw's long pedigreed and registered and prize-winning tricolor collie, Shawmere Queen. Her sire was Upstreet Butcher Boy, the fiercest and gamest and strongest and most murderous pit terrier ever loosed upon a doomed opponent. Shaw had decided not to breed Shawmere Queen that season. Shawmere Queen had decided differently. Wherefore, she had broken from her enclosure by the simple method of gnawing for three hours at the rotting wood that held a rusty lock staple. This had chanced to befall on a night when Tug McManus had deputed the evening exercise of Upstreet Butcher Boy to a new handyman. The handyman did not know Butcher Boy's odd trick of going slack in the chain for a moment and then flinging himself forward with all his surpassing speed and still more surpassing strength. As a result, the man came back to McManus's alone, noisily nursing three chain-torn fingers. Butcher Boy trotted home to his kennel at dawn, stolidly taking the wailing which McManus saw fit to administer. When Shawmere Queen's six bullet-headed pups came into the world, sixty-three days later, there was a loud and lurid blasphemy at her master's kennels. Shaw, as soon as he could speak with any degree of coherence, bade his kennelman drown five of the pups at once, 
and give like treatment to the sick as soon as its mother should have no further need of the youngster. At random, the kennel man scooped up five sixths of the litter and strolled off to the horse pond. As a result of this monopoly, the sixth puppy throve apace. When she was eight weeks old, fate intervened once more to save her from the horse pond. Mrs. Shaw's sister had come with her two children to spend the summer at the farm. The children, after a glimpse of the pure breed collie litters gambling in the shaded puppy run, had clamoured loudly for a pup of their own to play with. Shaw knew the ways of a child with a puppy. He was of no mind to risk chorea or rickets or fits or other ailments for any of his priceless collie babies, for such teddy bear handling as the two youngsters would probably give. Yet the clamour of the pair grew the more plagiantly insistent. Then it was that the bothered man bethought him of the illegitimate offspring of Shawmere Queen, the nondescript pup he had planned to drown within the next few days. The problem was solved. Once more peace reigned at Shawmere, and the two children were deliriously happy in the possession of a shaggy and shapeless morsel of puppyhood, in whose veins coursed the ancient royal blood of pure colliedom and the riotously battling strain of the pit warriors. They named their pet Nina, after a Pomeranian they had mauled and harassed into convulsions, and they prepared to give like treatment to their present puppy. But a crossbreed is ever prone to be super sturdy. The roughly affectionate manhandling which had torn the pom's hair-trigger nerves and tenuous vitality to shreds had no effect at all upon Nina. On the contrary, she waxed fat under the dual caresses and yankings of her new owners. Which was lucky, for while a puppy is an ideal playmate for a child, the average child is a horrible playmate for a puppy. With no consciousness of cruelty, children maul or neglect or otherwise ill-treat thousands of friendly and helpless puppies to death every year, and fond parents look on with fatuous smiles at their playful offspring's barbarity. Strong and vigorous from birth, Nina began to take on size at an amazing rate. Before she was eight months old, she stood higher at the shoulder than any collie at Shawmere. She looked like no other dog on earth, and she was larger by far than either of her parents. The cleverest breeder cannot always breed his best stock true to type, and when it comes to cross-breeding, especially with dogs, nothing short of Mother Nature herself can predict the outcome. Nina was a freak. She resembled outwardly neither collie nor pit bull terrier. Withal, she was not ill to look on. There was a compact symmetry and an impression of latent power to her, and the nondescript coat was thick and fine. In spite of all this, she probably would have met with a swift and reasonably merciful death on the departure of the two children that autumn, had not Shaw realised that the youngsters had been invited to the farm for the following summer, and that the presence of their adored Nina would save some thoroughbred pup from sacrifice as a pet. So the crossbreed was permitted to stay on, living at Shawmere on sufferance, well enough fed and housed in the stables, permitted to wander pretty much at will, but unpetted and unnoticed. The folk at the farm believed in breeding true to form, a nondescript did not interest them. And the loss was theirs, for the gigantic young mongrel was worth cultivating. Clever, lovable, obedient, brave, she was an ideal farm dog and wistfully she sought to win friends from among these indifferent humans. Sadly, she missed the petting and the mauling of the children. These so-called mongrels, by the way, are prone to be cleverer and stronger than any thoroughbred. Rightly trained, they are ideal chums and pets and guards, a truth too little known. If the farm people had troubled to give Nina one-fiftieth of the attention they lavished on the kennel dogs, they would have seen to it that she did not set forth one icy moonlight night in late November on a restless gallop over the hills beyond the farm, and this story would not have been written. Champion Shawmere King was one of the four greatest collies in America, perhaps on earth. He was such a dog as is bred perhaps twice in a generation, 
flawless in show qualities and in beauty and in mind he had annexed the needful fifteen points for his championship at the first six shows to which shaw had taken him everywhere he had swept his way to winners with ridiculous ease he was the sensation of every show he went to wisely shaw had withdrawn him from the ring while king was still in his glory and a few years later the champion had been taken permanently from the kennels and had been promoted or retired to the rank of chief house dog as perfect in the home as in the ring he was the pride and ornament of the big farmhouse on this particular november night of ice and moonlight king had turned his back on the warmth of the living-room fire and the disreputable old fur rug that was his resting place and had stretched himself upon the veranda mat head between forepaws his deep-set dark eyes fixed on the high road leading from town shaw had gone to town for the evening he had forbidden king to go with him but collie like the champion had preferred waiting in the cold porch for a glimpse of his returning master rather than lie in smug comfort indoors as he lay there he lifted his head suddenly from between his white forepaws and sniffed the dead cold air at the same moment the patter of running feet on the icy ground caught his ear scent and sound came from the direction of the distant stables then athwart his gaze loomed something big and bulky that flashed in the white moonlight cantering past him with an inviting backward lilt of the head as it made for the hills at once on the invitation king forgot his accruing years and his dignity with a bound he was at nina's side together the two raced madly across the yard and across the yellow road and on up into the hills it was a wonderful night for such a wild run pure breed and cross breed were obsessed by the urge of it all forgotten was king's stolidly loyal intent to lie on the chilly mat until shaw should return Forgotten was the wistful loneliness that had saddened Nina since the departure of the two children as The dogs bounded across the bright road the kennel man returning from a stroll caught sight of them and recognized them He shouted to King to come to heel the champion did not so much as look back At Shaw's call he would have obeyed though with vast reluctance But this man was a hireling and no dog knows better than a collie the wide difference in the loyal obedience due to a master and the negligible civility due to an employee so king kept on at the shoulder of his galloping new mate when shaw late in january followed the kennelman to the corner of the disused stall and stared down at nina his face was creased in a frown of disgust there deep in a pile of bedding lay the big young crossbred dog she looked up at the visitors with a welcoming glint of her round brown eyes and a thumping wag of her bushy tail she was happy at their notice she was inordinately proud of what they had come to see snuggled close against her side squirmed seven puppies they were three days old a more motley collection could not have been found in dogdom two were short-haired and bullet-headed and were white except for a brindle spot or two on head and hip throwbacks these to their warlike grandsire upstreet butcher boy three more were intermediate of aspect and might or might not be going to have long coats a sixth was enough like a thoroughbred collie to have passed muster in almost any newborn collie litter over this harlequin sextet shaw's contemptuous glance strayed then his gaze focused on the seventh pup and the frown was merged into a look of blank incredulity the pup was lying an inch or two away from his dam and several inches from the huddle of brothers and sisters every line of him was clearly visible and distinct from the rest to a layman he looked like a three-day-old collie to shore he did not any collie expert will tell you that at the age of three days a pup gives far truer promise of his future appearance to the trained eye than he gives at three months to the man who knows there is a look to the head especially that foreshadows the lines of maturity later all this foreshadowing vanishes 
at two or three months it is next to impossible to predict what the pup is going to turn into but at that one brief phase of babyhood the future often is writ clear shaw noticed the coffin shaped skull the square muzzle the full foreface the set of the tiny ears the general confirmation unbelieving he stared he picked up the wiggling morsel of fur and flesh and looked more closely at those prophetic headlines good lord he mumbled bewildered why why that's a a dog he's a living image of what king was at three days and i picked out king for a great collie when he was this youngster's age i've never known it to fail never up to now what's this measly mongrel doing with the head and build of a winner well ruminated the kennelman we know he's three-quarter bred don't we king's his sire and shawmere queen was his dam's mother best blood anywhere in colliedom ain't it and it had to come out somewheres didn't it cross-breeding ain't like mixing feed you don't get the same mixture every measureful you dip out some is all one kind and some is all another and some ain't neither look at them two white fellows they're straight bullpup wherever they got it not a trace of collie to em it's got to be averaged up somewheres and it's averaged up in that little cast you're holding there he's a collie just like the two whitish ones is all bull it's i've i've heard of such cases muttered shaw wonderingly as he laid the tiny pup back at the mother's side but oh he'll most likely develop a body that'll give him away or else the head won't live up to its promise well leave him anyhow when you drown the rest that can't do any harm sheepishly he gave the order still more sheepishly as he left the stall he stooped and patted nina's loving upraised head the first caress he had ever wasted on the lonely crossbreed thus it was that a great dog was born and that his promise of greatness was discovered barely in time to save him from death in earliest babyhood for the collie or near collie pup was destined to greatness both of body and of brain shaw named him buff this of course without the honorary prefix of the kennel name shawmere for buff could never be registered his spotty pedigree could never be certified he could claim no line in the american kennel club stud book he was without recognized lineage without the right to wear a number after his name a dog to be registered must come of registered parents these parents in turn must come of registered stock since no dog ordinarily is eligible to registration unless both his sire and dam have been registered that means his race must have been pure and his blood of unmingled azure since the beginning of his breed's recognition by the stud books buff's sire could have traced his genealogy back in an unbroken line for centuries king's nearer ancestors had been the peerless noblemen of dogdom nina's sire and dam though of widely different stock were born to the purple despite all this their descendant was a mongrel and barred by kennel law from any bench show the nameless pup grew to beautiful doghood to all outward appearance he was a pure-bred collie of the very highest type the head was classic in its perfection the body had the long wolf-like lines of the true collie the coat was a marvel the chest was deep and broad the body powerfully graceful no collie judge unhung could have detected the bar sinister the mind and the soul and the heart too were of the true collie sort but blended with the fiery gaiety and dash of his predominant breed ran unseen the steadfastness the calm the grimness the stark warrior spirit of the pitbull terrier this same strain ran equally unseen through the physique as well giving uncolly like staunchness and iron strength and endurance to the graceful frame imparting an added depth of chest a gripping and rending quality to the jaw muscles a mystic battling genius to body and to spirit yes old upstreet butcher boy was present in this collie grandson of his so were a hundred mighty bull terrier ancestors it was a strange blend yet it was a blend not a mixture nature for once had been kind 
and had sought to atone for the cruel joke she had played in the making of poor neglected nina the first half year or more of buff's life passed pleasantly enough at shawmere at the age of three months he was moved from the stables and put in one of the puppy runs nina was miserable at her baby's abduction whenever she was loose she would rush up to the puppy runs and canter whimperingly around their wire boundaries seeking to attract her little son's attention and always at first sight or sound or scent of her buff would leave his fellow pups and come hurrying to the wire to greet her through the wide meshes their nose would meet in a sniffing kiss and with wagging tails they would stand in apparent converse for minutes at a time it was a pretty sight this greeting and talk between the young aristocrat and his mongrel mother but at shawmere dogs were bred for points and for sale not for sentiment at first buff was wretchedly lonely for nina in the daytime it was not so bad for there was much to amuse and excite him in the populous puppy run but at night when the rest were asleep he missed his mother's warm fur and her loving companionship to some extent his homesickness for her wore off but never entirely always buff sought means to get back to her and their frequent meetings on opposite sides of the wire meshes kept the impulse alive in his heart the run contained a nine pup litter a couple of months older than little buff the biggest pup of the litter on the hour of buff's arrival undertook to teach the lonesome baby his place this he did by falling unexpectedly upon buff as the latter stood disconsolately at the fence looking for his absent mother the bully attacked the small newcomer with much bluster and growling and show of youthful ferocity it was buff's first encounter with the enemy his first hint that the world was not made up wholly of friendliness and it staggered him making no resistance at all he crouched humbly under the fierce attack the bully at this sign of humility proceeded to follow up his advantage by digging his milk teeth into buff's soft ear the bite stung and with the sting came a swirl of wholesome indignation into the exiled baby's hitherto peace-loving brain away back in his cosmos snarled the spirit of upstreet butcher boy scarce knowing what he did he flashed from under the larger body and made a lightning lunge for the bully's throat subconscious fighting skill guided the counter assault and lent zest to the grappling youngster's onset as a result some five seconds later the bully was on his back squalling right piteously for mercy from the opponent that had barely two-thirds his size and half his age by this time buff had shifted his vice-like grip from throat to forelegs and thence to stomach for along with the pit terrier's instinct for biting hard and holding on he had inherited his collie forebear's knack of being everywhere at once in a fight and of changing one hold for a better at an instant's notice which unusual combination would have delighted the soul of any professional dog-fighter yet the moment the bully was cowed into subjection buff let him up nor did he at food trough or elsewhere seek to take advantage of his new position as boss of the run he did not care to harass and terrorize lesser pups he preferred to be friends with all the world as he had been with his dear and friendly mother and so time wore on time that shaped the roly-poly buff into a leggy but handsome six months pup and now the promise of the three-day baby was fulfilled more and more every hour with puzzled pride shaw used to stand and inspect him the pup was shaping into a true winner but what could be done with him minus pedigree and plus bar sinister as he was if buff had been a thoroughbred he would have been worth a small fortune to his owner but now again fate settled the problem once and for all it was the night after the kennelman had put collars for the first time on all the pups in buff's yard these collars were of a rudimentary sort and for use only long enough to accustom the young necks to such burden each collar was a circle of clothesline with buckle and a tongue attached and with its wearer's kennel name a very different title from the lofty pedigree name scribbled on a tag attached to the steel tongue buff did not like his collar at all it fidgeted him and made him nervous 
the name tag flapped tantalizingly just beneath the reach of his jaws which added to the annoyance that was one reason why buff could not sleep after a time he gave up the effort at slumber and came out of the sleeping quarters where his companions were snoozing in furry comfort he made a few futile attempts to get the fluttering tag between his teeth and to rub off the collar against the wire meshes then with a sigh of annoyance he stretched himself out on the ground near the yard's gate he was still lying there when the kennel man came to fill the yard's water pans before going to bed as all the pups presumably were asleep in their houses the man did not bother to shut the wire gate behind him as he entered the yard buff saw the open portal beyond somewhere in the dense darkness were the stables where his mother lived his mother had always been able to solve his few perplexities and soothe his hurts in the days when he still had lived with her doubtless she could help him worry off this miserable collar and tag on the instant the pup trotted out through the swinging gate without so much as a glance at the dimly seen man who was bending over the row of pans and in another second the truant was on the road sniffing to locate the stables but the wind set strong from the opposite direction that night it brought to buff a faint whiff of stables it is true but they were the stables of a farmer a mile down the turnpike now those stable scents had been buff's earliest memory yet he did not know if there were any other stables extant besides those in which he had been born so locating the odor he ambled eagerly off down the road in search of his mother perhaps the length of the journey puzzled him but as every step brought the scent stronger he kept on at a bend in the road a half mile below he struck off into the fields and woods taking the shortest cut to the source of the ever increasing odor a furlong from the road his way led through a thick copse into it he galloped merrily in its exact centre his run was halted with much abruptness something touched him on the chest and in the same instant tightened painfully about his neck buff snorted with scared anger and lunged forward the thing about his neck promptly cut off his breathing apparatus and dug deep into his soft flesh resisting the panic impulse buff ceased to plunge and roll and sought to find out what had caught him he had run full into the middle of one of several nooses cunningly strung through the copse for foxes twisting his head he seized the noose's taut end between his jaws and fell to gnawing but he had his labor for his pains the thin rope was braided with strands of copper wire against just such a move on the part of some fox at gray dawn the hired man of the farm toward which buff had been faring came out to look at his traps all the nooses but one hung limp in one writhed and struggled a very tired little collie at sight of the farmhand buff stopped struggling and wagged his tail all humans so far as he knew were friendly to dogs here presumably was a rescuer and buff greeted him with warm cordiality the man stood gaping at him for a space then a slow grin began to crease his leathery mouth this was no fox he had caught but it was something that might well prove as valuable he knew shawmere and had often seen the Shawmere collies. He had heard that the Shawmere pups brought big prices. Here, evidently, was one of those pups, a Shawmere collie that had strayed in the night and had been noosed. By taking the dog back to its home, he might, perhaps, annex a five-dollar reward, but scarcely more. There seemed better ways of capitalizing his treasure trove. Paying no heed to Buff's friendly advances, the man left him there, hurried home received grudging permission for a half day off to visit the dentist in town and presently returned to the copse with a pig crate over his shoulder end of section one section two of buff a collie and other dog stories this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Buff, a collie, 
and other dog stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Buff, a collie, the fighting strain, part two. It was market day at the nearby town, and this would not be the first or the tenth time a dog had been exhibited for sale in the market enclosure. So, a hundred yards from his destination, the man lifted the pup from the too tight crate and fastened a rope to his collar. Then he prepared to lead his prize across to the market. But a dog that has never before been led has to be trained to follow at the gentle tug of the leash. This training sometimes takes only a few minutes, it is true, but it is needful. Now never before had Buff been on the end of a leash. He did not know what to do. He had lost, moreover, his early liking for his captor, and he wanted to go home. The first tug of the rope the puppy braced all four feet and pulled back. A tired-looking man, passing, in a still more tired-looking motor runabout, slowed his car at sight of the puppy's resistance and scanned Buff appraisingly. A second and more vehement jank of the rope, accompanied by a mouthful of profanity from the hired man, brought renewed resistance from Buff, and brought the stranger's slowing car to a complete stop. Buff braced his feet, and sought in vain to get some sort of purchase for his claws on the stone pavement. His conductor gave the rope a vicious jerk, and struck the puppy over the side of the head. This was the first blow received by Buff in all his short life. He did not at all grasp its meaning, but it hurt like the mischief, and it set his delicate ears to ringing. Incidentally, it brought the stranger at one jump out of his car and onto the narrow pathway. "'You idiot!' exhorted he, striding up to the farmhand. "'Don't you know any better than to hit a collie over the head? It might—' "'Don't you know no better than to butt in?' retorted the wrathful hired man. "'I'll make this mangy cuss mind me if, if I have to bust every bone in his worthless carcass.' By way of emphasizing his intention, he lifted the amazed buff clean off the ground on the end of the rope, and drew back one large booted foot for a drop-kick at the swinging youngster that had dared to disobey him. The kick might well have smashed every rib in the soft young body, besides rupturing his victim, but it did not reach its mark. The tired-looking man did two things, and he did them in practically the same gesture. With his left hand, he jerked the rope from the callous hand that held it, and lowered Buff gently to earth. With his right, he caught the farm hand deftly by the nape of the neck, spun him around, and bestowed upon him two swift but effective kicks. Both kicks smote the amazed labourer approximately at the point where his short jacket's hem met the seat of his trousers. As his assailant at the same time released his hold of the shirt-collar, his victim collapsed in a blasphemous heap at the gutter edge. Buff had been watching the brief exhibition with keen interest. Gradually it had been dawning on his unsophisticated mind that his escort was trying in some way to harm him, and that the stranger had not only averted the harm, but was punishing the aggressor. So, in his babyhood, had Nina flown at a stable cat, which had scratched Buff's too inquisitive nose. Once more the puppy knew the glad thrill of having a protector. As the fallen man scrambled to his feet, the stranger felt a cold and grateful little nose thrust into his palm. Instinctively, and with unconscious proprietorship, his hand dropped lightly on the silken head of the dog, but he kept his tired eyes unwaveringly on the man whom he had assaulted. The latter was on his feet again, swearing and gesticulating, but all at once, in the middle of a contemplated rush at his antagonist, he checked himself and looked worriedly up and down the deserted lane. In case of interference, in case of court proceedings, he might have trouble in explaining his possession of the dog. A dozen persons in court might well recognise the puppy as belonging to Shawmere, and there would be difficulties, all manner of difficulties, perhaps a jail term. Decidedly, it was a moment for while, rather than for force. There were worse things than a kick. Jail was one of them. "'If you're so stuck on the pup, why don't you buy him?' 
he whined. Instead of picking on a poor man's what's got a living to earn, he's for sale. I'm not buying livestock, began the stranger. Then he paused. The silken head under his hand shifted, and the cold little nose again nuzzled his palm. If you ain't buying, retorted the farmhand, give him back to me, and I'll take him to where I can get an offer on him. He snatched the rope before the tired-looking man was aware of the intention. But Buff was aware of it, well aware of it. As the rough fingers grabbed at his collar, the youngster growled fiercely and launched himself at the tyrant. Good, applauded the stranger, catching the angry puppy in mid-air and holding him under one arm. He's got pluck. That means you haven't had him long. If you had, you'd have cowed or killed him or made him mean and savage. He's thoroughbred, too. What do you want for him? If the price is fair, I'll buy. If it isn't, I'll carry him to the nearest police station. Which is it to be? Out of a volley of indignant denial, punctuated by such stock phrases as I'm an honest man, and the like, came at last the grunted words, Thirty dollars. He's worth a sight more, but he belongs to my boy, and we're moving, so I gotta sell him, and... Here's the cash, interrupted the stranger, taking out some greasy notes. But next time you steal a dog of this kind, just remember that thirty dollars is a fool's offer. It proves the dog is stolen. There's no use asking whom you stole him from. If there were, I might be able to return him. I had no idea of cluttering my life with anything again, even a dog. But if I don't, you'll maltreat him, and he's too good for that. There are easier ways, you know, of showing how much inferior you are to a dog than by kicking him. The stranger was doling out bill after bill from his thin roll. Finishing, he stuck the rest of the money back into his pocket, picked up Buff, and started for his car. Midway, he hesitated, and looked back at the gaping and muttering farmhand. By the way, he said carelessly, think twice before you steal again, not for the sake of your alleged soul, but because it's liable to land you in a cell. Nothing is valuable enough to steal. A cell isn't a pleasant place to live in, either. I know, he added as an afterthought, because I've just come out of one. He lifted Buff into the car, cranked the muddy and battered little vehicle, and climbed aboard. Then, as the farmhand still gaped at him with a new respect in the bulgingly bloodshot eyes, the stranger called back, If you decide to tell this dog's owner what has become of him, my name is Trent, Michael Trent, and I live at Boone Lake, about fifty miles south of here, at least I used to, and I'm on my way back there. It was Buff's first ride. For a few minutes it startled him to see the countryside running backwards on either side of him, and to feel the bumping vibration and throb of the car under his feet. But almost at once he felt the joy of the new sensation, as does the average dog that gets a chance to motor. Besides, this rescuer of his was a most interesting person, a man whose latent strength appealed to Buff's canine hero worship, a man, too, who was unhappy, and with true collie perception, Buff realised and warmed to the man's unhappiness. Added to all this, Trent had a delightful way of taking one hand from the steering wheel from time to time and patting or rumpling the puppy's head. Once the strong, slender fingers found the name tag. Buff, eh? murmured Trent. Is that your name or the colour of the goods that were marked by this tag? How about it, Buff? He accented the last word. In response, Buff's tail began to wag and one forepaw went up to the man's knee. Buff it is, nodded Trent, and a good little name at that. A good little name for a good little dog. And now that I've gone broke in buying you, will you please tell me what I'm going to do with you? I'm an outcast, you know, Buff, an Ishmaelite, and I'm on my way back to home place to live things down. It'll be a tough job, Buff. All kinds of rotten times ahead. Want to face it with me? Much did Trent talk to the dog during that long and bumpy drive. His voice was pleasant to his little chum, and it was the first time in Buff's six months of life that a human had troubled to waste three sentences of speech on him. The attention tickled the lonely pup. His heart was warming more and more to this tired-eyed, 
quiet voice new master of his Closer he cuddled to the man's knee looking up into the prison pale face with growing eagerness and interest There was a wistfulness in buff's deep-set eyes as he gazed With tense effort he was trying to grasp the meaning of the unknown words wherewith from time to time Trent favored him the man noted the pathetic eagerness of look and his own desolate heart warmed to this first interested listener he had encountered in more than a year he expanded under the flattering attention and his talk waxed less disjointed yes he said presently stroking the puppy's head as it rested against his knee we've a tough road to hoe you and i buff just as i told you since you're so different from two-footed curs that you're willing to associate with a jailbird Perhaps it would amuse you to hear how I came to be one, eh, Buff? At each repetition of his name, Buff wagged his tail in delight at hearing at least one word whose meaning he knew. Not to take up too much of your time, Buff, proceeded Trent, trying to negotiate a rutted bit of road with one hand, while with the other he sought to ease the bumping of the car for the dog. Here's the main idea. I just got that farm of mine on a paying basis and changed it from a liability to something like an asset When the smash-up came just because I chose to play the fool It was down at the Boone Lake store one night. I had walked into town for the mail It was being sorted and on the mail stage had come two biggish boxes of goods for corny fails He's the storekeeper and postmaster there buff Again at his name buff wagged his tail and thrust his cold nose into Trent's free hand The boxes were left on the store porch while Fales sorted the mail went on Trent It struck me it would be a corking joke to carry them out behind a clump of lilacs to one side of the store Where it was black dark that night I hid them there for the fun of hearing old Fales swear when he found them gone Well, he swore good and plenty and by the time he'd sworn himself out I'd have about enough of the joke and I was going to tell him about it and help him carry the boxes back to the store When a couple of chaps that I'd ordered off my land the week before Stepped up and told him they'd seen me lug the boxes away in the dark So I went out to the lilac clump to get the stuff and carry it back to fails and Buff the boxes weren't there. They'd been stolen in dead earnest while I had been standing in the store laughing at Fales's red-hot language it had been a silly joke at best for a grown man to play buff and Anyhow nobody but a born fool ever plays practical jokes always remember that Always remember that buff But you know how a fellow will limber up sometimes after a lonely day's work and how he'll do silly things Well, that's how it happened buff Of course I owned up and offered to pay the sixty dollars fails said the goods were worth But he wouldn't have it that way it seemed he'd been missing things for quite a while and his pig-headed brain got full of the idea that I had taken them all and That I pretended it was a joke when I was caught at last So he prosecuted and the county attorney was looking for a record and he got it buff He sure got it. I was sent up for 18 months just for being a fool and perhaps I'm a fool to go back now and pick up life again in a place where everyone thinks I'm a thief but that's what I'm going to do buff. I'm going to win through it'll take a heap of time and a heap more nerve to do it But well, we're headed for Boone Lake the sooner we begin the fight the sooner we'll win it He paused half ashamed of his babbling yet half relieved at being able to speak out At last to some listener who did not greet the tale with a grin of incredulity buff snuggled the closer to him and licked his clenched hand as the pain underlying the light speech struck upon the collie's sensitive perceptions Good little pal approved Trent touched by the wordless sympathy and feeling somehow less desolate and miserable than he had felt for many a long month It was mid-afternoon when they drove through the edge of a rambling village and on for a mile or so to a lane that led into a neglected farm This is home buff announced Trent his eyes dwelling with sharp unhappiness upon the tumble-down aspect of the deserted place Home Including the mortgage that went on to it to pay for my lawyer Did you notice how those village people stared at us and how they nudged each other? Well, 
That's just the first dose, a sort of sample package. Are you game to stand for the rest of it? I am, if you are. Running the battered car into a shed, Trent lifted Buff to the ground and set off towards the closed and forbidding house. Buff capered on ahead of him, trotting back at every ten paces to make sure his master was following. Trent paused for a moment in the dooryard to grope in his pocket for a key. Buff had gained the summit of the low veranda. As Trent halted, the pup took advantage of the delay to rest his car-cramped muscles by stretching out at full length on the narrow strip of porch. Trent took a step forward, then stopped again, this time to stare in bewildered surprise at the collie, for he noted that Buff was lying like a couchon lion, so far as his forequarters were concerned, and that his hind legs were both stretched out behind him. Now, as Trent's dog law told him, that is a position in which no collie lies, nor does any dog lie with his hind legs out behind him, unless he has in his make-up a strong admixture of bulldog blood. Yet Trent's dog knowledge also told him that this was apparently a pure-bred collie, perfect in every point. Wherefore, he stared in wonder at the phenomenon of Buff's position. Then, giving up the problem, he advanced into the house. Buff, springing up at once, followed Trent inquisitively through the doorway, as the key turned noiselessly in the lock, and the front door swung open under the pressure of the man's knee. Out gushed the musty odour that haunts unused country houses. It filled Trent's nostrils and deepened his sense of desolation. But, mingled with the smell of emptiness and disuse, another and more definite scent assailed Trent's nose. It was the reek of tobacco, of rank pipe tobacco at that. Nor was it stale. At the whiff of it, Trent stiffened like a pointing dog. His lips had been parted in a careless word to Buff. Now he choked back the unborn syllables. Treading on tiptoe, he made his way from room to room. Buff, sensing the other's efforts at silence, padded quietly at his heels. As they moved along, Trent paused from time to time to sniff the heavy air. Presently he flung open a door with no caution whatever, and sprang into a room beyond. It was the kitchen he entered in this whirlwind fashion, and he saw, as his nose had told him, that it was already occupied. A mattress had been hauled hither from one of the bedrooms. Sprawled thereon were two men. One of them was snoring, the other was puffing at a clay pipe. On the floor beside them lay a full sack. Piled in a corner of the room was a heterogeneous sack of household articles, a clock, a silver candlestick, three gilt picture frames, a plated soup tureen, some spoons, and similar loot. Trent had scarce time to note these facts, and a heap of empty bottles in another corner, before the smoker had dropped his pipe with a grunt and sprung scramblingly to his feet. The sleeping man, roused by his companion's noise, sat up and blinked. Hm, mused Trent, as the two stared owlishly at him. I see. You boys didn't reckon on my time off for good behaviour, eh? Thought I wasn't due home for another month or so. And in the meantime, this was a dandy place to hide in and to keep the stuff you steal. Clever lads, hm? The two still blinked dully at him. Evidently their density was intensified by the contents of some of the empty bottles lying near the mattress. I'm beginning to understand things, pursued Trent evenly. You two testified you saw me take away those boxes from Fale's store. I went to prison on your testimony. You have lived hereabouts all your lives, and there was nothing known against either of you, so your word was good enough to send me up, while you pinched the boxes and plenty of other things. Since then, with a glance at the plunder, you seem to have gone into the business pretty extensively, and you picked the safest place to keep it in. Now suppose you both... He got no further. By tacit consent, the two lurched to their feet and flung themselves upon him. But careless as had been his pose and his tone, Trent had not been napping. Even as he spoke, he realised what a stroke of cleverness it would be for the men to overpower him. 
and to claim that they had found him in his own house surrounded by these stolen goods it would be so easy a way to fix the blame of such recent robberies at a scourge boone lake on some unknown accomplice of trent's the craft that had once made them take advantage of his joke on fails would readily serve them again but as they flung themselves on trent he was no longer there in fact he was nowhere in particular also he was everywhere agile as a lynx he was springing aside from their clumsy rush then dashing in and striking with all his whalebone strength dodging blocking eluding attacking all in the same dazzlingly swift set of motions it was a pretty sight a prolonged carouse on raw whiskey is not the best training for body or for mind in an impromptu fight and the two trespassers speedily discovered this their man was all over them yet ever out of reach too stupidly besotted to use teamwork they impeded rather than reinforced each other up and down the broad kitchen raged the trio then ducking a wild swing trent darted in and uppercut one of his antagonists the man's own momentum in the swing added fifty per cent to the impetus of trent's blow trent's left fist caught his enemy flush on the jaw point the man's knees turned to tallow he slumped to the floor in a huddled heap not so much as waiting to note the effect of his upper cut trent was at the other thief rushing him off his feet and across the room with a lightning series of short-arm blows that crashed through the awkward defence and landed thuddingly on heart and wind in another few seconds the fight must have ended and ended with a second clean knockout had not one of trent's dancing toes chanced to light on a smear of bacon fat on the smooth floor up went both his feet he struck ground on the back of his head after the manner of a novice skater and half stunned he strove to rise but the impact had for the moment knocked the speed and the vigor out of him before he could stagger halfway to his feet his opponent had taken dizzy advantage of the slip snatching up one of the big bottles by the neck the thief swung it aloft measuring with his eye the distance and force needful to a blow over the head of the reeling and dazed trent then the blow fell but it did not fall upon trent it missed him by an inch or more and the bottle smashed into many pieces on the boards this through no awkwardness of the assailant but because a new warrior had entered the fray a flash of gold and white spun through the air as the bottle was brandished aloft and a double set of white teeth buried themselves in the striking arm buff from the doorway had been watching the battle with quivering excitement in his brief life he had never before seen prolonged strife among humans and he did not understand it to him it seemed these men must be romping as he and the other inmates of the puppy run had been wont to romp and he watched the wild performance in breathless interest but all at once his master was down and above him his foe was brandishing something thus menacingly had been raised the farm hand's arm when buff was struck surely this was not a romp his master was threatened and into the fight gallant young buff hurled himself attacking the arm that menaced the quiet voiced man he was learning to adore just below the elbow he found his grip deep drove the sharp white teeth not slashing collie fashion but with the grim holding power that had won a score of battles for old upstreet butcher boy on the swung canvas strip a hundred of his bull terrier ancestors had been made to strengthen the crushingly powerful jaw muscles they had bequeathed to buff the pup's forty pounds of squirming weight deflected the blow's aim and saved trent's skull from certain fracture the thief in pain and terror tore at the clinging furry body in frantic rage but the bulldog jaws were locked and the fearless collie spirit refused to unlock them at the yells and the hammerings of the panic-stricken thief all this for the merest second then still dizzy but himself again trent was up and at his foe the rest was conquest hampered by the ferocious beast that clung to his arm weak from pain and exertion the man was ridiculously easy to overcome 
"'You've won your welcome, buff old chum,' panted Trent as he trussed up his prisoners before marching them to the village. "'And you've saved a life I don't value over much. But you've done a lot more. You've let me clear myself of the other charge. These men will have to talk when the police sweat them, and that will make life worth while for me again. Yes, you've paid your way, all right. Something tells me you and I are going to be the best pals ever.' But where in blue blazes did a thoroughbred collie ever pick up that bulldog grip? End of section two. Section three of Buff, a collie, and other stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Buff, a Collie, and Other Dog Stories by Albert Pace and Terhune. Buff, a Collie, The Hunt is Up, Part 1. Michael Trent stood knee-deep in a grey-white drift that eddied and surged about him in tumultuous, soft waves, almost threatening to engulf him. The grey-white drift filled the tiny field in whose centre Trent was standing. Its ragged edges were spilling in irregular driblets into the adjoining fields and the road, scattering thence athwart the near countryside. To descend to bare fact, Michael Trent was in the middle of a milling and unruly flock of merino sheep, and he was, incidentally, in more or less of a fix. Of these sheep, seventy had belonged to his farm for months, and he had just added to them two additional flocks, new-bought, of thirty and of twenty-five each, making a grand total of one hundred twenty-five. This morning he had undertaken to pasture the three groups together in a single paddock field, while he should assort from the full flock a detachment of forty which he planned to drive to boone lake the following morning for the rural metropolis monthly market day it had seemed a simple thing this opening of the gates from two fields and driving into a third field the occupants of the other two so simple had it appeared that trent had not even enlisted the services of his beautiful collie buff in the petty task buff had been sent a half hour earlier to drive the farm's little bunch of cattle to the forest pasture a mile to the east and he was not yet back Trent had not bothered to wait for the collie's return before herding the three flocks of sheep into one. He had merely opened the gates leading into the central field where were pastured his original flock, and driven the newer occupants of those two fields into the middle one. The trouble had set in, as trouble is forever waiting to do, where sheep were concerned. One of the two new flocks had stampeded at sight and scent of the strange flocks and of the still more strange man. The stampeding flock had ploughed straight into and through the thick of the others, jostling and shoving them roughly, and communicating to them the stampede impulse. That had been quite enough, and all at once there were a hundred and twenty-five crazy sheep surging around Trent and radiating away in every direction. Their fear-driven bodies had found a weak panel in the hurdle fence that bordered the road. Down flapped the hurdle, and through the gap the nearest sheep began to dribble. The remainder were in great and ever-increasing danger of injury from the mad plungings of their companions. Another accidental shove had loosed the half-fastened latch on the centre-field's gate, which Trent had neglected to clamp when he came into the paddock, and another leakage seeped out through that opening. Helpless, wrathful, Trent waded through the turmoil, trying in vain to restore quiet, and to make his way to one or both of the apertures, before a wholesale stampede should empty the field through gate or hurdle, bruising and perhaps killing some of the weaker sheep against the sides of the gap. In his extremity, the farmer put his fingers to his lips and sent forth a whistle, agonizingly piercing and shrill. Then he turned back to his futile labors of calming the stampede. Because he turned back thus, he missed a sight really worth seeing. Over the brow of a ridge across the winding high road flashed a tawny and white shape that was silhouetted for an instant in the pulsing skyline, the shape of a large collie running as no dog but a collie or a greyhound can run close to earth in his sweeping stride buff was coming at full speed in response to the far heard whistle as he breasted the ridge crest the dog took in the scene below him in a single glance he saw the milling and straggling sheep and his distracted master in the centre of the panic throng thus he did not wait as usual for the signals trent had taught him in working sheep Instead, he went into action on his own account. Through the waves of grayish-white, a tawny and wedge-shaped head clove its way at express train speed. With seeming aimlessness, Buff swirled through the mass, shearing now to the right, now to the left, 
now wheeling, now halting with a menace of thundering barks. Yet not one move was thrown away, not one step was without definite purpose. As by miracle the charging sheep began to shape up in the field's centre, and while they were still following this centrifugal impulse, Buff was gone from among them. Out into the high road he flew, not waiting to find either of the openings, but taking the tall hurdles in his stride and in another second or so he had caught up with the rearmost of the stragglers, had passed it, and flashed on toward the more distant strays. Before the sheep in the paddock had shaken off their buff-given impulse to crowd to the centre of the enclosure, the collie had rounded up the scampering and bleating strays, and was driving them in a reluctant huddle through the gateway, and in among their fellows once more. Then, without resting, he swung shut the gate, an easy trick long since taught to him, as to many another working collie, and was guarding with his body the gap made by the overset hurdle. Trent ran up, fixed the hurdle in place, and then turned to pet and praise his exultant dog. Bah, he declared, taking the collie's fluffy head between his two gnarled hands, you're worth ten times your weight in hired men, and you're the best side partner and chum a lonely chap ever had. Buff grinned, licked his master's hand in quick friendliness, then lay down at Trent's feet for an instant's rest and for the thousandth time in the past three years the man noted something in the collie's pose that baffled him for though buff was lying upright and not on his side both hind legs were stretched straight out behind him normally no collie lies thus nor does any other canine that is not the possessor of a strong strain of bulldog it was buff's favorite posture and buff had every point of a purebred collie indeed of the highest type of show collie the man's bewilderment was roused, thus, from time to time, by the dog's various bulldog traits, such as lying with hind legs out behind him, or of holding a grip with the grim stubbornness of a pit terrier, rather than with the fiery dash of a true collie, or of diving for the heels of a driven cattle instead of her nose and ear. Waiting only for a moment while Buff was breathing himself after his hard run across the country, and his harder rounding up of the flock, Trent chirped to the collie, and prepared to shut the two new consignments of merinos back in their respective pens. The mingling of the three flocks had been a mistake. Until their forthcoming drive to market, the three bunches would fare better among their own acquaintances than among strange sheep. But the task was no easy one. To a casual eye, all the milling sheep looked just alike. Trent could distinguish by his personal red mark his original flock, but the two sets of strangers were unmarked, wherefore his chirp to buff. The moment the collie was made to see what was required of him, he was in the thick of the jostling turmoil again, flashing in and out like a streak of tawny fire, seeming to have no objective but to be scampering without any special purpose. Yet, within fifty seconds, he had headed a scared sheep through the gateway into the right paddock, where stood his master, then another, and yet another sheep. Then a huddled half-dozen of them cantered bleedingly into the paddock. While Trent looked on in wonder, Buff proceeded to segregate, until the entire twenty-five that belonged in this particular field were back within its boundaries. Trent shifted to the opposite paddock, whence he had turned the second flock of thirty into the central enclosure, and here Buff repeated his unerring performance. Though Trent was filled with amazed admiration at his pet's discernment, yet he recognized there was nothing miraculous in it. Buff had herded both these new flocks into the pastures at least three times before, on their way from pasture, during the few days Trent had owned them, he had become familiar with their scents and their separate identities after the uncanny fashion of the best sort of working collie. As the job ended and Trent started homeward, with Buff trotting chummingly beside him, a slender black saddle horse came single footing around the bend of the road between the paddocks and the farmhouse. Astride the black sat a figure as slender and high bred as the mount's own. The rider was a girl of perhaps twenty, clad in crash and booted. At sight of the man and the collie, she waved her crop gaily at them, and put her horse to a lope by a shift of the snaffle rein. Trent's bronzed face went red with surprised pleasure at the equestrian vision bearing down on him. Buff, after a single doubtful glance, recognized horse and rider, and set off at a run to welcome them. "'Why, I didn't know you were at home yet, Ruth!' exclaimed Trent, reaching up to take the gauntleted little hand extended to greet him. "'Your father said you'd be in the city another month. I saw him at the store last evening, and he said—' yes she interrupted i know he hadn't caught my telegram then aunt hester had to go out west to take care of her son my cousin dick clinton you remember he has a ranch in idaho she had a letter from him yesterday morning saying he'd broken his leg so she packed up right away and took the night train west and i came home 
oh said trent in an effort at sympathy and you had to cut your visit in half what a shame no she denied guiltily it wasn't a shame it was a blessing i oughtn't to say so but it was she did everything to give me a good time and i enjoyed it too ever so much but all the while I was homesick for these dear hills, and I'm so glad to get back to them. It's queer, she added, how I've grown to love the Boone Lake region, when Dad and I have lived here barely eighteen months. Eighteen months and nine days, gravely corrected Trent. I remember. I had gone to town that evening to get the mail, and when I passed by the old Brander house, I saw lights in it. At the post office, they told me a New York man and his daughter, some people named Hammerton, had moved in that day, and that they had come here for Mr. Hammerton's help. It wasn't more than a week, just six days to be exact, after that, when your father stopped here to ask me about the commission people I was dealing with in the city. He spent the morning, and he asked me to come and see him. It was the next evening I called. That was when I met you. So, do you keep a diary, she asked, in an amusement that seemed tinged with embarrassment, or have you a genius for remembering dates? And, pursued Trent, it was just sixteen days after that when we went horseback riding the first time. It, it may be a bit of silly superstition, he went on reluctantly, but I've always dated the start of this farm toward real success from the time you people moved to Boone Lake. Ever since then, I've prospered. Another six months will find me in shape to install the last lot of up-to-date machinery and to take over that eighty-acre tract of holdings that I've got the option on. Then I can begin to call my soul my own and live like real people and the first day I can do that, I'm going to put my whole fortune and my life, too, to the biggest test in the world, a test I hadn't any right to put it to while I was staggering along on the edge of bankruptcy, and with the future all so hazy. In six months I'll be able to ask a question that will show me whether all my luck is dead sea fruit, or, or the greatest thing that ever happened. He talked on, ramblingly, with an effort at unconcern, avoiding her eyes, but his gaze was on her little gloved hand as it lay athwart the horse's mane, and he saw it tremble and clench. Trent was half glad, half frightened, that she had caught the drift of his blundering words. Before he could continue, Buff created a diversion by routing a large and terrified rabbit out of a fence corner and charging down the road toward them in noisy pursuit of his prey. Bunny fled in a wind panic straight between the nervous horse's forefeet. The mount snorted and reared. As Ruth skillfully mastered the plunging steed, Trent caught the bridle close to the bit, and at the same time whistled Buff to heel. Unwillingly, but instantly, the collie abandoned his delightful chase and trotted obediently back to his master. "'Don't scold him,' begged Ruth. "'It wasn't his fault.' "'I'm not going to scold him,' laughed Trent, ruffling the dog's ears. "'It's many a long month since Buff needed a scolding. He didn't drive the rabbit this way. The rabbit drove itself before Buff could choose the direction. He... Buff is splendid protection for you, isn't he? She broke in, a tinge of nervousness in her soft voice. Why, personally, I don't stand in great need of protection, he smiled. I'm not exactly a timid little flower, but he protects the farm and the house and the livestock as efficiently as a machine gun company could. He's a born watchdog. Buff, realizing he was under discussion, sat down in the road between the man and the girl. He was wriggling with self-consciousness and fanning the dust into a little whirlwind with the lightning sweeps of his plumy tail as he grinned expectantly from one to the other of the speakers. But the collie's grin found no answer on Ruth Hammerton's flower-tinted face. The girl's eyes had grown grave, and there was a tinge of uneasiness in them. I hope you're right, she began, hesitantly, in saying you don't need any protection, and probably I'm foolish, but that's why I rode out here this morning. To protect me? he asked quizzically, yet perplexed at her new bearing. "'to risk your thinking me impertinent,' she evaded, "'by mixing into something that doesn't concern me. "'Anything that concerns me,' he said as she hesitated again, "'concerns you, too, so far as you'll let it. "'What's the matter?' "'She drew a long breath, knit her dark brows, "'and plunged into the distasteful mission "'that had brought her to the Trent farm. "'In the first place,' she began, "'do you know two men named Con Hagen and Billy Gates?' "'In stark surprise, Trent stared up at her. "'Why, yes,' he made answer, "'of course I do.' I have good reason to know them. I've told you the story. I told it to your father, too, before I accepted his invitation to come and see him. They were the two men I found in my kitchen when I— Yes, yes, she interposed hastily, as though trying to shield him from memories that must be painful. I know. Of course, I remember. But— But you never told me their names. I'm certain you didn't, or they'd have been familiar to me when I heard them this morning. This morning? echoed Trent, puzzled. I don't— I was at the store doing the marketing, she explained. 
some men were loafing on the steps just outside the window and one of them said a fellow from down logan way told me just now that con hagen and billy gates are due to be turned loose to-morrow and one of the other men said then trent had better hire a special cop and take out another life insurance policy both of them swore they'd get him if they was to go to the chair for it and that's one kind of an oath neither of em's liable to break i wouldn't like to be in his shoes just now that was all i could hear but it worried me i didn't associate the names with those men you had told me about perhaps because the phrase turned loose didn't mean anything to me but i came out here to tell you just the same it wasn't so much what the fellow on the store steps said as the scared way he said it that frightened me oh is there any real danger of nonsense laughed trent there's no danger at all and you're not to give the matter another minute of your precious thought but it was bully of you to come out here and warn me to care enough to you're making light of it just to make me stop worrying she accused i know you are won't you please notify the police about their threat won't you go armed won't you lock your house ever so carefully and keep indoors after dark and and wear warm flannels next to my skin all summer supplemented trent with vast solemnity and carry an umbrella and wear rubbers if the day is at all stormy and stop she commanded a hint of tears in her troubled young voice you're making fun of me heaven forbid he disclaimed piously you are she accused and you're doing it to lead me to think you aren't in any danger so that i won't worry but there is danger and i know it i'm positive of it now that you've told me who those men really are oh can't you listen he begged you're getting all wrought up over nothing ruth it's wonderful to have you bother your head over my safety but i am not going to let you do it here's the idea hagen and gates belonged to the riverside gang over in south boone the gang was cleared out some years ago some of its members went to jail the police had nothing definite on those two so they let them alone they picked up a living by their wits as semi-stationary tramps and they kept their petty thefts from being found out then when they'd sent me to prison they'd had it in for me ever since the time i caught them near my hen roost and ordered them off my land to the accomplishment of a stray kick or so they went into the business on a larger scale using my house as a place to store their plunder and to hide out in when the neighbors might be suspecting them of a share in the robberies when buff and i collared them they went all to pieces and confessed everything just as i told you before now i leave it to you if two such pitifully cowardly sneak thieves are likely to risk another jail sentence by trying to harm me it's ridiculous just the same i'm as much your debtor for warning me as if the danger were real ruth had dismounted during the talk now turning to the horse she prepared to get into the saddle once more but first she bent down and laid her soft cheek against the delighted buff's head under cover of the collie's glad whimper of friendliness she whispered very low take care of him buff oh take care of him for me then with assumed lightness she said as trent lifted her to the saddle probably you're right but it didn't do any harm to warn you i'm sorry if i've seemed foolish good-bye the little black horse cantered away michael trent and buff stood in the middle of the road watching the girl out of sight then trent turned slowly to his chum buff old man said he we made a good bluff of it just now you and i all the same it's up to us both to keep our eyes open for a while hagen and gates were soaked with cheap whiskey and sodden and jumpy after a week's carouse when the chief of police sweated them and he sure did sweat them good and hard it smashed their nerve because they were in prime shape to have it smashed and that's how he got them to go all to pieces and confess that and the goods he found on them and besides he told each of them separately that the other one had squealed and made them sore at each other that way but it wasn't like either gates or hagen to give in when they were normal they were as tough a pair of birds as i care to see they've had nearly three years to sober up in and get back their nerve by hard work and plain food and no drink buff and unless i've got them both sized up all wrong they've been spending most of that three years in planning how to get back at the man who spoiled their game and thrashed them hard and got them put away they've had plenty of time to store up venom buff and plenty of venom to store up yes and a good alibi too to clear them if anything happens to me buff we aren't going to be fools enough to worry but we'll keep awake just the same and lord but wasn't it glorious of her to care enough about me to come way out here and warn me buff she knew what i meant too when i told her about having the right pretty soon to ask a question i wonder if i'm pig-headed not to have asked it long ago instead of waiting till i had something beside my measly self to offer 
During his mumbled address to the wistfully listening dog, he had been moving homeward. Now, standing on his neat porch, the man looked about him, over his well-kept farm and its trim buildings, with a little throb of pride as he contrasted it with the way the home had looked on his return from prison three years earlier. The world, all at once, seemed to him a wonderful place to live in, and life seemed unbelievably sweet. His glance strayed down the long yellow road toward the old Brander place, and his lean face softened with a glow that transfigured it. End of section 3《Section 4 of Buff, a Collie, and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckel. Buff, a Collie, and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Buff, a Collie, The Hunt is Up, Part 2. Early the following morning, Michael Trent set off down the same yellow road toward Boone Lake for the monthly market day but the patch of road directly in front of him was no longer yellow. It was filled with jogging and tossing billows of grayish white. Forty sheep, consigned to the market, were moving in close formation in front of their staff-swinging master. For one reason alone did they keep this close formation, or indeed keep to the narrow road at all. That one reason was Buff. The collie, with calm generalship, was herding and driving them, and he was doing it to such perfection as to make Trent's rear guard task a sinecure. For more than thirty months now Buff had been the lonely Trent's closest chum, and almost his only companion. With true collie efficiency the dog had learned his hard and confusing farm lessons from the master who never lost his temper with him, and who never dealt unjustly by him. The bond between the two had sharpened and increased Buff's naturally human tendencies, and had brought out in him the great soul and uncanny brain wherewith nature had endowed him. A one-man dog, he idolized Trent, and served him with joyous zeal. Trent and Buff guided their woolly charges through the single winding street of Boone Lake, now beginning to fill with market-day traffic, and on to the fenced-in market square. There they herded the forty silly sheep in one corner of the livestock enclosure, a rod or two distant from a second and much larger flock. The owner of this second flock, a drover named Bain, had no dog to reinforce his shepherding. Instead, three of his hired men were busily running and shouting along the wobbly borders of the hemmed-in flock. Trent observed that they were not keeping their sheep in the best order, and that they seemed to be willfully exciting instead of calming the big flock. At this he wondered, even as he had wondered when these same shepherds had been equally awkward at two former market days, days whereon Trent himself had had no sheep to sell. He had heard rumors, odd, unconfirmed gossip, about this Bain's methods, and when he was not watching the antics of the three clumsy shepherds he observed Bain's craggy and shifty-eyed face with covert interest. A half-hour later, as a third huddle of sheep were driven into the enclosure, there was a new commotion among Bain's flock. All three shepherds dashed into the jostling mass, as in an effort to calm the pestered beasts. Instead, the noisy move stampeded the entire flock, they scattered, broadcast through the entire enclosure. The new arrival saw the panic. He jumped ahead of his own bunch of sheep as they were filing in, and drove them precipitately out of the square, standing at the opening to see that none of Bain's stampeding flock should follow. Thus, by rare presence of mind, and perhaps having also had experience with Bain, he avoided any chance of his sheep mingling with the runaways. Michael Trent was less fortunate. Full tilt into the very midst of his orderly flock charged some fifty of Bain's stampeders, a shepherd at their heels yelling to them to stop. The shepherd's voice and excitement had merely the effect of urging them on. Trent, watching, wondered wrathfully why so stupid a man should be placed in charge of any market consignment. Ragged and lean were the newcomers, of mixed blood and in bad condition, as was the way with Bain's livestock. They were not to be compared to Trent's fine merinos, either in blood or in condition assuredly not in value. In, to, and through the Trent flock swarmed the invaders. In ten seconds the two flocks were inextricably intertangled. In vain did Buff seek to restore order. He could do nothing against three men, four now, for Bain had joined the bedlam, whose yells and crazy rushes frustrated his every move. The dog looked up in angry bewilderment at Trent, mutely begging for advice as to how the snarl might be straightened out. But Trent did not see the appealing glance, his mind and his eyes were too completely taken up, staring at Bain and the latter's three men. 
for in a flash the quartet had changed from impotently roaring and running idiots to swiftly certain and efficient shepherds with splendid skill and speed they were quelling the stampede separating the two flocks and driving their own sheep to their allotted corner of the enclosure their command of the situation was something to admire presently the bane flock was in place orderly and safe with two shepherds in front of it to prevent further panic flight trent glanced back at his own flock attracted to them by a sudden stir among the forty buff leaving his master had plunged into the flock and was busily at work but for what purpose trent could not guess then almost at once he was out at the compact flock again driving in front of him six sheep which he detached from the remaining thirty-four and sent helter-skelter out into the middle of the square still wondering if his wise dog had lost his wits trent chanced to take special note of the six sheep as they hurtled past him and his face went blank the six were dirty thin undersized sparse of wool they were as different from his own plump flock as a scavenger horse from a derby winner before trent could speak or move buff had deserted the six ragged specimens leaving them bleeding forlornly in the centre of the square and he had bounded straight at bane's close huddled flock at one leap he was on the backs of the sheep which formed the outer wall of the mass he did not even waste time to plough through their tight-held front rank over their backs he ran and on until he vanished into the milling sea of wool then while bane and his three shepherds still shouted in uncomprehending dismay the dog appeared again on one edge of the flock moving slowly by reason of the press around and ahead of him he emerged from the bunch driving two sheep fat they were and of heavy wool undoubtedly merinos both across the narrow space buff headed them and drove them into his master's flock then on the instant he was in the bane flock again running once more over the scared backs of many sheep and dropping to earth in the middle of the throng a second time he emerged from the huddle again with two fat and woolly merinos ahead of him eluding bane who rushed down on him with staff upraised buff galloped the two into his master's corner and was back again without pausing in front of bane's flock but this time his self-imposed job was no sinecure bane and the three shepherds had shaken off their amaze and were ready for him shouting and threatening they advanced on the eager dog trent leaving his sheep in care of an official for the market sprang to buff's aid but the dog did not wait for him instead the collie made a growling dash at bane's booted legs bane jumped aside to guard his endangered shank and smote at the attacking collie with his staff the blow did not land buff was no longer there eluding the swung cudgel with wolfish agility he darted into the gap in the line the gap made by bane's sideways jump and was at the fiercely guarded flock once more as buff reappeared after an interval with another pair of sheep herded ahead of him bane and the shepherds were waiting for him but so was trent a shepherd made a lunging rush at the two salvaged sheep bane aimed a murderous blow at the dog trent with ludicrous ease tripped the awkwardly charging shepherd and sent him a sprawl on the ground trent's staff met the descending stick of bane and the latter's weapon was shattered by the impact in practically the same gesture trent leaped between the dog and the two remaining shepherds menacing them with staff and voice and holding them in check while the collie cantered the rescued sheep back into trent's flock bane swearing and mouthing strode in pursuit he was met by a crouching collie who faced him with an expression that looked like a smile and which was not a smile bane hesitated whirling on the tranquil trent your cur stolen six of my sheep he thundered in righteous indignation i'll no you won't mr bane gently contradicted trent his pleasant voice slow and drawling stop a second and cool off and you'll let the matter drop you'll let it go as a mistake of your men's in separating the two flocks men often make mistakes you know buff never does there are six sheep straying over yonder six thin cross-bred sheep not merinos they are yours i tell you spluttered bane though visibly uneasy at trent's manner and at the crowd that was collecting three deep around them no intervened trent don't tell me mr bane don't bother to i see it was a mistake just as you're beginning to see it there is no sin in a mistake though there's always sure to be a mistake in a sin my sheep are safe so are yours let the matter drop i've seen stampedes of your flocks before and i've heard of them too this time no harm's done that's all i think i'll get a court order for my sheep your cur run off flared bane in a last rally and he turned to his shepherds commanding here boys go and get them sheep you run into that bunch get em speaking of court orders said trent still in the same cool slow tones of indifference and interposing his own lithe body beside the bristling buffs to the hesitant advance of the shepherds when you get yours 
be sure to tell the judge that I'm ready to show him the secret mark on each and every one of my sheep, to prove they're mine. Now, if your men care to keep on edging toward my flock, Buff and I will try to entertain them as best we can till the police come up. Bane glowered horribly into the smilingly level eyes that met his glare so tranquilly. Then, with a grunt, he turned back to his own corner, the three shepherds trailing after him. Behind his calm exterior, Michael Trent drew a long breath of relief. These forty sheep of his were culled from the two new flocks he had so recently purchased. None of them bore a mark. The only secret mark on them was Buff's unerring knowledge of their identity. Trent stooped and petted the collie lovingly on the head and stroked the massive ruff. "'That's how Mr. Bain makes money, old man,' he whispered, one of his several hundred ways. "'We couldn't have proved he didn't have six fat merinos in that mangy bunch of sheep, and his shepherds would have sworn to them. Figure out the price difference between six of our best sheep and six of Bain's scarecrows, and you'll know to a penny how much cash you saved me today, Buff.' The collie did not get the sense of one word in five, but he realized he had somehow made Trent very proud of him, and that he was being praised. So for a moment he forgot to be stately and aloof. He wagged his tail wildly and caught Trent's caressing hand between his mighty jaws in well-simulated savageness, pretending to bite it ferociously, while not exerting the pressure of a fraction of an ounce, which was one of Buff's many good modes of showing affection for the pleasant-voiced man who was his master and his god. Dusk had fallen when Trent and Buff turned in at the gate of the silent farmhouse. The day had been prosperous. The Merinos had brought a well-nigh record price, the whole forty having been bought by an up-country stock farm man. Thus, Trent's investment in them had turned into an unexpectedly quick and large profit. Also, he had been congratulated by a dozen fellow sheep-raisers on his victory over Bain. He had banked his market check, the Boone Lake Bank remaining open until seven in the evening on market days, and had spent a blissful half-hour on the Hammerton porch with Ruth on the way home. Now, comfortably tired and buoyed by an equally comfortable sense of well-being, he lounged up the short path leading from the road to his house. As he reached the fence-gate, he had bidden Buff fetch the cows from their upland pasturage and drive them to the barn. He himself went around to the side door for the milk pails that were kept in the kitchen during the day. He unlocked and opened the door and stepped in. As he did so, a bag was thrown over his head and the upper part of his body, a bag whose bottom was soaked in something that smelt like crushed apples. A rope was flung about his arms at the same moment, and its noose ran tight. Vainly, Trent stamped and writhed to free himself. His wiry strength was pinioned and cramped by the noose and the impeding bag. More of the apple-smelling liquid was dashed into his face through the sack's loose meshes. Then, as he still struggled and choked, something crashed down upon his skull. Buff trotted obediently across the road toward the hill pasture. Like his master, Buff had had a happy and busy day. He had been praised much and petted much by Trent, and had had a truly marvelous dinner at the Boone Lake Hotel. He was complacently at peace with the world. Then, all at once, he was not at peace with anything, for far behind him he heard the noise of scuffling feet and of a loud, choking gasp, and his weird sixth sense told him his master was in trouble. Wheeling, he set off for the house at a tearing run. Excited as he was, he was aware of a strange and vaguely remembered foot scent as he whirled in through the gate and up the path. His faint memory of the scent was hostile. He could not remember why. At a bound, he reached the open kitchen door. Trent was lying inert and crumpled on the floor. Two men were bending over him, and as he charged, Buff caught their scent. Like a rabid wolf, he hurled himself upon the nearest of the men. His teeth closed in Hagen's shoulder with the bone-crushing grip of his pit-terrier ancestors. At the same moment, Gates drew a pistol and fired point-blank at the leaping dog. Buff's muscles collapsed. He slumped to the floor and lay lifelessly across the body of his master. "'What did you shoot for, you chucklehead?' panted Hagen, nursing his rent shoulder. "'Want to bring all Boone Lake down on us?' "'Only way to get him,' retorted Gates. "'He'd have chewed us both into Hamburg steak if I hadn't.' Quickly and deftly the two worked. First, assuring themselves that no one had heard the shot, they went through the house and through Trent's clothes. Then, their loot gathered, they carried it to the barn and stowed it in Trent's new car. After which, under cover of darkness and carrying Trent between them, they loaded their victim into the tonneau, covering him with a blanket. Then, while Hagen groaningly and laboriously cleaned away the tell-tale blood spots and other marks of struggle, Gates scowled down at the motionless huddle of tawny, soft fur. "'Gotta lug him along with us, too, I suppose,' he grunted. "'Can't leave him here.' "'Get a stone,' commanded Hagen. "'A big one. Tie it around his neck, then drop him down the well.' Gates groped around the steps until he found one of the old-time door stones, and in another minute or so this was firmly affixed to Buff's collar by a stout rope. As Gates picked up the heavy dog and carried him puffingly to the well, the telephone bell rung. 
tossing dog and stone over the well curb gates bolted for the house in sudden fright hagen had already gone into the hall and was lifting the instrument from its table hallo he grunted in a stifled voice as he motioned gates to silence his face cleared and he made answer to the query at the far end yep this is michael trent yes no i won't be here nope i'm just starting off on a motor trip up country i may go a couple of thousand miles before i get back maybe i won't ever come back i'm dead sick of this hole yep good-bye he hung up the receiver corking good alibi he chuckled gleefully some feller that trent sold some sheep to today don't seem to know trent well didn't suspicion the voice now when trent and his car are missing nobody'll ask nosy questions come along they hurried to the barn backed the laden car out and drove away into the night not for some minutes did buff recover consciousness from the bullet grays that had wrapped his skull so hard as to stun him and to gash the silken fur above his eye he woke in decided discomfort his head was still in dire pain and he was fastened securely in one spot when michael trent had had his farm drinking water tested a year earlier he had learned that the well showed strong traces of stable drainage wherefore the well had been filled up to within two yards of the surface and a new well had been dug on higher ground behind the house thus it was that buff woke to find himself sprawling on a pile of rubble with a short rope attaching him to a large stone indignantly the collie set to work gnawing the rope in two this accomplished he got dizzily to his feet a rush and a scramble and he was up the stone-lined wall of the well and on firm ground above straight to the house he ran his teeth gleaming his ruff a bristle at the kitchen door he halted the door was shut he could not get in but his scent told him that trent was no longer there his scent told him more much more it confirmed his memory of his master's two assailants and stamped their odour for ever in his mind their steps led him to the barn whither they carried trent the senseless man's clothing had brushed the lintel of the barn door as they had lifted him into the car buff looked wildly about him sniffing the air his tense brain telling him much then a red light began to smoulder in his deep-set eyes out into the high road he dashed not running now like a collie but like a timber wolf as he ran he paused but once and then he waited only long enough to throw his head aloft and shatter the night silences with a howl as hideous and discordant as it was ear-splitting a mile away a drowsy farmer dropped his weekly paper with a shiver if i was back on the frontier he mused to his startled wife i'd say that that was a mad wolf a howlin and i'd say the hunt was up end of section four section five of buff a collie and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ellen preckle Buff, A Collie, and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Buff, A Collie, Masterless, Part 1. Now this is the story of the masterless wanderings of Buff. Long and unavailingly did Buff follow the track of the car which had borne away the man who was his god. Dizzy from his wound, faint from loss of blood, heartbroken and frantic at the vanishing of his master, the collie sped in pursuit. The scent was fresh in his nostrils, the scent of the kidnapped man and of his abductors, and the familiar odor of trent's car mile after mile galloped buff through the summer night trusting wholly to his sense of smell with the peculiar mile-eating canter of his wolf ancestors he stuck to the trail even when the car's track ceased to furrow the dusty country road and passed clean through a busy little city through the city's myriad odors and distractions buff stuck to the scent of his master's car other cars hundreds of them had laced the trail the asphalt's smell of gasoline and grease was sickeningly acute in the dog's nostrils confusing and sometimes all but blotting out the scent he was following yet never quite did buff lose the track under the lamps of motor trucks and trolley cars he flashed swerving barely far enough out of their way to save himself from death then ever picking up the scent again once a troop of small boys gave chase realizing the chances of reward that lay in the capture of so fine a dog but Buff, with that odd and choppy wolf stride of his, soon outdistanced them, and they threw stones futilely in the wake of the flying, tawny shape. Again a great Dane whirled out of a dooryard and pursued the passing collie. Buff was aware of the larger dog's presence only when a spring and a snarl warned him to wheel, in bare time to avoid the full shock of the Dane's charge. Buff had no time for fighting. 
Paying no further heed to the attacking giant, he swerved from the assault, caught the trail again, and increased his pace. But the Great Dane would not have it so. His instincts of a bully were aroused by the meek flight of this stranger dog from his onset, and he pursued at top speed. A motor-bus whirring out from a side street checked Buff's flight for an instant by barring the way. Before he could get into his stride again, the Dane had hurled himself upon the fugitive, bearing him to the ground in the slime and mud of the greasy street. By the time Buff's tawny back smote the asphalt, he was master of the situation. Furious at this abominable delay, he reverted to type, or to two types. It was his wolf ancestry that lent him the wit and the nimbleness to spin to his feet under the big assailant's lunging body, and to find by instinct the hind leg tendon of the lumbering brute. All this in one lightning swirl, and before the Dane could slacken his own pace, but it was his pit-terrier strain that made him set his curved eye-teeth deep and firmly in that all-important tendon, and to hold his grip with a vice-like steadfastness and might, while he ground his jaws slowly together. Almost before the smitten mongrel could shriek forth his agony and fear, before the toppling gigantic body could crash to the ground, the fierce grinding jaws had met in the centre of the thing they gripped, and leaving behind him the crippled and howling bully, Buff slipped through the human crowd that had begun to collect, and was casting about once more for the ever-fainter trail of Trent's car. In a moment he had found it, and he sped along in renewed zest. Through the city and out into its straggling suburbs galloped Buff. There, a mile beyond, was a wayside garage, with one or two ramshackle buildings on either side of it. Behind them a rotting dock nosed its way out into the river. Here, at times, tugs and tenders and lighters touched, on their way between the city and the ocean harbour eight miles to the southward. At the garage the trail ended. Here had halted Michael Trent's car. Buff ran twice around the closed garage. His nostrils told him the car was inside that dark and deserted building. He had followed it twenty miles or more. He was worn out from the run, yet here the scent of his adored master was stronger than it had been anywhere along the way. The dog scratched imperiously at the garage door. The sagging wood shook and grumbled under the impact, but it held firm. Nor did any one come from inside to answer the summons. Frightened at the silence, yet certain of the scent he sought, Buff circled the building once more, nose to earth, steps uncertain, head darting from side to side. The quest did not bring to his senses any trace of Trent, but it did bring to him a dual odor that set the dog's ruff to bristling and his teeth to glinting from under his uncurled lip. For here, side by side, had trodden Hagen and Gates. Not more than an hour earlier they had walked here, their heels striking deep in the dirt, as though they carried between them some heavy weight. They had walked thus to the dock and to its outer edge. Baffled, the collie made his way back to the garage. There, distinct through the reek of gas and oil and dead tobacco and dried grease, he caught again the scent of his master. With a little whimper of eagerness, Buff paused beneath a shut and locked window some three feet from the ground. He gathered his waning strength for one more effort, and sprang upward. Through the thin and cracked glass and rotting sash he clove his way, alighting on the slimy concrete floor of the garage amid a shower of window particles. The glass, by some minor miracle, scarce cut the dog. Apart from a scratch or two on his pads and a shallow cut to the nose, he was none the worse for his dive through the shaky casement. The instant he touched ground, Buff was in a new search of his master's scent, and at once he found it. There were three cars in the garage. Two of them were old and battered in parlous condition. The third was still new, and to this new car Buff ran. It was Michael Trent's car, empty as it was now, even of cushions and dashboard equipment, and shorn of its license numbers. Buff knew it at a single sniff. He knew more. He knew that in this car's muddied tonneau, little over an hour ago, Trent had been lying. Yes, and that Gates and Hagen had been occupying the front seat, also that the nasty smell of some medicine or drug was strong in the tonneau. But the one thing that interested Buff was Michael Trent's recent presence there. Being only a real-life dog and not a storybook detective, it occurred quite naturally to Buff that where Trent had been so lately, he would in time be again. Trent had left the car, that was evident, but doubtless he would return to it. Every day he used this car, and of course he would come back to it soon or late. Wherefore, as Trent's trail led no farther, there seemed nothing for Buff to do but to wait for him here. Accordingly, the collie stepped up on the running board and through the open doorway of the tonneau. 
stretching himself out there as close as possible to the space where Trent had lain, Buff began his vigil, waiting in worried patience for the return of the man whom he had chosen as his deity. And so in time he fell asleep, worn-out nature renewing itself in his tired body and building up again the strong young tissues and the wanted vigor of frame and of brain. Fast as the dog had run, and with as few delays, yet he had arrived far too late to ameliorate or even share his master's doom. Fast as a collie can run, and no dog but the greyhound can outstrip him, yet a new and desperately driven motor-car can cover thrice the same ground in far less time than can he. Moreover, Buff had wasted many precious minutes in senselessness in the waterless well, and many more in gnawing through the rope, and in casting about the farmhouse and in the yard for Trent's trail. More than an hour ahead of him, Gates and Hagen had reached their destination. They had disposed of the stolen car, borne off the valuables they had taken from Trent's home and from his body, and did all else they had planned in advance to do. The only creature with a clue to the victim's whereabouts had come up an hour too late. It was daylight when Buff awoke. He was stiff and drowsy. The bullet graze and the glass cut on his head were throbbing. He was thirsty, too, and hungry. He did not wake of his own accord, but through force of habit, as the crunching of human feet reached his sleeping senses. He lifted his head. Steps were clumping up to the garage door, and a key was at work in the padlock. Buff was keenly interested. A dog awakens instantly, and with all his faculties acute, with him there is none of the owlish stupidity and dazedness which marks the transition from sleep to awake among humans. At one instant he is fast asleep, at the next he is wide awake, and so it was with Buff. He was interested now at the sound of steps, because he hoped one of the two men whose tread he heard might be Michael Trent, but at once he knew it was not. Trent's step was as familiar to Buff as was Trent's scent, and neither of these two approaching persons had a semblance to Trent's light springy stride. Indeed, before the garage door opened more than an inch, Buff's nostrils told him that these newcomers were total strangers to him. One of the two men was elderly and disreputable. The other, a mere boy, had not lived long enough to look as thoroughly disreputable as did his companion, but very evidently he had done his best along that line in the few years allotted him. The older man was approaching Trent's car, talking over his shoulder to the youth. "'Put them new license plates on this thing, first thing you do,' he commanded. "'Then get a chisel and see what you can do with the motor number.' and we'll have to—' He stopped with much abruptness. As he had been speaking, he advanced to Trent's car, and had laid a careless hand on the swinging tonneau door. At the same moment he was aware of a tawny shape, bloody of head, that arose from the depths of the tonneau, teeth bared and eyes menacing. This car belonged to Michael Trent as much as did the Trent farmhouse. Long since Buff had learned that it was his sacred duty to guard the one as rigidly as the other and here this stranger was laying an impious hand on the machine. At the apparition of the threatening head and the sound of the equally threatening growl, the man recoiled from the car, jerking back his dirty hand from the door, as suddenly as if the latter had turned into a snake. Open-mouthed, the two men surveyed Buff. Quietly, but not at all friendlily, the collie returned their stare. He had no quarrel with either of them. For all he knew or cared, this might be their rightful home. So long as they should abstain from touching or otherwise molesting Trent's car, he was content to leave them alone. But his pose and expression made it very clear that he expected the same sort of treatment from them, and that he was calmly ready to enforce such treatment. "'It's... it's... why, it's a dog!' cleverly observed the youth, breaking the momentary silence of surprise. "'It's... it's a collie,' amended his senior, finding his voice and his wits together, a top-notcher at that. "'Must have sneaked in here while we was closing up last night. "'A dog like that's worth a big heap of cash, "'and most likely there'll be a reward offered for him. "'See, he's got a good collar on, and he's chawed his rope through. "'He's worth keeping till called for. "'Go catch him, Sonny, and tie him up yonder till we can take him over to the house.' "'The man spoke wheedlingly to his young companion, "'but the lad had noted his sire's own reception from Buff, "'and modestly he hung back. "'At the other's repeated and sterner mandate the youth remarked, think I'll run up home for breakfast. I'll be back in ten minutes. You might tie him up yourself while I'm gone. I ain't much used to dogs. The older man scowled, then his brow cleared. We'll both go to breakfast, he decreed. We'll lock this feller in here while we're gone. On the way back, I'll stop for Joe Steers. He's got a passel of dogs, and he understands handling them. Come on. Compromising thus, they departed, closing and locking the garage door behind them. 
neither of them having gone to the far side of the room they did not see the broken sash and the mess of glass on the floor a bit of wreckage hidden from their view by the three cars for a few minutes after they left him buff lay still then he got up stretched fore and aft collie fashion and stepped down to the concrete floor making his way across to a water tub he drank long and deep then he stood irresolute he had been in this ill-smelling place for many hours michael trent had not returned to his car michael trent's odour had grown faint almost imperceptible there was no reason after all to believe that trent would come back here a few months ago he had taken his old car to a garage and had never gone back for it perhaps that was what he would do in the present case meanwhile buff was bitterly homesick for his master and buff was worried to the depths of his soul as to what might have befallen trent at the hands of the two men with whom the dog associated his master's departure the men he was learning to hate with a mortal hatred because he knew them for his master's enemies by loitering here he could get no trace of trent nor of the men who had carried him away refreshed and once more alert he prepared to take up his quest again an easy leap carried buff out through the smashed window into freedom as he stood in the road hesitant he saw bearing down toward him at a run the two men who had just left the garage and with them a third man who carried a rope and a club as the trio very evidently meant to seize him and as he had no reason for staying there in the road to be caught the collie set off across the nearest field at a hard gallop heading for a distant patch of woods the men gave chase but without bothering to increase his speed he soon left them panting and swearing far in the rear presently they gave up the pursuit midway in the field buff scared up an unwary young rabbit at the sight of the pneumatically bouncing cottontail the collie remembered he himself had eaten nothing in nearly twenty-four hours like a furry whirlwind he was after the rabbit fifty yards on a swirl in the long grass and a few red stained leaves marked the abrupt end of the race and buff found himself supplied with a toothsome breakfast thus began the collie's first day of utter loneliness a day of bleak misery and bewilderment of biting grief he ranged the country for miles on either side for a trace of his master he followed several motor cars on various highways because of their vague resemblance to trent's once he ran rapturously for a quarter mile in pursuit of a well set up man who was taking a cross country tramp and whom in the distance his near-sighted eyes mistook for his master the wind being in the wrong direction buff was not aware of his error until he had careered to within fifty feet of the stranger then head and brush drooping he slunk away heavy of heart and heedless of the man's kindly hail under cover of darkness that evening the collie made a detour that brought him back to the garage where he last had seen trent's car whether he hoped trent might have come back there or whether perhaps the desolate dog craved the faint scent of his master on the tonneau door and flooring in any event he leaped in through the unmended window of the garage and sought to locate the stolen car the car was no longer there after the deft underground method employed by professional automobile thieves and receivers of such booty the car had already been passed along the line to its next resting place a boy coming home late from the nearby city chanced to be passing the unlit garage from the cavernous depths of the building burst forth into the still night a hideous sound the anguish howl of a wolf or of a masterless and wretched collie while the boy still stood shivering in terror at the eerie sound a dark shape hurtled out through the window and vanished into the surrounding blackness. End of section 5。section 06 of Buff, a Collie, and other dog stories。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information。or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gertrude Durrett. Buff, a Collie, and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhoon. Buff, a Collie, Masterless, Part 2. And now began Buff's tortured experience as a stray, as a real one-man dog whose master is gone. Goaded on ever by that vague hope of somewhere finding Trent, and the scarce lesser hope of finding and wreaking vengeance on the men he associated with Trent's disappearance, 
the great collie wandered aimlessly over the face of the countryside. Unhappiness and the nerve rack of his endless quest lent him a strange furtiveness and made him revert in a measure to the wild. Always searching, always avoiding his own kind and humans, he grew gaunt and lean. Living by his wits, in summer the forests gave him enough food to support life. He became craftily adept in catching rabbits and squirrels, and even occasional young birds. He did not starve, for the wolf brain lent him the gift of foraging, although his farm training held him aloof from hen roost and stall and fold in his food hunts. Almost at once he skirted the city and guided himself back to Boone Lake, nearly thirty miles from where the trail had ended. The feat was not difficult, and he consumed less than a single night on the journey. Reaching his master's farm at gray of dawn, Buff found the house and outbuildings deserted. The weeds had crept thick among the once trim crops, and there was an air of desolation brooding over the land. Buff could not know that of all Boone Lake, Ruth Hammerton alone had refused to accept as true the report that Michael Trent had left home of his own accord. She had visited the deserted farm with her father as soon as the story had been repeated to her, and had prevailed on Mr. Hammerton to send one of his farmhands to transfer to the Hammerton's place Trent's suffering livestock for safe keeping. It was enough for the collie to know his master was not at home, and that he had not been at home since the night of his kidnapping. Buff did not belong to the silly and professionally loyal type of dog that curls itself on its owner's vacant doorstep and starves to death. There was no time to think of such selfish matters as death, while Michael Trent remained to be found and his two enemies to be tracked down. So, aimlessly, he took up his search. That night, he circled Boone Lake, investigating every house and path that Trent had been wont to frequent, visiting first the Hammerton place, and last the Market Square, the scene of his triumph over Bain, the drover. Dawn found him miles away, ever seeking, ever wandering, living on slain forest creatures, obsessed and haunted by his overmastering impulse to find Trent. Once, as he trotted along the ridge of a wooded hill, Buff saw in the valley below a farmer trying with pitiable ill success to round up a flock of sixty sheep that had bolted through the pasture gate and were scattering over the surrounding fields and woods instead of marching toward their distant fold whose gate stood invitingly open. Moved by an instinct, he did not stay to define or to resist. The collie swept down the ridge and into the valley below. The harassed farmer beheld descending on his stampeded flock a bolt of tawny and white lightning that whirled in and out among the galloping strays as if bent on their wholesale destruction. While the man was yelling his lungs out and seeking a stone wherewith to brain the marauder, he suddenly came to a foolish halt and stood gaping at the spectacle before him. The supposedly rabid and murderous dog was rounding up the scattered flock with uncanny skill and speed, marshalling them into the narrow road, driving strays back into the column, and moving the whole woolly throng steadily and decorously toward the fold. Arrived at the gate, one weather bolted past it, and ten other sheep followed his lead. 
The weather did not go 40 feet before he and his fellow truants found themselves confronted by a large and indignant collie who forced them with gentle relentlessness to wheel in their tracks and rejoin the flock. Tongue out, tail wagging, Buff stood at the gate of the fold, holding his prisoners from passing out again until the puffing and marveling farmer came running up. The man paused to fasten the gate before turning his full attention on the wonderful collie. But by the time the gate was made fast, the dog was a hundred yards down the road, trotting lazily back toward the ridge. Not by so much as a turn of his classic head did he show he heard the frantic and cajoling shouts the farmer sent after him. On another late afternoon, ten miles from there, a farmer's child was piloting her father's eleven cows and two calves home along the road from pasture. Three men, passing in a small motor truck, halted, jumped to the ground, seized the pair of calves, and prepared to sling them into the truck. The child screamed in terrified appeal and caught hold of one of the men by the arm while the herd of cows ran in panic through fields and woods. The man shook off the child's convulsive hold with a vehemence that sent her flat in the dust of the road. And on the same instant, a huge and lean and hairy beast burst through a roadside thicket and flung himself on the man, bearing him to earth by the sheer weight of his assault. By the time the thief had landed, rolling and yelling in the roadway, Buff had deserted him and was at another of the trio. And this was the collie of it. A bulldog secures his grip and holds it till doomsday. A collie, fighting, is everywhere at once. The collie strain in Buff told him his opponents were three, and that there was no sense in devoting himself over long to any one of them at the expense of the rest. So he was raging at the second man's throat before the first fairly realized what had attacked him. The third man, however, had a trifle more time on his hands than had either of his companions, and, wisely, he utilized that second of time in dropping the calf he had caught and in making one flying leap for the seat of the truck. There, as fast as they could beat off the furry demon that was rending their flesh and clothes, the two others joined him. Leaving the calves to run free, the men set the machine into rapid motion and rattled off down the road. Buff did not follow. Already he was in the thickets again, rounding up the gawkling, galloping cows. And presently he had them back in the highway, in orderly alignment and walking stolidly homeward. Dropping back beside the still weeping child, Buff licked her frightened face with his pink tongue, wagged his tail and his t entire body reassuringly, and then thrust his muzzle into her trembling little hand. Thus her father, having witnessed the scene from afar, came hurrying up to find his cattle safe and in the road, and his erstwhile terrified daughter hugging a huge collie frantically and kissing the silken crest of the dog's head in an agony of gratitude and love. But as the farmer himself sought to catch hold of the dog, Buff showed his white teeth in a wild beast snarl that made the man start back. Taking advantage of this momentary check, the collie bounded off into the bushes and was gone. Buff himself could not have explained the unwanted wildness and ferocity that seemed to have taken hold of him in his wanderings. For the first three years or so of his life, indeed, until Gates's pistol shot had stunned him, he had known nothing but friendliness and good treatment. And, except toward tramps 
and like prowlers he had never felt hatred though he had always been a one-man dog he had shown no ill temper toward those who sought to make friends with him yet now as evidenced by his snarl at the father of the child who was caressing him he had neither lot nor part with mankind at large his every hope and yearnings were centered on the finding of his master and the wolf strain in his makeup thrilled almost as keenly to his longing to encounter the man with whom he associated the disappearance of trent for the rest of humanity he felt no interest not even toward ruth hammerton who had reigned second to trent in his heart twice during his months as a tramp dog buff revisited boone lake casting about the farm trotting at midnight through the village hanging wistfully around the hammerton place for nearly an hour but before dawn he was far away again most of his traveling was done by night or in dusk and at gray daybreak for experience had taught him that the open ways are not safe for an unattached dog by sunlight a lesser dog might readily have attached himself to one of the various friendly folk who chanced to meet him and to give him a kindly word or call a lesser dog too might have chosen a home at one of the farms scattered through the broad stretch of country buff traversed at any of a dozen places his beauty and his prowess at herding would have won for the collie a warm and lasting welcome but none of this was for buff he had known but one master losing trent he was fated to be forever masterless unless he should chance to find the man he had lost and being only a dog he knew no better way of finding him than by this everlasting and aimless search on a late september afternoon he was roused from a troubled nap in the long grass and bushes at the verge of a field by the sound of a mad galloping horse and of a woman's brave yet frightened calls to the runaway looking over the fringe of grass towards the road a furlong distance he saw a fast moving cloud of yellow gray dust which resolved itself into a hazy screen for a horse and light buggy the horse a young and nervous brute had taken fright at the running of a woodchuck across the road under his feet and had sprung forward with a suddenness that snapped his check rein the swinging check smote him resoundingly again and again on the neck and across the face turning his first fright into panic and making useless the efforts of the driver to bring him down a woman was driving she was neither young nor beautiful she had self-possession and she had a more than tolerable set of driving hands she was keeping the maddened horse more or less in the road and was sawing with valorous strength on one rein while she held the other steady which was all the good it did her for the brute had the bit between his teeth buff arrived at the road edge just as one of the two light reins broke under the undue strain put on it before the driver could lighten the pull on the remaining rein its impulse had jerked the horse's low laid head far to one side his rushing body prepared to follow the lead of his head towards a steep roadside bank some ten feet deep with a scattering of broken rock at the bottom then it was that the horse became dimly aware of a furry shape which whizzed in front of him on that side and of a flying head that struck for his nose a stinging slash on the left nostril sent the runaway veering from the bank edge and plunging toward the telegraph pole on the other side of the road he was met and turned again by a second slash from one of the collie's curved eye teeth on the same moment buff stopped slashing 
and let his bulldog ancestry take control. Thus the horse was assailed by a full double set of teeth that buried themselves in his bleeding nostrils and that hung on. The wild steed sought to fling up his head to shake off this anguishing weight of seventy-odd pounds, but he could not shake himself free. He checked his furious pace and reared, striking out with his forefeet and threatening to pitch backwards into the buggy. But a fierce wrench of the hanging jaws and a wriggle of the intolerable weight brought him down on all fours again. At once, Buff released his grip and stood in front of the trembling horse. The runaway made as though to plunge forward, but he flinched at the memory of the dog's attack and at the threat of its renewal. While he hesitated, dancing, pawing, and in momentary cessation of his run, the woman slipped from the seat to the ground and ran to his head. With practiced strength, she shook the bit into place and held fast. The horse jerked back. Buff nipped his heel and instantly was at his bloody nose again. The runaway, conquered and shivering, lashed out with one foreleg in a last hopeless display of terrified anger. His shod hoof smote the unprepared collie in the side. With a gasping sound, Buff rolled over into the ditch, two ribs broken and a foot crushed. Tying the horse to a telegraph pole, the woman went over to where the wounded collie lay. In strong, capable arms that were a wondrous gentle, she lifted him and bore him to the buggy. Laying him tenderly on the floor of the vehicle, she returned to the horse's head, untied the cowed and trembling steed, and began to lead him homeward. Ten minutes later, she turned in at a lane leading to a rambling, low farmhouse, and in another five minutes, Buff was reclining on the kitchen floor, the woman's husband working skillfully over his injuries, while the matron poured out the tale of his heroism and cleverness. I know what dog this is, too, she finished. I'm sure I know. It must be the same one that fought those thieves away from Sal Gilbert's cows over to Pompton last week when Sal's girl was driving them home. Mrs. Gilbert told me about it at the Grange Monday. And he's likely the dog that rounded up those sheep for Parkins, or whatever his name was, at Revere. You read me about it in the bulletin, don't you remember? the letter Parkins wrote to the editor about it? I know it must be the same one. It isn't likely there's more than one dog in Passaic County with the sense to do all three of those things. He must be like those knight-errant folks in Sylvia's school book who used to go through the country rescuing folks that were in distress. The best in the house isn't any too good for him. He'll get it curtly promised her husband without looking up from his task. It's lucky I've had experience, though, in patching up busted critters, because this one is needing a lot of patching. Say, notice how he don't even let a whimper out of him. This rib setting must hurt like fury, too. Acts more like a bulldog than a collie. I'm going to advertise him and if the owner shows up, I'll offer him a hundred dollars for the dog. He'll be worth it, and a heap more, to me, hurting and such. So, old feller, now for the smashed foot. Don't seem to be any big bones broken there. The weeks that followed were more nearly pleasant to Buff than had been any space of time since Trent's disappearance. He was perforce at rest while his fractured ribs and then his broken foot slowly mended. And all that time he was fed up and petted and made much of in a way that would have turned most invalids' heads. It was well, after his months of restless searchings, to come to a halt here in this abode of comfort and kindliness 
to be patted again by a woman's soft hand, to eat cooked food once more, to be praised and to feel himself gloriously welcome. Buff's craving ambition to find Trent and to run to earth his two enemies was less acute in these drowsy days of convalescence. His sick soul seemed to be returning to normal along with his sick body. By the time Buff could walk with any degree of comfort again, the morning frost lay heavy on the fields. The dog went out for a brief stroll with the farmer and his wife. To their delight, he did not try to run away, but accompanied them home and lay down contentedly on the doorstep. After that, no further guard was kept over him. It was understood that he would stay with the people who had succored and healed him. One cold night in late autumn, the dog accompanied his host as usual on the evening rounds of barns and outbuildings. As they were returning towards the warm red glow of the lamplit kitchen windows, Buff came to a dead stop. A slight shudder ran through him. He lifted his delicate nose and sniffed the frosty air. He smelt nothing. He sniffed merely in an effort to corroborate in some way by scent the strange impulse which was taking possession of him, an impulse he could not resist. Come along, chef, old boy, coaxed the farmer, arriving at the doorstep and turning back towards the collie. Supper's ready. What's the matter? Slowly, very slowly, Buff approached the man. Timidly, almost remorsefully, he licked the outstretched hand. Then, throwing back his magnificent head, he made the frost-chilled stillness of the autumn night re-echo with a hideously discordant and ear-torturing wolf howl. Why, Shep, explained the farmer in a maze. Whatever ails you, what's... He broke off in the midst of his bewildered query and raised his voice in a shout of summons to the dog. For like a streak of tawny light, Buff had whirled out of the dooryard and was fleeing up the road. He heard the eager call of the man who had cursed him and befriended him and given him a happy home. But he heard, far more clearly, a soundless call that urged him forward. Guided only by mystic collie instinct and by that weird impulse which had taken possession of him, he fled through the night at breakneck speed, headed unswervingly for Boone Lake, full thirty miles away. On the same night, after a cautious absence of several months, Con Hagen and Billy Gates ventured to return to their former homes in the Boone Lake suburbs. End of section six. Section seven of Buff, a Collie, and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buff, a Collie and other dog stories by albert payson terhune buff a collie the end of the trail part one ruth hammerton hurried into her father's study on her return from the post office whither she had fared for the evening mail her dark face was aglow with a color that had been foreign to it for many a long week a color that softened and mellowed the new lines of leanness and of sorrow in cheek and brow. Her eyes were alight with nervous eagerness. Mr. Hamilton looked up in surprise from a heap of papers on his desk as his daughter burst so unceremoniously in upon him. A month earlier he had been appointed local justice of the peace. His new duties still called for much night work in the way of study and preparation for the next day's court duties. So it was with a slight frown that he greeted this sudden interruption of his labors. I've just come from the post office, began Ruth eagerly. As I was coming out, two men almost bumped into me. I looked back as they slouched into the store and sat down by the stove. 
They had a huge bulldog at their heels. I heard one of the loafers there hail him by name. They were Con Hegan and Billy Gates. A boy told me they had come back to Boone Lake today. He said it was their first visit here since they got out of prison. He— Shaw, fumed Hammerton. So those two crooks are back here, are they? That means more lawlessness. Just as I was congratulating myself that it was becoming a law-abiding and decent community at last. I wish— You don't understand, broke in the girl. You don't see what I mean. You don't get the significance of it, and yet I've been all over it with you so often I— Over what? demanded Hammerton, nettled by her air of excited mystery. Please explain what you're driving at. I'm tremendously busy tonight, and— Michael Trent was the means of Hegan and Gates going to prison, she hurried on. They swore they would get him for it. We have proof of that. The very night after they were set free, Michael disappeared. And now they're back here again after four months. Don't you see? I see you're trying to lure me into that same endless old argument again, returned Hammerton with a glance of regret at his piled-up work. But really, I can't see why these two jailbirds' appearance in town tonight should have flustered you so. There was no foul play connected with Trent's disappearance. I've explained that to you over and over again. Calvin Greer called him up on the telephone that evening. Trent told Calvin he was sick of Boone Lake and that he was starting off on a long motor tour up country. He said if he liked it up there, he'd settle somewhere in the North Counties and never come back. Next day, he and his automobile were gone. Where is the mystery? Where? she repeated miserably. Why, everywhere. The whole thing is a mystery. In the first place, I rode over to see Calvin Greer at his stock farm. He had never met Michael till that day, and he wasn't at all familiar with Michael's voice. But he told me it sounded rougher and hoarser over the phone than when he talked to him face to face, and he— That's no proof. Many people's voices sound altogether different over the phone, or Trent may have had a cold. There's no mystery about it, I tell you. Most assuredly, there's nothing to connect Hegan and Gates with the affair, as to— You knew Michael, she went on. You knew him well, and you liked him. Tell me, was he the sort of a man to go away like that, and not have the courtesy to say good-bye to us? Was he? He stopped here, he and Buff, you remember, on his way home from the market square that evening. He sat and chatted with us for half an hour or so. He didn't say a word about going away. Instead, he arranged to go horseback riding with me the next day. Yet less than half an hour later, apparently, he tells Calvin Greer he's leaving Boone Lake, perhaps forever. Is that men do queer things, said Hammerton, turning back to his papers. I can't agree with you that there's any mystery about it, daughter. Certainly no mystery that would justify the law in suspecting. You know what care he took of his livestock, pursued Ruth. Is it likely? Is it possible that he would have left his sheep and cattle to starve, his cows unmilked, and his horses with empty mangers? Would he have gone away like that, of his own accord, and let all his livestock starve to death? For they would have starved to death out there, on that solitary farm, if you and I hadn't gone to get them and bring them here. Well, that's the only part of the whole thing that I can't understand, assented Hammerton. He treated his livestock as other people treat their pets. It wasn't like him to leave them to starve. Out there they might have gone hungry till they died, before any neighbor would have been likely to happen in and find them. Even if he hadn't been so fond of them, it doesn't make sense for a man to leave such valuable property to die of neglect, to say nothing of the ruin of his year's crops through his absence. Why, if you hadn't wheedled me into having his crops looked after, the year would have been a total loss to his farm. As it is, then, she declared triumphantly, since you admit he wouldn't have done such a thing of his own accord, I don't admit it. I only say I can't understand it. But it happened. We have proof of that. He went away in his car, and he took Buff along with him. If he had left Buff there, I could have seen, perhaps, where the mystery came in for he and that golly were chums, but he took Buff with him, and he took along everything of portable value in his house, too. No, that doesn't look like foul play. He did it deliberately, whatever his motive may have been. 
took along his dog and his valuables and drove away in his own car. The car couldn't have been stolen either, for he told Greer over the phone if it was Michael who told. We don't know his motive, summed up Hammerton, but we do know he went of his own accord. There's ample proof of that. As for connecting Gates and Hegan with, he did not go of his own accord, announced the girl, deathly white, her eyes ablaze as she towered over her wondering father, and I have every reason to know he didn't. I don't want to tell you why I know it, but I must if I want you to get the truth out of those two assassins. I know Michael Trent did not leave here of his own accord. I know it because he loved me. A man doesn't run away like that from what? shouted Hammerton in astonishment. He, you, say he, I say he loved me, reiterated the girl, her sweet voice held steady by a great effort, and no man will go away willingly from a woman he loves as Michael loved me. Most of all, he won't go away and fail to send any kind of word. You never told me, accused her father indignantly. You never, Michael never told me, she retorted. Then how... He never told me in so many words, she went on, yet I knew it. A woman always knows. He loved me, and he was waiting until he could put his farm on a better paying basis before he told me of it. Now perhaps you'll believe me when I say he'd never have gone away like that unless he had been kidnapped or killed. Long and silently, Hammerton stared at his daughter, dazed by the revelation, and then he said hesitantly, if I'd known, if you had told me, but... But now that you do know, she persisted, you'll get the truth from Hegan and Gates. You'll start the machinery of the law to working, and... Dear, he said gently, there's nothing I can do. There is no shadow of proof that either of those men was concerned in... As you choose, she exclaimed, turning to leave the room. Since you won't interrogate them, I'm going to... I'm going back to the post office to find them. If they aren't there, I'm going to find out where they live and go. Are you crazy? Stormed Hammerton, jumping up to bar her way. You surely can't mean to do an insane thing like that. I won't permit it. Then interrogate them yourself as a magistrate of this county, she bade him, because if you don't do it, I shall. If it is insane, let it be insane. In these past months, I've had enough to drive a wiser woman insane. I love Michael Trent. I love him, I tell you, and if he's on earth, I shall find him, now that I have a clue. Hammerton stared wonderingly down upon his wantedly placid daughter. Then he caught her into his arms and held her close to his heart for a moment. Releasing her, he crossed to the telephone and called up Roy Sanders, the Boone Lake chief of police. Sanders, he queried, then, Judge Hammerton speaking, Hegan and Gates are in town again. I want to talk with them. You'll find them at the post office. Will you bring them up here to my study as soon as you can, please? No, there's no warrant out for them, but I don't think they'll be fools enough to refuse to come here. Thanks. He set down the telephone and passed his arm again around the girl. Ruth, her self-control giving away, wept convulsively on his breast. There, there, Hammerton murmured. Try to get hold of yourself, darling. They'll be here in a few minutes, and our one chance is to keep cool. I, I haven't had much faith in our success with them. It's only fair to tell you that, Ruth, and I've no legal right to question them at all. I'm doing it to save you from doing it. Try to be brave if nothing comes of our talk with them. Airily, not to say jauntily, Con Hegan and Billy Gates strolled up the village street and into the high road leading to the Hammerton place. To one side of the unconcerned pair strode Sanders, the truculent but puzzled chief of police. The men had grinned mirthfully at Sanders' command that they accompany him to the magistrate's home. They had complied without a single demur, and they lightened the tedium of the walk by guying the pompous police chief in a way that reduced him to sullen homicidal yearnings. Marshalled by Sanders, they lounged through the doorway in the wake of a servant and were ushered into Hammerton's study at the extreme rear of the house. They found Hammerton seated at his desk looking very magisterial indeed. At a far end of the room, her face in the shadows, sat Ruth. Here they are, Your Honor, proclaimed the chief of police ranging his two grinning charges side by side in front of the desk. Yep, 
cheerfully assented Hegan. Here we are, Judge. We was planning to bolt, but this vigilant cheap kind of overawed us. We was afraid he might cry if we stood him on his head and lit out. Or, supplemented Gates, he maybe have hit one of us a cruel slap on the wrist as we run past him, or he might go to where we live and bust one of our umbrellas to punish us. So we stuck. The judge looks pretty near as terrifying as the chief, confided Hegan to his companion in a loud whisper, and shaking with simulated awe. Most likely he keeps an electric chair in his kitchen. We'd best be polite to him. Hamilton checked an angry forward movement on the part of Sanders and addressed the grinning prisoners. I have no legal right to enforce replies to the questions I'm going to ask you, he said quietly, but it's only fair to tell you what rights I do possess. It is within my jurisdiction to commit you both here and now for vagrancy, since you have no visible means of support in this village, and before the thirty-day vagrancy term can expire, there'll be some new charge. So to avoid these annoyances, I advise you to wipe those grins off your faces and to drop the attempt to insult anyone here, and to answer the questions I shall put to you. Otherwise you will leave here with handcuffs on and will proceed to the lockup thence to come before me in the morning on a vagrancy charge the men looked at each other uncertainly gates seemed to be measuring the distance to the study door unobtrusively hammerton took a pistol from the drawer of his desk and laid it in his lap instantly the two men stiffened and lost their jauntily insolent manner there's no call to threaten us judge said hegan nervously we're glad to answer any questions you care to spring on us as for vagrancy well we're no vags we just got home today and of course we haven't had time to look round us for any steady work yet but you were let out of logan prison on the twenty sixth of last july interposed hammerton where did you go from there i mean as soon as you were let out we went straight to patterson returned hegan we got out of logan at ten in the morning of the twenty sixth we took the noon train to patterson we got work there, and we stayed on the job till yesterday, when the works shut down for the winter. Then we come back here. You haven't been here since you were sent to prison? Not till we got here this morning from Patterson. No, Judge. Hmm. You were not here on the 27th of July? You are certain of that? Certain sure, Judge, declared Gates. We wouldn't be likely to forget if we had. This is our hometown. We was kind of ashamed to come back right off after they turned us loose from the Hooskow. So we... You've not been in or near Boone Lake since you were released from prison until today, insisted Hamilton. No, Your Honor, we ain't. And we can prove it. We went straight to Patterson, and there we... Then, spoke up Ruth, coming forward, how did two reputable witnesses happen to see you at Mr. Michael Trent's farm late in the afternoon of July 27th? Hegan gulped. Gates, however, answered suavely. Flash your witnesses on us, ma'am. If they seen us here or in this county that day, they sure got good eyes. They... Yep, supplemented Hegan. Who's your witnesses? Who are they? Hammerton and Sanders were looking at the troubled girl in surprise. With true feminine quibble for truth, she had put the statement in the form of a query in speaking of the witnesses whose identity she had just invented. The failure of her ruse distressed her keenly, even while the memory of Hegan's start and his scared gulp made her doubly certain she was on the right track. "'Guess you never took a course of poker-playing at school, ma'am,' chuckled Gates, reading her face with all the trained skill of a true panhandler. "'Shut up, you,' grunted Sanders in wrath. He glowered upon the suave Gates, who promptly turned his respectful gaze to the magistrate's face. Hammerton, frowning perplexedly, opened his lips for further query, even while he realized the utter uselessness of trying to catch such skilled offenders by any questions he might have the wit to frame. Before he could speak, a maid rushed wildly into the room. With a manifest effort, she came to a halt inside the doorway, and stood as though trying to announce some guest. But the guest himself entered the room close at her heels. End of section 7section 8 of Buff, A Collie and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buff, a collie, and other dog stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Buff, a collie, the end of the trail, part two. Steadily through the gathering darkness, Buff had run his first mad pace settling down into the choppy little mile-eating stride of the trotting wolf pack and so he kept on ever headed for boone lake moving swervelessly and with deceptive quickness stars came out a fat moon began to bud its way over the eastern horizon mists here and there as the pad 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 of the collie's tireless feet pattered along the frozen road a farm dog would bark challenge or dart out in pursuit but no challenge bark checked buff's obsessed flight nor did any of the pursuing curs catch up with him now and then along the state road motor cars would meet or pass him the dog moved aside barely far enough to miss the whirring wheels but did not falter in his run once as he padded through a village some fool catching sight of him noted his tense pose and the arrow-like straightness of his course and raised the shout of mad dog this asinine cry lurks ever in the back of the human throat ready and eager to spring into life at the slightest provocation and woe to the harmlessly running or perhaps sick dog at whom it is howled at once the human cry is ready to start in murderous pursuit no question is asked nobody stops to realize that there are probably not two actually rabid dogs in any one state in the union in the course of any two years and that a genuinely hydrophobic dog is no more in condition to chase and attack people than is a typhoid patient but in buff's case the shout was raised too late the tawny and white shape sped on through the dim moonlight and out of sight before the hue and cry was fairly up and he did not so much as glance back to note the progress of the useless pursuit as he turned off the state road taking the macadam byway which led towards trent's farm the collie dropped to a wavering halt his sensitive nostrils pulsing a scent had come to him though it was still too elusive to register clearly in the eager brain twenty doubtful steps buff took along the byway until he came to a point where a field path from a crossroad a mile away intersected it at the intersection the scent struck him with a force that dizzied him nostrils to earth he found that a man had left this path for the byroad not ten minutes earlier the knowledge did amazing things to the dog for an instant he shivered as though with a physical convulsion his breath came in long gasps a whine in his throat shook itself forth in an eerie note that belonged to no normal beast then like a whirlwind he was off down the byway nose to earth body flat and flying half a mile farther on the rush of his madly scampering feet came to the ears of a man who was plodding wearily toward the farm a man thin and shabby who walked as though completing an exhausting journey in the middle of the road the man paused and glanced back a down the moonlit byway was dashing a tawny and white creature flat to earth in its speed fifty yards from the man buff lifted his head as he galloped the scent any dog's strongest quality told him he might now rely on sight which is the weakest of a dog's senses at what he saw the collie gave tongue not in the hideous wolf howl or in whimper did buff speak now but in a cry that was human and rending a cry that tore at the listener's heartstrings by reason of its awful intensity delirious screaming writhing panting buff flung himself on the man he had tracked he was at the end of the trail and what he found there drove him quite insane up into michael trent's dusty arms the dog sprang a vibrant mass of mad ecstasy moaning crying sobbing like a human child buff sought to lick his master's haggard face and to pat him in a hundred places at once with the whirling paws almost thrown off his balance by the impact trent spoke to the collie in wondering delight 
and the sound of the tired voice sent Buff into a new frenzy of rapture. Dropping to earth, he whizzed round and round Trent in a bewildering gyroscopic flight, stomach to ground, tongue and throat clamorous with hoarse joy. Presently, flinging himself at his master's feet, the dog lay there, moaning and sobbing, his swift tongue caressing the man's dusty shoes, his furry body quivering from nose to tail in hysterical bliss. And there he lay, while Trent leaned over and laid both calloused hands on his head, stroking him and talking to him in the pleasant, slow tones the collie loved. Buff, muttered the man, swallowing hard. Buff, why, I didn't think anyone on earth cared that much about anything. Come up here, old friend. You're shaking as if you had ague. How did you find me? Have you been waiting at home for me ever since? Or have you been living with with her? Buff, his paroxysm spent, crouched at Trent's feet, his silken head pressed against his master's knee, his upraised eyes scanning the man's face in adoration. From time to time he shivered and moaned. He had come to the end of the trail, the gloriously happy end of the horrible long trail, and he understood now why his queer sixth sense had summoned him hither, from the far-off farm where for weeks he had lived so placidly. The master call had come to him, he had obeyed it, for it had been stronger than he, and it had led him to his God. That was all Buff knew, or cared to know. And now, still talking to his dog, still petting him, Michael Trent took up again his homeward trudge. But there was life in his step. Fatigue seemed to have fallen away from him. The ludicrous worship of a dog had somehow made life over and had changed depression to hope. Following his old custom, immemorial among lonely men who owned dogs, Trent talked to Buff as they went along, as though to another human. Knowing the collie could not get the sense of one word in ten, yet glad to have this vent for his own yearning for expression. The start of it all is pretty hazy to me, Buff, he rambled on in the soft monotone that was music to the dog. I saw Hegan and Gates in the doorway. One minute I was fighting with them. The next minute I was in the smelly forecastle of a tramp steamship. I was sick, and I was aching all over. I had been shanghaied. The next three months were unadulterated hell. We were bound for Honolulu by way of the horn, Buff, and the crew was only one degree better than the captain and the mate. Let's let it go at that. A chap named Carney and I got to be pals. We broke ship together at San Francisco on the way back, and we made most of the transcontinental trip on brake beams. Brake beams aren't flowery beds of ease, Buff. Keep off them. Carney had got a bit of the story about me from a man who was the mate's pal between voyages. It seems a fellow who was in prison down at Logan with Gates and Hegan helped them engineer my shanghaiing. He told them where to take me, and they loaded me on a launch of his down the river to the harbor and sold me to the captain. He was just weighing anchor, and he was short-handed. Hegan and Gates were planning to keep me out of the way and to let my stock starve and my crops go to rack as most likely they have, for nobody was likely to get out to our out-of-the-way farm in time to prevent it. Then they were going to lay low for a few months, and after that they were coming back to Boone Lake and set fire to the house and barns. Most likely they've done it before now. Nice homecoming, hey, Buff? We're dead broke, most likely, you and I, but we've got each other anyhow, and that's more than I dared hope for. He was turning in at the gateway of his farm as he finished the rambling tale. Buff thrust his nose into his master's hand and whined softly. Then, in a trice, the collie had stiffened to attention and darted forward through the shadows towards a patch of white that emerged from the darkness of the dooryard. When Gates and Hegan came home to Boone Lake that day, they brought with them a new possession in the shape of a mongrel bulldog of huge proportions and with a local fame for being one of the dirtiest fighters that ever set upon a weaker foe. Planning to carry out their amiable intent of firing Trent's house and barns late in the night, they had stationed this dog in their victim's dooryard that evening 
to scare off any possible tramp or other intruder who might be intending to make the deserted house a resting place. They had no desire for such witnesses, the penalty for arson being somewhat drastic in their home state. It was this guardian dog that came tearing forward now to repel the two intruders, as Trent and Buff turned into the dooryard. Buff, guessing his ferocious intent, and resenting another and hostile dog's presence in his own beloved bailiwick, flew eagerly to meet him. An instant later, the two beasts came together with a clash, and a right energetic dog fight was raging at Trent's feet. Buff, for all his fury, fought with brain, as well as brawn, against his heavier assailant. There never yet was a bulldog that could in the open seize a collie that was aware of his assault and that wished to elude it. Buff nimbly sprang aside as the bulldog rushed, and let the other hurtle past him. But the bulldog did not go scatheless. As he lumbered past, a slash from Buff's curved eye-tooth plowed a long and deep red furrow along his shoulder and back. And as he turned, Buff Slash laid open a similar cut at one side of the enemy's stomach. The collie danced out of reach of the clashing jaws that sought to grab him before he could jump back. When the jaws clamped together, the collie's throat was not there. Even as his opponent struck a second time, Buff flung himself on the ground and dived for the heavy forelegs in front of him. Buff's teeth closed on the bulldog's right foreleg and but for his own strong strain of collie blood the fight must have ended then and there for a bulldog would have gained this foreleg grip and would have hung on to it heedless of the fact that his own spine and the back of his neck were within easy reach of the foe wherefore merely giving the forefoot an agonizing bite as he went he continued his diving rush under and between the bowed forelegs of the bulldog he slipped eel-like in swift elusiveness slashing the other's underbody again as he went and emerged safe on the far side of the enemy back and forth over the frost slippery moonlit grass raged the fight the frantic clawing of feet and buff's own staccato snarls and the thud of clashing bodies alone breaking the night silences Twice the bulldog well-nigh secured his coveted throat hold, a hold that must speedily have left Buff gasping out his life through a severed jugular. A third time the bulldog charged for the throat. Buff reared, twisting sidewise to avoid the charge and at the same time to counter on the panting and lumbering body. But he did not take account of the slipperiness of the frosty dead grass. The collie's hind leg slipped from under him. Down he went, a sprawl on his back, under this sudden loss of his precarious balance. As quick as a cat, he had spun to his feet again. But the instant of wasted time had sufficed for the enemy. The bulldog, lunging murderously for the exposed throat, missed his mark by reason of Buff's swirling motion of scrambling to his feet again. Yet this time the ravening jaws did not close on air or on fur. Instead, they buried themselves in Buff's upper right foreleg, almost at the junction of leg and body. Helpless to break free, Buff ceased to thrash about. He felt the locked jaws begin to grind, deep and deeper, towards the bone. He felt his enemy's brace pressure brought to bear upon the imperiled foreleg. Then his wolf brain told him what to do. He struck straight for the nose and upper jaw of the bulldog. He did not slash, as does a collie. He bent down and secured his grip, as would a bulldog. The bulldog, his own hold secure in the collie's upper foreleg, was aware of a terribly painful grip on his tender nose, a grip that waxed sterner and more tense all the time, a grip also that was shutting off his breathing power. In the anguish of choking, the bulldog let go of Buff's foreleg, and shook himself furiously to get free of that encumbering hold. As he shook, he gave tone, emitting a most horrendous yell of pain and rage. Then, for the first time, Trent was able, in the elusive moonlight and shadow bars, to see how the fight was going, or to intervene without peril of injuring his own dog. But as he bent down to drag the squirming bulldog away, he saw he was too late. Buff's grinding jaws had found the jugular. The fight was over. The victor stood up, panting and weary, and looked down at the inert mass that had so lately been a mighty fighting machine. 
Half an hour later, shaved and clean, Michael Trent set forth for Ruth Hammerton's home. Muff, wholly rested from his battle, trotted happily at his master's heels. The maid at Hammerton's gaped wordlessly at sight of the visitor. Buff, as politeness bade him, wagged his tail and took a step towards her. The maid, by nature, was built for endurance rather than speed, yet recovering from her shock, she jumped at least a foot from the veranda floor, and she made a sound better fitted to a turkey whose tail feathers had been grabbed than to a decorous household servant. After which she bolted into the house and down the hall towards the study. Trent hesitated as to whether or not he ought to follow, but Buff took matters into his own hands. At the opening of the front door, he caught the scent of Hammerton's two convict visitors. And down the long hall, he went like a thunderbolt. Trent, in consternation, dashed after him, but he did not catch up with the collie until Buff halted, perforce, at the doorway, which the maid's ample body was just then blocking. As he strove to wiggle past into the room, Trent came alongside and seized the inexplicably excited dog firmly by the collar. This precaution saved the life of Con Hegan, who chanced to be standing nearest to the door. It was Billy Gates who broke the brief spell, even as Ruth started forward with a choking little cry towards Trent. The convict's nerve and brain suddenly collapsed. Waving a tremulous arm at the raging buff, Gates babbled in horror, Take him away! For the Lord's sake, take him away! That's no dog, it's a devil! A, a ghost! I shot him! I buried him in a forty-foot well with a rope and a stone on his neck! Take him away! He's come back for me! At a nod from Hammerton, the chief of police shoved Hagen into an adjoining room. Then wheeling on the gibbering and helpless gates, Trent said sternly, Now talk, the whole truth, mind you, unless you want me to let this this ghost loose at you. Talk. As Gates talked, drunk with superstitious horror, he talked and continued to talk. Even the sight of Hamilton taking swift notes did not deter him. As the chief of police strutted back to the lockup, propelling his handcuffed prisoners before him, he tried hard not to look at a shaded corner of the moonlit veranda, a corner wherein a maid and a man were seated very close together, with a big collie curled up in drowsy contentment at their feet. End of section 8section nine of buff a collie and other dog stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ellen preckle buff a collie and other stories by albert payson terhune something a dog is only a dog but a collie is a collie says the scottish proverb a collie has the brain of a man and the ways of a woman this is the story of Dick Snowden's collie Jock, and of something. You can believe the tale or not as you choose, but if you know collies you will think twice before you poo-poo it as rankly impossible. Moreover, in its chief and strangest happenings, it chances to be true. It began when Dick Snowden's pretty girl wife was lying in the centre of a huge white bed, and when she was watching the world glide past her, and not much caring how soon it might glide altogether away from her. Cuddled close to her in the enormous bed was a white swathed bundle of tiny humanity that smelled of talcum powder and of sachet, and was a week old. The coming of baby Maurice into the ken of mankind had well nigh cost the life of Clyda Snowden, her girl mother. There were no complications, there was nothing the learned doctors could put a name to, but Clyda had suffered much and had been through much. She was very, very tired. So tired was she that it did not seem worth while to pick up the bulky burden of life again. It was much easier to lie still with half-shut eyes and feel herself drifting lazily out of life. Dully, she knew the baby was hers, that it was the precious little daughter for whose advent she and Dick had for months been planning so happily. She knew, too, that the lean and bronzed man who spent so many miserable hours at her bedside was her worshipped husband, Dick. Yes, she was quite sane, but she was so tired, 
that none of the real-life things in which usually she revelled were worth living for mentally she knew that the future was bright for her and dick and for their baby physically she was not interested in anything but drowsing it was on the afternoon of the eighth day of baby Maurice's life that Dick came into the room, carrying a covered wicker basket. Clyda had no interest in him, or in what he was carrying, even when he set down the basket on the edge of the bed and lifted its cover. Sleepily she looked at him, ready to drop into another doze. Into the opened basket went Dick Snowden's hand to take out the contents. But the contents saved him the effort out from the depths of the basket sprang a fluffy gold and white ball of dynamic energy it wavered dizzily on the wicker edge then catapulted clumsily to the counterpane where it caught sight of clyda's colourless little face set in a halo of tumbled sunlit hair with the awkward canter of a badly made patent toy the ball of fluff danced sidewise up the counterpane until it reached the white little face which it proceeded to lick ecstatically with a very small and very pink tongue. By this time Clyda's weary brain had registered the fact that the new arrival was a two-months-old collie pup, also that it was doubtless the same collie pup which Dick had promised a month ago to buy for her. The gift was one on which Clyda had set her heart, from the day she and her husband had chanced to pass by some neighbouring collie kennels and had seen a litter of month-old puppies playing with their dam in one of the wire runs instantly she had taken a violent fancy to this particular pup it was then too young to leave its mother but dick had secured the owner's promise to sell it to him as soon as the youngster should be weaned the promise had delighted clyda she had named the puppy jock and had decreed that he should be baby's guardian and chum Yet, since then, so many things had happened, and now the arrival of the once-coveted pup meant nothing to Clyda at all, except that she did not like to have her wan face licked, nor to be patted at by a set of clumsy and shapeless white forepaws. She frowned slightly, and hoped Dick would take the obstreperous puppy away, but at sight of her frown the puppy evidently mistook the slight facial contortion for an invitation to play for he braced himself on all four shapeless legs, and made threatening little rushes at the frowning face, accenting his attacks with ferocious baby barks. In spite of herself, Clyda felt a vague amusement at the pup's silly antics. She reached out a weak white hand to pet him. At the touch, Jock forgot he was a lion or whatever other furious wild beast he was pretending to be. He remembered only that he was very young and very far from home and mother, and that the caress of the tired hand was sweet. With a cluck of contentment he cuddled close to Clyda's face and curled up for a nap. Dick, glad to have aroused his apathetic wife's interest to even so mild an extent, stooped to pick up the puppy and carry him away. But Jock was in no hurry to go. So piteously did he look at Clyda for rescue that she bade her husband leave him there for the time. Whereat, by way of showing his thanks, Jock began to play again with her hand as it lay idle on the quilt. Up to this time everybody had moved on tiptoe about the sick room and had talked in undertones, but Jock was no respecter of silence. He gambled and barked to his heart's content. Partly amused and partly annoyed by his bumptiousness, Clyda found herself for the first time unable to sink at will into that dreamy apathy of hers. It is hard to dream when a tiny furry whirlwind is charging at one, or is professing to believe that one's white fingers are a mortal foe to be nibbled and threatened. Thus it was, against her own will, that Clyda Snowden was shaken from her semi-coma. After that, youth and nature combined to keep her from sinking back into it. Probably she would have gotten well anyhow, and certainly a noisy collie puff is not to be prescribed as a temporary roommate for a sick girl, but the fact remained that Clyda turned the corner that very day, and forthwith grew better. She had not discovered a new zest in life, her husband and her newborn child furnished that, but she had been deprived of the luxury of drifting away. Action and annoyance and clownish gambles had chanced to supply the needed impetus to bring her back to normality. Yet Dick and she always attributed her rally to the arrival of Jock, and they loved him accordingly. Instead of living in the green-painted kennel in the garden and seeing his owners for only a casual hour or so each day, he was brought up in the house and with hourly human companionship. That sort of thing has a queerly humanizing influence on a dog, especially if the dog be a thoroughbred collie. From earliest puppyhood Jock learned to know the human voice in all its phases, and to read from experience its many shades of meaning. 
he learned too from constant hearing the meanings of many simple words and phrases he learned still more of human nature all of which was wholly natural and has occurred to hundreds of housebred collies from the first jock adopted baby maurice as his particular deity he would lie for hours at the foot of her crib or would walk in sedate slowness at the side of her perambulator in preference to a woodland race or even a romp with dick or clyda yet between him and dick there was a strange bond of sympathy dearly as the dog loved clyda and maurice he was closer to dick than to either of them he would lie with his eyes on the man's face watching its every change and seemed to be studying him to the very soul even as a puppy jock used to do this a scowl on dick's brow would bring him forward with a rush to offer canine sympathy or to rub his nose consolingly against his master's hand he would go into ecstasies of joyous excitement when dick laughed or smiled and as the dog grew older he seemed able to see past mere facial expression and to read dick's varying moods even when those moods gave no visible sign of expression all of this seemed nothing short of magic to the snowdens though it is a common enough phenomenon to anyone who has been much with collies it was when baby maurice was a harem scarum girl of four and when jock was a stately giant in his early maturity that something happened which the snowdens never tired of talking about dick started at sunrise for a day's trout fishing along a brook which ran through a wild tract of meadow and forest some three miles above the snowden place jock as his master set forth galloped enthusiastically ahead eager for the prospective walk but dick whistled him back a man did not desire to have wary trout scared away by the occasional plunges of a seventy-pound collie into the brook no he said as if talking to a fellow human not to-day old man stay here and look after the place crestfallen yet philosophical jock trotted back to the veranda and lay down his deep brown eyes following pathetically the receding figure of his master hoping against hope that dick might relent and summon him to follow then maurice came down to breakfast with clyda and jock proceeded to devote himself to their society it was about four o'clock that afternoon when clyda was awakened from a nap on the porch by the sudden rising of the collie from his resting-place on the mat near her jock had been asleep yet something had startled him in an instant from his repose and had changed a sedately slumbering collie into a creature of puppy-like excitability every hair on the dog's shaggy ruff was a bristle his eyes were glinting as with pain he burst into a salvo of frantic barking and dashed across to where clyda lay catching the hem of the astonished woman's skirt in his teeth he tugged at her dress backing away with a suddenness that all but threw her to the floor jock expostulated clyda recovering her balance and trying to extricate the skirt from his grip jock have you gone crazy jock's answer was to release his hold on the skirt hem and to gallop off the porch and onto the drive which led to the highway there he halted barked in imperious summons and darted back to clyda catching her skirt again between his jaws he sought to draw her out into the driveway with him laughing at her pet's odd behaviour clyda went down the steps to the drive instantly jock let go of her skirt and ran fifty feet toward the main road there halting again he turned and barked as the woman still did not follow he ran back seized her skirt in his teeth again and tried to draw her onward this time clyda did not refuse to follow a queer notion had possessed her a notion that jock was not doing these unaccountable things for a mere lark or to lure her into a romp it was not at all like the dignified collie to behave this way calling to her brother who was reading indoors to join her she set forth in the wake of the dog the moment the two humans started toward him jock ceased to bark in that frantic and panic-urged fashion he wheeled and galloped off straight across country every few hundred yards he would pause to make sure the others were still following and to let them come nearer then he would be off again a wearisome walk he led the puzzled clyda and her grumbling brother in a precise line he travelled turning aside for no hillock or rock or tangle of undergrowth for goodness sake panted the brother once as he looked ruefully down at his buckskin shoes which had just plodded through a corner of swampland for goodness sake clyda let's stop this fool ramble the idiot of a dog will probably halt in front of some oak where he's trained a cat and he'll want us to dislodge his quarry for him on a red-hot day like this what's the earthly sense of following a he hasn't treed a cat was clyda's reply he hasn't treed anything he's been with me all day i don't know why he is acting like this but i know jock and i know he's got some good reason for being so eager for me to follow him if you're tired 
"'Oh, I'll trail along if you're going to,' grunted her brother. "'Only if he leads us over into the next county "'and turns around and leads us back just for fun, "'well, I warn you, I'll guy you for the rest of your days "'for being so silly as to—' "'Hello,' he broke off. "'Here's where we'll have to wade.' "'They had come out of the woods at the verge of a wide brook. "'Clyda gave a little start as she saw it and lost her colour. "'Why, this is Snake Brook,' she cried. "'Dick and I have been here a dozen times, but we've always come by way of the road. "'I didn't know it was this direction. I—' "'Well?' queried her brother. "'Even at that, what's the excitement? "'There's nothing so very dramatic, is there, in coming upon Snake Brook? "'It's—' "'It's where Dick came to fish to-day,' said Clyda, her pallor increasing. "'Jock has led us here, and—' "'And that's the thrilling end of our quest?' interrupted her brother with a growl of disgust. "'Jock got lonely for his master, and he's dragged us through marsh and brambles all this way, just for a sweet family reunion? Lord!' "'No,' contradicted Clyda, her voice not quite steady. "'No. See, he hasn't crossed the brook. He's running along it on this side, and now he's stopped again for us to follow him. Come!' She set off at a run along the pebbly and winding margin of the brook, Jock, as she started, wheeled again and vanished into a copse of shrubbery, which ran down from a steep bank to the edge of the water. Ten seconds later the two heard the collie's voice upraised once more, this time in a quavering wolf howl of anguish, and no longer did the undergrowth crackle at his charging progress. He had come to a halt somewhere. The curs stumbled into a hornet's nest, guyed the brother, laughing loudly to subdue a prickly feeling that ran along his spine at the sound of that eerie cry but Clyda did not answer. She was plunging headlong through the bushes, panting and gasping, with her own violent efforts to reach the spot where Jock awaited her. Out in a little clearing beside the brook, and at the base of a ten-foot cliff-bank, she came upon the dog. He was standing guard over a body that sprawled inertly, half in the water at the cliff foot, a splintered fishing-rod at its side. There lay Dick Snowden, his leg broken in two places by his tumble from the bank, in falling, his head had struck against a water-edge boulder. The impact had caused concussion of the brain, nor did the victim recover consciousness until an hour after they had gotten him home. People who did not understand collies used to smile politely and lift their brows when the Snowdens told how Jock had brought aid to the stricken master, of whose plight the dog could not possibly have known through any explainable channels. Some of these people agreed with Clyda's brother, who always insisted there was nothing mysterious or occult about the matter. They explained that Jock had waxed lonely for his absent master, and had tried to coax Clyda into going with him to meet the returning fisherman, and that the accident to Dick had been a mere coincidence quite outside the dog's calculations. They did not explain how Jock knew the precise direction in which Dick had gone that day, nor why, during Snowden's previous and succeeding absences from home, the collie made no such effort to follow him. Clyda and Dick did not bother to argue with these skeptics. They knew Jock. Other people did not. It wasn't coincidence, was all Clyda would say when outsiders sought to convince her. It was something. And so the years went on at the Snowden home, pleasantly and uneventfully, Baby Maurice was a leggy and big-eyed girl of nine, and Jock was in the full, hale prime of latter middle age. Dick and Clyda were sweethearts as ever. They and their child and their huge gold and white dog formed a close corporation that made home life very beautiful for all four of them. Then, over the smugly complacent land, rang a bugle call. Half the world was sick unto death with the Hun pestilence, and America alone could stay the hideous disease's assault on humanity. America alone could cure a dying world. To achieve this heaven-sent miracle, the lives of thousands of brave men were needed, and, at the terrible blast of the bugle call, these men responded in millions. Dick Snowden was one of them. There were tears at the Snowden home when Dick first went thence to the officer's training camp. There was dire loneliness after he had gone. But there were no tears when, at the end of his last furlough, Captain Richard Snowden said good-bye to his family and embarked for France. There were no tears then. There was a hero smile on Clyda's drawn lips. Baby Maurice tried to smile, too, and at least she did not cry, which was very brave indeed. Jock looked long and gravely up into Snowden's forcedly gay face and laid his splendid head against his master's khaki knee as Dick said to him, "'Good-bye, old chap. Take care of them till I come back. You're the man of the house, remember, while I'm gone.' No, 
there were no tears when captain dick snowden sailed gallantly away to fight the grey-clad pests which were engulfing the world but there was a deadly and bitter loneliness that swooped down on the once merry little household and gripped it by the throat a loneliness that deepened and grew more cruelly hard to bear as the dreary weeks sagged on jock with his queer collie sixth sense felt acutely the changed atmosphere of the place he sought in a thousand unobtrusive ways to console and cheer his mistress and maurice and he seemed to have understood dick's parting charge to him to assume the responsibilities of the man of the house always jock had been a fiery guardian of the home in the manner of warding off intruders nowadays his jealous guardianship became an obsession voluntarily abandoning his lifelong nightly resting-place on the rug outside the door of clyda's room he took to sleeping on the veranda nor was his sleep heavy a dozen times a night the wakeful clyda could hear the big dog get to his feet and start off on a thorough patrol of the grounds this century go accomplished he would circle the porch and return to his doormat bed for another fitful snooze but the very slightest sound was enough to awaken him and bring him at once to fierce alertness the step of a belated wayfarer on the high road beyond the faintest stir of one of the sleepers within the house any of a hundred negligible noises of the night sufficed to rouse him to his duty in the daytime jock was seldom more than arm's length from clyda or maurice with cold suspicion his melancholy dark eyes would follow the motions of each casual visitor or tradesman yes jock was taking his job seriously on the rare occasions when a letter from france reached the place he knew of its arrival before the mail was sorted it would thrill him and set him to barking wildly and to scampering about the house like a joy-crazed puppy he seemed to know the occasion was one of rapture for them all the minute the letters are handed in at the door clyda boasted to her brother even before any of us have time to look them over jock always knows whether or not there's a letter from dick why shouldn't he demanded the sceptic a collie has a wolf's power of scent he can smell the touch of dick's hand on the envelope it's perfectly normal no denied clyda musingly it isn't normal it's something then late of a september night the household was jolted from a slumber by a clangor of barking from the porch to one who understands collies there is as much difference in a dog's various modes of barking as in the inflections of a human voice for example there is the gay bark of greeting there is the sharply imperative bark of challenge there is the noisily swaggering bark of sheer excitement and there is the acute and agonized bark that tells of stark emotion jock's bark to-night had the timber of that with which long ago he had summoned clyda to the aid of her injured husband at snake brook and the sound went through the lonely wife's soul like a knife thrust she sprang out of bed and in dressing-gown and slippers ran out to the porch as on that earlier day jock was awaiting her in fevered excitement catching the hem of her wrapper he tugged then dropping the wrapper he galloped up the driveway and wheeled about to face her with a bark of summons to-night clyda needed no second invitation to follow him bewildered trembling yet trusting to the collie's intuition she stumbled along in the direction jock led and leaving the driveway he was travelling due northeast well did clyda know she was moving northeastward for by dint of compass and maps she had long since figured out for herself the approximate direction of france in relation to her home and always she faced in that direction when she knelt to pray for dick for perhaps half a mile the dog continued his progress at first in mad eagerness but presently in growing indecision and irresolution at last he stopped sniffed the air through vertically lifted nostrils then trotted back to clyda head a-droop tail dragging every line of his grand body expressing the utmost miserable dejection he crept up to clyda and crouched before her his head on her foot he shuddered as if in pain then whimpered softly lifting his head for a moment and peering to the northeast he had failed he had awakened with the sudden knowledge of his master's peril he had followed the urge of the call and all at once he had realized that for some reason he could not hope to lead his mistress to the man who so sorely needed her aid perplexed heartsick he had crawled back helpless to do more again clyda's brother scoffed at his sister's certainty that something was amiss with snowden so did all the others to whom the unhappy woman told the tale they still scoffed at the idea of any premonition on the part of the dog but there was an awed note behind their scoffing when a few weeks later a shaky scrawl was received from the absentee a scrawl written in a base hospital 
I am laid by the heels for a day or two by a handful of rather nasty little shrapnel bites that Herr Fritz sprayed me with three nights ago during a reconnoitre. Nothing serious, so you're not to worry your dear self. I'll be as good as new in a week or two. The surgeon says so. He says I'll be lucky if I'm able to claim a wound chevron on the strength of such a piker injury. Here's a funny bit of mental delusion that may amuse you. When I toppled over and lay there in no man's land, before my men could find me and bring me in, there was an ungodly lot of racket from the Hun batteries. It almost deafened me, but through it all I believed I could hear, as distinctly as ever I heard anything, the wild barking of old Jock. Wasn't that a quaint trick for a wounded man's brain to play? Jock has a pretty thunderous bark, but its echo could hardly travel three thousand miles and reach me above the roar of the Bosch batteries. Yet I heard it. It wasn't his usual bark, either. It sounded the way it did the time Maurice fell down the well, and as it sounded when the house caught fire in the night, and he roused us barely in time to put out the blaze. I must have been a bit delirious, of course, but it gave me a queer, homey feeling to hear the dear old fellow's voice, even if I didn't hear it. Clyda looked at the date on the letter. Then she subtracted three days therefrom, and computed the time difference between her home and northern France. Then she turned to the little desk calendar on which, superstitiously, she had marked with a cross the date of her awakening by Jock. After that she showed her brother the letter and the calendar. As I have said, he still scoffed, but there was something of awe in his manner. It was a shock to Clyda to know her adored soldier was wounded, yet it was also a joy to know that he was not only in no danger from his wound, but that he was kept, perforce, out of battle for a time. This knowledge and the relief from her weeks of foreboding gave Clyda a curious sense of peace, which had not been hers in many a day. Her spirits rebounded to a lightness which was almost hysterical. As the day wore on, her unnatural gaiety and her sense of nearness to Dick increased. Early in the evening she left the house and strolled out into the white autumn moonlight. She was restless, and she wanted solitude and exercise. Jock rose from his bed on the doormat and ranged alongside her for the anticipated walk. Crossing the stretch of moon-soaked turf, the two made their way toward a rustic summer-house that stood on a knoll at the far end of the grounds. Here, with Dick, they had been wont to sit, daily, to watch the sunset. And to the old trysting-place Clyda now strolled. Jock, like herself, had been gay all day, ever since the arrival of the pencil scrawl from Dick. It was with difficulty now that he curbed his exuberant pace to keep time with hers. They reached the summer-house on the knoll. There, Clyda stood for an instant in silence to gaze dreamily over the moon-swept hills. The night was deathly still. Then, of a sudden, the silences were shattered by a sound that wailed forth in hideous cadences from hill to hill, re-echoing until the placid night fairly screamed with it. Clyda gasped aloud at the horror of the plangent din, and she spun about to locate its cause. There, in the moonlight, twenty feet away from her, stood Jock. The dog's every muscle was tense, as if with torture. His head was flung back, from his cavernous throat was issuing a series of long-drawn howls, slow, ear-splitting, raucous howls of mortal anguish. Jock! panted Clyda in swift terror. Jock! At the same moment, in a base hospital near marine a nurse was drawing the top of a cotton sheet over a face whose eyes would no longer need the light of day. The nurse was saying to a fellow worker as she performed the grim duty, Poor fellow, he was doing so nicely, too, till the blood poison set in. Say, Nora, did I hear a dog howling just then, or are my nerves going bad? At the quick appeal in Clyda's voice, Jock ceased his hideous lament, and stood trembling, with head bent almost to the ground. Then, through her moment of dread, that same strange sense of nearness to her husband came back upon the woman, but fiftyfold stronger than ever before since his departure. Through no volition of her own she heard herself whisper timidly, Dick? As she spoke, the collie raised his head as in joyous greeting. He came swiftly over to where his mistress stood, but it was not towards her he was moving, nor was it at her that his rapturously welcoming gaze was turned. The dog was hurrying, with eyes aglint and plumy tail waving, toward a spot directly beside her. Thus had he advanced, many a time, to greet his master, when Dick had returned from brief absences, and when Jock had seen him standing there, with his arm thrown protectingly about his wife, and his eyes smiling down into hers. To humans the tensely waiting woman would have seemed to be standing there in the moonlight alone, but it was not into empty space that the advancing dog gazed so eagerly. No one, seeing the collie then, could have doubted for an instant that Jock was looking at something. 
End of section 9. Section 10 of Buff, A Collie and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dorr. Buff, A Collie and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Chums, Part 1. Arn and Flint had not volunteered to take the money satchel to the bank. Indeed, he had tried hard to crawl out of the errand. A tennis hour, with a swim to follow, had beckoned right alluring to him. There was no fun in missing all this, and taking a hot trolley ride into town, just for the honor of acting as bearer, to the bank of the church bazaar's satchel full of change and small bills. Arnon said so, with engaging frankness, at lunch that noon, when his mother told him of the task that had been deputed to him whereat his father looked up gloweringly from his task of plate-clearing and added his quota to the argument. "'As long as you eat my bread, you'll obey my orders, and your mother's too. I don't want to hear any grumbling. You'll take that money to the bank and you'll get a receipt for it, and you'll look sharp to get there before three, too. Let it go at that.' For perhaps thirty seconds Arnon wisely let it go at that. Then human endurance broke down before equally human indignation. "'You talk a lot about my eating your bread,' sniffed the boy. "'But it isn't my fault I eat it. "'If you'd let me take a job, "'instead of making me get ready to go to that measly old college, "'I'd have been eating my own bread by this time.' "'You'd be wasting another man's time and money instead of mine,' retorted his father. "'And you'd be back on my hands inside of a week. "'No thanks. "'You're going to college, if ever you have sense enough to pass your entrance exams. "'College may make a man of you.' Nothing else will. In the meantime, you'll do something for your keep, besides sulking. For instance, you'll take the bazaar's ninety-eight dollars to the bank this afternoon, and you'll do it without any more whining. As he stood, jammed with eight other people upon the interurban trolley car's back platform that afternoon, Arnon morosely went over in his mind this lunch-table dialogue. He fell to chewing on the unpalatable mess of grievances that had led up to the scene, and he was hot and sick with resentment. Some conscienceless liar once said that school days are the happiest time in life. That same liar would make Ananias or Munchausen look like the original truthful James. In many ways, the school years of a growing boy are worse than a term in prison. They are perhaps a delight to the model youth, but to the average lad they hold more torture than any grown man could endure. It is only the miraculous elastic power of youth that makes them bearable. It is the distorting and falsifying magic of retrospect that gives them their only charm. A grown man, let us say, is in disgrace. If worst comes to worst, he can vanish, and he can start life afresh somewhere else with a clean slate. Let a boy fall into disgrace at school or at home. What road of escape is open to him? Not one. He is much more at the mercy of parent and teacher than any convict is at his warden's mercy. There are strict laws governing the treatment of prisoners by their keepers, but within normal bounds no law holds back a teacher or a parent, or both, from making the boy's life a continuous Hades. Add to all this the fact that every one of youth's countless misfortunes is a hopeless black tragedy in its victim's eyes, and perhaps you will understand why boyhood is not a ceaseless delight. If any man of thirty-six were subjected to the tyranny, the terrors, the bitter dependence, the unescapable and heavy penalties for petty faults that encompass the average half-grown boy. He would go insane in a night. There is no appeal, no way out, for the boy who is in a scrape. For a man in such trouble, there are fifty exits. Small wonder that so many lads yearn for a chance to make their own way in the world, and that they shrink in loathing from the proposed college course, which will keep them in penniless slavery during four more endless years. They have not yet the wit to understand that the so-called higher education is often a pompously windy fetish, whose chief advantage consists in the fact that it enables its possessors to look down on its non-possessors. This philosophy is faulty, of course. It is also non-essential to the story, except that it throws a light on Arnon Flint's mental process as he stood there, the hated money satchel at his feet, trying to keep his balance on the crowded rear platform of the trolley car people were forever boarding or leaving the car. 
A dozen times Arnon was shoved from one spot to another as his fellow standees milled and jostled about him. Always with his toe, he managed to push the satchel to his new standing place. He could not stoop to pick it up. The platform was too crowded. He could not even stoop down far enough to keep his eye on the bag. But he kept in constant touch with it by means of his boot toe. At the ball-ground gate, on the outskirts of the town, three-fourths of the passengers debarked. As the car started on, its rear platform was empty except for Arnon and the conductor and a sawdusty man in overalls. Breathing was easier now. So was standing. A few blocks farther on, a woman got out, leaving a seat vacant on the rear bench. Arnon spied the seat and prepared to take it. As a preliminary, he bent to pick up the satchel from between his toes. "'Drop that, Sonny,' exhorted the sawdusty man in overalls. At the same moment, Arnon was aware that his fingers had met around a canvas strap, and not around the satchel's leathern handle. He peered down in dull amaze. Between his feet was a carpenter's kit. The money bag was nowhere in sight. The thing he had been guarding with his toes was this kit. Someone had long since taken away the satchel. It is an old trick, this lifting of a bag from the floor of a crowded vehicle. But to youth, no misfortunes are old. All of them have the horrible charm of novelty. The satchel was gone, and it had not been taken by mistake, for the sawdusty man's kit was the sole bit of luggage on the platform. The satchel was gone, and with it was gone the ninety-eight dollars collected the night before at the church bazaar. The charity money that had been entrusted to Arnon Flint to take to bank. The money which just then represented Arnon Flint's honor. Now, as any sane reader will know, the one simple and natural thing for the boy to do was to notify the police and thence to go home and tell his parents what had happened. His father was moderately well-to-do and readily could have made up the deficit. Yes, that would have been the one normal thing for Arnon to do, to go home and confess. And, his first name being neither Rollo nor Percival, it is the very thing he did not do. From across the eternal chasm which divides boyhood from middle age, the lad's right course seems absurdly simple. But to no boy, and to no one who recalls the mental agony of boyhood disgraces, will it appear so. As wisely ask an unsuspected sinner to write out a list of his misdeeds and to mail them to his wife and to the police. Arnon had a lively imagination. He had no trouble at all in picturing the scene of his homecoming with such tidings as were his. He who had begged to go to work, whose father had fifty times told him he had not enough level-headedness or sense of responsibility to hold a job for one week. He must go home and admit his father was right. He, whose weekly spending money was just seventy-five cents, must confess he had lost ninety-eight dollars. The magnitude of the sum gripped him with panic force. A few minutes ago he had regarded the bag's contents as merely a heavy mass of small change. Now he knew it for wealth. The knowledge that he had committed no sin did not buoy him up in the very least. A consciousness of innocence is an excellent anchor, no doubt. But what good is an anchor after the ship has sunk? Blindly illogical fright seized the boy as he thought of reporting the loss of such a fortune, and of the present penalty, and the interminable naggings to follow. The unknown has a host of terrors lurking at its heels, but once or twice in a lifetime... These are outweighed by the more tangible terrors of the known, which accounts for suicides. Beyond lay the unknown, behind lay the known. Arnon Flint, in a rush of consequence fear, chose the unknown. In his pocket was the best part of three dollars, the sum still left from his month's allowance received that morning. He stayed on the trolley car until it reached the railroad station. Then he entered the station and bought a ticket for Silk City. 120 miles to westward. Three and a half hours later, he stepped down upon the Union Station platform in Silk City. His plan was made. There was always work for willing hands. Arna knew there was. He knew it because he had read it, yawningly but repeatedly, in the Boys' Uplift magazine, a dreary juvenile monthly for which his father had subscribed in Arnon's name. Arnon intended to get a fair-paying job, work hard, live frugally, and save that lost ninety-eight dollars as quickly as possible. When he should have saved it, he would send it home to make up the church bazaar deficit. At the same time, he could lay pipes for his own immune homecoming. The plan was perfectly feasible. In the meanwhile, Arnon had eighteen cents in his pocket. 
Now, it would be most laudable at this point to say that Arnon's search for work was at once rewarded by a good job, and that his industry and talents won him swift promotion. Until at last he was Silk City's merchant king. The boy's uplift magazine would probably be eager to print such a yarn. But the temptation must be fought down. This is merely the true account of one unlucky boy's life in a strange city. So back again to our story. Eighteen cents is a wobbly foundation for a fortune. Arnon had enough sense to waste none of it in buying a night's lodging. The weather was hot. He had had plenty of experience in camping, so after buying a big bag of broken soda crackers and a wedge of dryish cheese for eight cents, he began to scout for a campsite. An hour's wandering brought him to the very place for his needs. Silk City was a boomberg. Thus, its east end chanced still to be unfinished. Indeed, this section was all but untouched by the hand of man. Arnon left behind him the business blocks, the tangle of resident streets, the scattered tenements and hovels, and came at last to a dreary stretch of common whither even the hopeful development company promoter had not yet ventured. A corner of the common, nearest the junction of two unpaved cross streets, had been used as a dumping ground. Here Arnon Flint found his house. This was an overturned piano box, one of whose sides was caved in. It was a heavy, cumbrous, rickety thing, yet by use of all his care and strength, Arnon managed to roll and drag and shove it into a shallow sand pit a hundred yards from the street. Here he righted the box, planted its base as deeply as possible in the scooped-out sand at the pit's bottom, and went back to the dump in search of boards to reinforce its crack-strewn roof, and for jute and straw to serve as a bed. By sunset he had rigged up a fairly watertight abode, six feet long by four wide, and five in height, with a soft, if bumpy, carpeting of straw and jute. And, as he proved by further scouting, the shack was invisible from the street. Then he tramped to a leaking hydrant a quarter mile distant, washed and scoured a small and large can, both battered but leakless, he had found on the dump, and carried home his night supply of clean water. After which he sat down in the doorway of his piano box shack and prepared his evening meal. Dusk was creeping over the day. Back at home just now the family were sitting down to a repast of fricasseed chicken and dumplings and pie and all sorts of things. Still, crackers and cheese and fresh water are not to be despised as an evening meal, particularly when they are spiced with adventure and reinforced by the hunger of a hustling day. So it was not the frugality of his meal that made the fare so hard for Arnon to eat. At first he did not know just what caused the lump in his throat, and what made even the tiniest morsel of food impossible to swallow. Being only a normal boy, he had never so much as heard of psychology. Nor was there any psychologist there to prate of reaction and nerve exhaustion, and of any of the dozen kindred causes which made the lad feel as he did. One of these causes alone did Arnon understand, and this one, to which he would not confess, was bitter, lonely homesickness. He had cut himself loose from everything and everybody. He was an exile and on the threshold of a new world. For all he knew, he might also be a fugitive from justice. For when the money's loss should be discovered, the bazaar people would probably think him a defaulter and set the police after him. Three hours earlier, Arnon had felt himself a true blend of martyr and explorer. Now he was all at once aware that he was just a lonesome and heavy-hearted boy who had no one to love him and whose only home was a smelly packing box. The lump in Arnon's throat began to swell to unbelievable size, and the eyes wherewith he gazed up over the pit edge at the dying day grew foolishly misted. This would never do. Angrily he cleared his throat and winked very fast indeed. Then he forced himself to daydreams of the splendid job he was going to win on the morrow, and of the brevity of the time that must pass before he should save up ninety-eight dollars and be able to go home. But the effort was a pitiful failure. The lump nearly strangled him and the mist would not behave itself and keep out of his silly eyes. Just then came the diversion that saved him from the eternal shame of crying. The dusky skyline at the edge of the shallow pit was broken suddenly by a small dark silhouette. The boy winked away his rising tears once more and stared. There at the top, looking inquisitively down, head on one side, stood a dog, not much of a dog, perhaps, for looks or for contour or for size, but still a dog. Certainly not a wolf or a lion, as the lad's worn-out nerves had at first made him think. Presently a second dog came alongside the first. Together they blinked down at the lonely youngster. 
Arnon returned their gaze with keen interest. There was still light enough for him to gain a clear view of his two guests. The first dog was a black and tan. At least, he was more black and tan than anything else. He held one forefoot gingerly in air, as though he were lame, and his left ear had evidently been chewed off, as to tip. The second dog was a pale gray, formerly white, and had longish hair. He was of the general build and specification of a dandy Dinmont. He and the black and tan were about of a height. Both were collarless, wolf-thin, and of a totally disreputable aspect. Every city has scores of such strays, forlorn mongrels that eke out a rickety living on the dumps and in garbage cans until they fall prey to dog-catcher or police or vivisector, or until a gang of pursuing boys frighten them into a blind panic and thereby start a new mad-dog scare a scare which wins a credit mark for the fearless blue coat whose pistol is emptied into the harmless and terrified little fugitive. Yes, to a dog fancier's eye, Arnon Flint's visitors were merely a brace of fleesome mongrels. To Arnon, though, they meant all the difference between abject loneliness and loving companionship. Timidly, the boy chirped to the dogs. Up went the ears. He groped for a chipped soda cracker, broke it in half, and held out the two pieces to them. At his gesture, the dogs instinctively shrank back, a result of the piteous experience which had taught them that a movement of the human arm is far more likely to mean a flung stone than a proffered dainty. But it had been a barren day on the dumps, and the sight and smell of food were mighty temptations. Also, the boy was talking to them in a wondrous friendly way, and, whether they can understand words or not, dogs can read the human voice as can few humans themselves. In Arnon's call, the two strays recognized not only friendship, but appeal. They recognized the tones of a fellow stray. Here was no little devil, coaxing them into range in order to tie a tin can or a firecracker to their stumpy tails. This lad was as much a waif as was either of them, and he craved chumship even as they did. Slowly, hesitatingly, mincingly, the puppy slid down the pit bank into the hollow. Nervously, yet greedily, they nipped the offered fragments of the big soda cracker. Ravenously, they ate. Then, as their fears lessened, they fawned upon the human for more food. Arnon, as they chewed the cracker bits, ran his fingers gently along their ears and backs, scratching their heads, all the while talking to them. At first they flinched a little from the unwanted caress, but soon they courted it. The boy, of a sudden, found himself not only happy, but ravenously hungry. He and his two pets finished the crackers and cheese with a zest. Then all three curled up close together in the straw and went to sleep. At sunrise Arnon awoke. Both the dogs were already astir. As he raised his head and sat looking bewildered about, they ran frisking up to him. And thus began the life of the three chums, in the sandpit's piano box shack. It was a wonderful life for all of them. For Arnon, the dog's presence was a veritable godsend. The boy set forth early that first morning to look for a job. Naturally, he did not find one. Not only do business houses cut down their working force in summer, instead of adding to it, but a boy with no references has, at best, a hard time in landing a steady position, especially if he stammers and grows red when he is asked where he lives and the name of his father. No, in spite of the boy's uplift magazine, no kindly merchant was so impressed by Arnon's manliness and good manners as to offer to teach him the business from the bottom up, with the view of making him later on a partner. Arnon, after a half-day's futile job hunt, began to see how matters stood. He was sore inclined to give up the fight and to tramp all the way back to his parents' home. But at once he remembered he could not. He had responsibilities, responsibilities he could not shirk. At the shack, his two dog chums were waiting for his return. He could not take them a hundred and twenty miles afoot. He had no means of feeding them on the way, even if no farm dogs should kill them or rural poundmasters seize them. No, they relied on him, and he had no right to fail them. He must stick. End of section 10、section、11 of Buff, A Collie and Other Dog Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dorr. Buff, A Collie and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Chums, Part Two. That afternoon, by three hours of hanging around the Union Station, he cleared up twenty cents, 
carrying suitcases and opening motor car doors. He stopped at a tenement district grocery on his way back to the sand pit and continued his journey with a very respectable armful of provisions. As he neared the common, Arnon quickened not only his steps, but his heartbeats. Suppose he were wrong in his estimate of his two new friends. Suppose they were only of the cadging, garbage-snooping type, and had deserted the shack the moment his back had been turned. The thought sickened him. It was for his dogs, not for himself. He had been working that day. He reached the sand pit edge and halted. At the same instant, two furry little whirlwinds burst forth from the shack, whizzed up the steep sandy bank, and with barks of ecstasy hurled themselves bodily upon the returning breadwinner. What sweeter homecoming could a heart-sick and tired exile ask? Arnon dropped his parcels, fell on his knees, and gathered his loyal little comrades into one expansive, squirming, yapping embrace. Through his delight at their welcome ran a thrill of joy in his own correct judgment of dog nature, after which the entire party adjourned to the shack for supper. A glorious meal it was. During its progress, the black and tan revealed himself as a personage of rare education by sitting up on his hind legs to beg for food morsels and by rolling over, twice in gratitude at receiving such gifts. The dandy Dinmont had fewer accomplishments, but he showed himself a dog of great natural gifts by mastering, at the third attempt, the art of catching in his mouth a piece of cracker placed on the tip of his nose. Arnon was quite certain that never before had two such remarkable animals come into any one boy's life. They not only learned tricks with the bewildering quickness that a mongrel always possesses and a thoroughbred so seldom acquires, but they speedily learned to look on their new master as a god and to worship him as such. Arna named the hairy dog Dandy, and the black and tan Buck, chiefly because the names seemed to fit like gloves. Morning after morning, Arnon tramped Silt City looking in vain for a steady job. Every afternoon he spent at the Union Station, rustling the hand baggage of passengers and opening automobile doors for them, for which service he averaged from fifteen to forty cents a day. On the lean days, he and his chums breakfasted and supped on crackers and cheese. On days of larger wealth, they banqueted regally on bread and butter and tinned meats and ginger snaps. For an hour, morning and night, the three romped and frolicked together and added to the marvelous list of tricks they had studied. All night, through summer heat or summer rain, they slept in the piano box shack, cuddled into one loving triple heap. Oh, but it was a jolly life for them all. As to the future, the winter, for instance, Arnon had no thought nor care. You see, he was only a youngster, so how could he be expected to have greater forethought than have the army of grown men who live up to every penny of their yearly income with no constructive worry concerning joblessness or old age? For a long, happy month, life was sweet. In the tumble-down pine-board shack, Arnon had occasional twinges of homesickness, and he had more than occasional twinges of conscience at his failure to begin saving the missing ninety-eight dollars. But on the whole, he was having the time of his life. This was true adventure, this outcast summer routine of his, and it was a truer comradeship, too, than any he had known. On the fourth of July he celebrated by adorning each of his chums with a red, white, and blue bow, culled from a length of bedraggled tricolor ribbon he had found in a gutter. On his own birthday, a week later, he spent thirty-five cents upon a truly regal spread in honor of the event. After the sumptuous meal, he treated an invisible audience to the full program of his dog's tricks. It was a gala night at the shack. Next afternoon, Arnon came home a half hour later than usual, having had to carry a suitcase to a new neighborhood and having made a wrong turn on his way back to the common. As he neared the sand pit, he whistled. Then he paused to watch for the usual scurrying race of his chums up the pit bank to meet him, but no frantic joy barks or multiple patter of feet followed upon his whistle. At a jump, Arnon was down in the pit. The dogs were not there. It was twilight before his search of the region was ended. This was its end. Stammeringly, he asked a passing patrolman whether he had seen two little dogs, one black, one light gray, trotting anywhere along the beat, and the policeman made curt answer. Nope, I didn't see him. But the dog catchers was rounding up a bunch of mutts in this ward this afternoon. Better ask at the pound. It's down at the foot of Water Street. Down at the foot of Water Street was two miles away. Arn and Flint made the trip in eighteen minutes, only to find the pound pier was closed for the night. At gray dawn next morning, after ten hours of sleeplessness, Arnon was at the pier again, waiting for its landward gate to swing open for the day. After an endless delay, one of the poundmaster's men arrived. 
Arnon followed him along the pier to the enormous grated pen and the adjoining office at the far end of the dock. In the cage were more dogs than Arnon had ever before seen together in all his life, mongrel, puppy, whelp, and hound, and curs of low degree. They were crowded into the big barred enclosure, a pitiful assemblage. Some dogs were howling, some were barking, some were fox-trotting feverishly back and forth, from corner to corner, pressing close against the bars. Others, mystically aware of their coming fate, lay trembling convulsively from time to time, heads between forepaws, eyes abrim with dumb grief. At the pier's outer edge, just beyond the barred pen, an iron cage swung over the river. It hung from a derrick. Daily, this cage was filled with the dogs that had been longest at the pound. Then it was dipped under water for five minutes, in full sight of the doomed survivors in the pen. A dog pound is not pleasant to look upon. It is little pleasanter to think upon. It is one of the needful evils of every large town, an evil that is needful to public health and to public safety, so say the city fathers. It is also needful because, though people talk much about birth control among humans, where it cannot be enforced, no one bothers about birth control among dogs, where it can very easily be enforced. Litters of dogs are allowed to grow up. The dogs are portioned among people who grow tired of them or who move away. The erstwhile pets are turned out to run the streets and to starve or to pick up a scavenger living. The grim dog pound does the rest. The luckless waifs are done to death by water or by gas, or in the legalized hell of vivisection. May the all-pitying God of the little people have mercy upon them, for most assuredly mankind will not. Arnon stared into the thronged pen. At first, in the dim light, he could make out nothing. Then, through lips that would not steady themselves, he gave the old familiar whistle. Instantly there was a scuttling and scampering from amid the ruck of dogs. Two series of wildly eager barks cut the looser volume of howls, and Dandy and Buck came racing up to the bars that separated them from their adored master. A minute later, a very set-mouthed and white-faced Arnon Flint stalked into the poundmaster's office. Forcing his voice raspingly through the emotion that sanded his throat, he demanded of the man in charge, "'How much does it cost to get a dog out of the pound? I've, I've got a couple of them in there.' The fat man at the desk looked up, wholly without interest. Heartbroken children coming to plead for the return of their law-snatched pets were no novelty at all to him. Poundkeepers have no silly sentiment. If they had, they would not be pound keepers, but normal humans. Dollar apiece, he grunted. That pays their license fee. He turned back to his newspaper and promptly forgot the existence of the shaky and ash-faced boy. Arnon ventured one more question. How long, he quavered. How long do you keep them here before, before you... Depends on how many there are, snapped the man, this time without looking up. In summer, we douse about twenty a day. That was all. Arnon stood gaping uncertainly for a moment. Then he lurched out of the office and back to where his chums pawed at the bars, waiting for him to take them home. Some time later, an attendant dumped a bucket full of food scraps into the center of the pen. Immediately, the larger and fiercer dogs fell upon the food, crowding or scaring the smaller curs away from it. It was all wolfed down by the bullies of the pen before their weaker or more timid brethren had had a mouthful. The boy recalled now that he had crammed most of last night's untasted supper into his pockets to serve him as breakfast during his search for his chums. Quickly he emptied his pockets, apportioning the contents between Buck and Dandy, and harshly ordering off such larger dogs as came snooping around for a share in the meal. At last he went away. There was no time to waste if he was to earn that two dollars for his dog's ransom. Two dollars? Why, the largest sum he had ever earned in one day at Silk City was forty-five cents. And oftener he had not earned half that amount. Yet the money must be gotten somehow, and soon. Then there was another handicap. Out of his earnings, he must buy food for Buck and Dandy during their imprisonment, if he did not want them to starve. Incidentally, he himself must have food, though he wanted none, in order to keep strong enough to work. All day he haunted the Union Station. At sunset he was back at the pound, with a bag full of meat scraps for his chums. He sat beside the bars, talking to them and putting them through their tricks until the pier closed. Then he ran all the way to the theater district, in hope of earning a few cents more by opening the doors of motor cars and carriages. At the end of three days of self-starving and of day and night work, he had collected ninety-four cents. This was all he had been able to save after buying food for his pets and a daily cracker or two for himself. And he had sought work in every waking hour except such times as he set aside for visiting the pound. At dawn on the fourth day he found a dollar bill in the street. 
An early morning traveler gave him 25 cents more for carrying a heavy suitcase a mile to the station. The moment the fee was paid, Arnon dashed off for the pound. He had not only the $2 ransom, but 14 cents left over wherewith to buy the materials for a reunion feast at the shack. His dizzy weakness and hunger were clean forgot in the mad joy of victory. Panting, unsteady on his legs, he rushed down the pier. Before going into the office, he paused at the pen to tell his glorious news to the two prisoners. But his shrill whistle brought no response. He bent down, shading his eyes, and stared into the pen. Neither Buck nor Dandy was there. The souse of the derrick cage as it smote the water, and the simultaneous crazed screams of its twenty passengers reached his ears, and he understood. No longer did Arnon try to fight back the babyish tears. He fell face downward on the pier and gave way to hysterical weeping. His chums, his dear, wonderful chums, the little loyal dogs that had loved him and had comforted him so prettily in his stark aloneness and that had been so perfectly trustful in his power to save them. A man's hand gripped Arnon's heaving shoulder and sought to raise him to his feet. The touch turned his desolate grief into a rage that was all but murderous. This pound keeper, by one word, could have saved Dandy and Buck, and instead he had drowned them. With a beast snarl, the half-delirious boy was on his feet. You swine, he screeched as he whirled towards the man. When I'm big enough, I'm coming back to smash every bone in your fat body, and I'm going to... His words caught in his throat with a click. This was not the fat pound office, man. It was Arnon Flint's father. The boy gaped dazedly. Yes, it was his father. But Arnon cared not one whit for that. His father could send him to jail for theft, or could whale him with a horsewhip, or do anything rotten he chose. It didn't matter. All that mattered was that Buck and Dandy were dead. He glowered up into the man's face, ready for anything that might befall. Then his glower turned to a look of perplexity. His father did not glower back. Instead, Mr. Flint's face was unspeakably tender. Oh, my little boy, he was saying brokenly. Dad's own crazy, gallant little boy. You're worn to a shadow. We've looked everywhere for you. It wasn't till yesterday our detectives struck the trail. And I came right on. I didn't steal the money, said Arnon dully, the bazaar money. I lost it on the trolley car. I tried to get a job to make it up to the church, but... I know, I know, broke in his father, in that same unbelievably tender and quivering voice. Don't think any more about it. I've paid it. Why, dear lad, no one ever supposed you stole it. We knew you couldn't. Will you come back home with me, son? Mother is pretty nearly as thin as you are from worry over you. I'll come home if you like, agreed Arnon listlessly. It doesn't matter much now, either way. I might as well be there as anywhere. Good, approved his father. We can just make the ten o'clock train if we hurry. I've got a taxi waiting at the other end of the pier. Side by side, father and son walked away from the pound. The boy's eyes were downcast. His face was haggard. His heart was dead. From time to time as they walked, the man stole a covert glance at him, and his own face contracted as in sharp pain. Here's the taxi, said Mr. Flint at last. Open the door, will you? You're nearer to it than I am. Mechanically, Arnon turned the handle. As he pulled the taxi door ajar, two furry catapults from within the vehicle launched themselves, rapturously and yelpingly, upon him. You see, explained Mr. Flint to his unhearing son, I had quite a talk with the poundmaster before you got here this morning. He's been noticing you, it seems. And he told me a rather pathetic little story. When I heard it, I decided to make an investment in livestock. I was putting these two puppies into the taxi when you hobbled past me on your way to the pound. I... Buck! Arnon was sobbing in a frenzy of bliss. Buck! Dandy! At sound of their names, the dogs wriggled free from Arnon's embrace, just for the uproarious fun of hurling themselves once more upon him. Hurry up, son, suggested Mr. Flint, clearing his throat noisily. Get aboard. You and the pups. We'll miss that train. Not on your sweet life we won't miss it, exulted Arnon, scrambling into the taxi with his pets. We've got to catch it. You see, I, I want my chums to, to meet Mother just as soon as they can. They're dead sure to like her. End of section 11section 12 of buff a collie and other dog stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by denise nordell buff a collie and other dog stories by albert payson terhune human interest stuff part 1 happiness to jeff titus had become a fine art 
it had become so when he married eve wallace a little wisp of a city girl who had come to the kentucky mountain hinterland to cure a set of weak lungs and who had not only wedded but well-nigh civilized the lanky young mountaineer happiness had remained a fine art for jeff up there on his bare hillside farm with eve it had remained so for the most part ever since his wedding and now in a single breath happiness had taken a place among the lost arts the single breath had been supplied by a sour east wind which had smitten eve as she stood in the shack dooryard waiting for her husband's homecoming she was thinly clad and she was in a perspiration from working in her flower garden her lungs were still weak the east wind did the rest by night she had a heavy cold the third morning pneumonia flung out its flaming red no surrender signal on each of her fever scorched cheeks and life to jeff titus all at once became a horror a frightened anguish gripped him by the throat and shook him to the bewildered soul as he crouched night after night beside the slab bed where tossed and muttered the delirious little wisp of a woman who was at once his mate and his saint eve was so tiny so fragile so good it wasn't fair that this bullying unseen spirit of illness should torture and harry her and sap the life of her while the man who right blithely would have burned to a crisp to please her sat helpless at the bedside unable to do a thing to drive forth the damnable visitant jeff titus dwelt upon the theme of his own impotence to save her he swore venomously and in the peculiarly hideous diction of kentucky mountaineer blasphemy there were doctors of course in the county seat of Danica, thirty-two miles away but they might as well have been in austria for all the good they could do the sick girl jeff could not desert eve to go in quest of such a physician nor could he send one of his mile distant neighbors he knew that it would be of no use those city doctors had no convenient means of getting over the thirty-odd miles of half inaccessible trail to his hinterland farm assuredly none of them was going to make the journey on foot or on muleback leaving his town practice for days at the behest of a hillbilly who perhaps could not or would not pay for the sacrifice meantime eve was growing worse steadily worse even the ignorant jeff could see that so apparently could the only sharer of his day and night vigils a huge and lion-like dog which lay pressed close to the far side of the bed and which all titus's commands could not keep out of the sick-room this dog robin adair was the joy of eve's heart or he had been when her heart could still hold joy and not merely fever and delirium one of eve's ragged hillbilly admirers had given the dog to her in the old days when robin was a roly-poly mass of tawny brown fluff no bigger than a persian cat the dog had grown into a shaggy giant a passing seed catalogue man had told eve he was a collie a breed of which she had heard in a vague fashion as emanating from scotland and she had named him robin adair after the hero of a scotch song her mother had been wont to sing he was robin for short when she had married jeff titus she had brought her beloved collie to live at the mountain shack from the moment his mistress fell ill robin had not once willingly stirred from her bedside drinking little eating nothing the great dog had lain there his sorrowing brown eyes fixed on the small white figure in the big slab bed but of late he was beginning to vary the vigil by low-voiced whines from time to time and once or twice his huge body quivered as if in physical pain it was on the dawn of the fourth day that robin got to his feet with a leap and pointing his heavy muzzle skyward set the still room to reverberating with a yell that was nothing short of unearthly jeff starting from his days of misery made as though to throttle the brute that had broken in on the invalid's unresting rest then remembering eve's affection for the collie he contented himself with picking robin up bodily and bearing him towards the door with the intent of putting him out of the house the door before jeff could reach it was flung open from outside on the threshold stood a ramrod-like figure in rusty black the caller was the rev ephraim stair methodist circuit rider for the upstate counties and a man whose brain and heart had long since made him the blindly obeyed autocrat of his scattered mountain flock what's wrong titus was his wondering greeting as his sharp old eyes flashed from the man with the big dog in his arms to the eternally whispering little form on the bed i heard a scream as i was riding past and oh parson gasped jeff in babbling relief dumping robin on the puncheon floor and gripping the circuit rider by both hands for god's sake do something for her she acts like like she ain't going to get well none loud through the mountains were the praises of stairs medical lore many were the tales of sick folk he had cured when the old women had given them up and had begun gruesomely relishful preparations for the funeral 
Jeff Titus clutched at his unexpected presence, as at a life-belt. Half in superstitious awe, he glanced at the dog whose providential screech had made the clergyman halt in his brisk ride from one county seat to the next. Meantime, Stair had crossed to the bed and, on his knees beside it, was examining the stricken Eve. Jeff came up behind him, standing awkwardly and with open mouth, in expectation of some miracle. But no miracle was vouchsafed. Instead, the clergyman asked one or two questions as to the illness's course, felt the patient's pulse, and her torrid cheek, then ordered his host to go and fetch his saddlebags. "'My medicine kit is in them,' he explained. "'And you can stable my horse, too. I'm going to stay. "'She's, she's going to get on all right now you're here, ain't she?' pleaded Titus ingratiatingly, pausing at the door. "'Get my saddlebags,' was the noncommittal retort. "'Jump! Then you can heat some water. Wait! Before you go, open those windows, and leave the door open. Isn't this poor child having enough trouble in breathing without your sealing the room hermetically?' "'Sick folks hadn't oughter to let have cold air touch em, I've allus heard.' Jeff defended himself, nevertheless obeying. "'It gives em, it gives them life,' retorted Stair. "'Now get those saddlebags.' Next morning Eve was perceptibly worse. The breathing was more labored, the fever blazed higher. This, in spite of Stair and his ceaseless ministrations. Stark despair tore at the husband's throat. Following Stair, as the circuit rider left the room for a moment to wash his hands at the pump, Titus demanded fiercely, "'She's a-aimin' to die, ain't she? Spit out the truth, man. I got a right to hear it.' "'I can't say,' answered Stair, taking no offense at the furious manner. "'She is in the midst of the crisis now. It is the turning point in such cases. If she rallies from that, meanwhile we can only hope and work. It's in God's hands. She—' "'In God's hands!' mocked Jeff wildly. "'In God's hands, hey? You're God a mighty fond of blatting about God, parson. But I take notice he ain't a doing nothing for that poor sick gal of mine in yonder. Why ain't he? Where is he, anyhow, if he can't—' "'He is here.' answered Stair very quietly. Here and in that delirious girl's room back there, he is wherever his children cry out to him in sorrow and pain, just as in your inmost heart you are crying to him now. If his children are too deaf or too scared or too noisy in their grief to know he has come at their call, then the fault is with their own stupidity, and not with the all-pitying father who is carrying them through the ordeal. He pushed past the mouthing Titus and went back to his post in the sick room. On the second morning Eve was in a heavy sleep. Her once parched forehead was moist. Stair, with a jerk of his thumb, motioned Jeff out into the dooryard. On his withered face was the glow of a conqueror. Harshly, as if in doubt of his own self-control, the circuit rider said, The crisis is past. She has turned the corner. I think she will live. The rest depends on nursing, on building her up. You may thank God if you care to, or if you still think he hasn't been here. If he ain't, choked Titus ecstatically, he sent a damn fine substitute. Meaning no disrespect, I, I reckon, parson, I, I reckon y'alls know how small I feel about blabbing like I did, and, and oh, you're dead sure she's a-gonna live? There, there ain't, there ain't nothing I can say, but, but... Incontinently, Jeff Titus bolted around the side of the house and out of sight into the woods, when he returned an hour later, he was carrying a half-armful of kindling. Circumstantially, and at some length, he explained to Stair that he had spent the entire hour in looking for it. Stair accepted the explanation in grave credulity, and forbore to glance towards the high-piled heap of kindling in the woodshed. At noon Eve awoke. She was very weak, very tired, very thin and big-eyed, but she was alive, and in Jeff's heart there was something that made him yearn to howl aloud in rapture and roll on the grass, and to join the church all over again, and to thrash some mystical man for speaking mythical ill of Ephraim Stair, and to turn over his farm and his savings to foreign missions, and to get very drunk indeed, and to buy Eve a gold watch. Being a Kentucky mountaineer and a Titus to boot, he contented himself with grinning down upon his sick wife and grunting, "'Feel better? That's nice. Be all right pretty soon now. Reckon I'd best be getting in some more wood before it rains. So long!' Robin Adair, like his master, knew Eve was on the way to health again. But being only a dog and not a mountaineer, Robin did not sneak out of the house to hide his emotion. He stood beside the bed, his dark eyes aglow, his furry bulk quivering all over with puppyish joy, and wagging his plumed tail frantically every time his mistress looked at him. One evening a few days later the two men were smoking together in the dooryard before turning in. Eve had been made comfortable for the night and was asleep. She had gained a little ground, but her convalescence was maddeningly slow and uncertain to Jeff. The horror of the past fortnight or so had left him nerve-shaken. In spite of all Stair's assurances, he could not throw off his fear for her safety. 
"'She's been through a terrible illness,' patiently explained Stair for the hundredth time. "'Her body and her mind are exhausted. "'She lies there like that because she is resting. "'She is resting because nature is making her rest. "'She is steadily getting better. "'Bar accidents, she is practically out of danger. "'Her strength is beginning to seep back, too. "'It would come back faster, of course, "'if she could rally her tired mind to some great interest in life, "'something that wouldn't tire or excite her too much. "'It would help Mother Nature along.' an interest in life is a wonderful aid in convalescence a bit of unexpected good news for instance good news hey mused jeff his bony hands supporting his leathern face as he cogitated good news hm yes returned stare that or something pleasant to look forward to when she's well enough you might take her to Danica or somewhere for a little outing tell her so it may brighten her to nope dissented jeff it wouldn't i tried to-day told her she must get well right smart now so's we could have a jaunt in somewheres she said she was so tired she reckoned she'd just stay quiet to home a spell it didn't brace her a wee peckle funny too cause just before she was took sick she and me was projectin a whole lot on a trip we was planning to make she'd got her heart real sot on it kind of southern she'd read in the Danica chronicle the fall county fair is on to Danica this week you know and the chronicle told on how they're lottin on holdin the state dog show there the fourth day of the fair that's the day after tomorrow the chronicle said there was to be real silver cups offered for best dogs of a lot of breeds collies was one of the breeds it spoke about well asked stair in no special interest as jeff paused wall went on the mountaineer sheepishly y'all know how much store eve sets by robin here she thinks he's just the finest dog on this yer planet she was a sayin there couldn't be no finer dog in the collie bunch at the show than what robin is and she was honin for us to take him down there and let him get a chance at that silver cup while whatever eve hones for she's a goin to get if it's gettable and if i'm in a reach to get it for her so i agreed we'd take robin to the show she was all het up over the idea of a gettin that ere cup and she was a sayin how granted to be to have the paper print robin's name as winnin it so she could send a copy of the paper down to her folks down louisville way and all that well that's all there is to it he ended with a loud sigh why is that all there is to it demanded stare with sudden inspiration why can't you take the dog down to the show yourself if he really has a chance for the cup that cup and the notice in the paper would do more to stir eve up and to renew her interest in life than any other good news i can think of and it'll be something to look forward to go ahead and do it good oh good exulted a feeble little voice in the room behind them eve had waked during their talk and in her tones as she applauded the plan rang the first interest she had shown since the beginning of her illness stair listening shut his thin lips on a belated objection that had come into his mind while the mountaineer was applauding his chance suggestion it had just occurred to the circuit rider that if robin should not be adjudged worthy of the cup the disappointment was likely to do the invalid more harm than a week of nursing could counteract but it was too late to voice that warning now eve had heard eve was pathetically eager over the scheme and kicking himself mentally for his own impulsiveness the clergyman held his peace he knew nothing about dogs from a show standpoint and mightily he hoped eve's estimate of her pet might be correct but he doubted more and more he doubted collies fit to win silver cups do not often find their way into the mountaineer cabins in the kentucky hinterland timidly stair sought to wet blanket the venture but again he was too late at last eve had the desired interest in life an interest that threatened to bring back her fever the dog show virus is potent as any exhibitor can testify it has a mystic lure jeff once he grasped the idea was swept off his feet by it the fall county fair at Danica had begun its fourth day that day's star feature was to be the all breeds dog show to be held in the agricultural building a gratifying number of dogs was benched in the main hall of the ramshackle structure early on the morning of the show two stewards were busy receiving the fast arriving entrants assigning to them their places in the double aisles of wire partitioned and straw littered benches and assessing latecomers the usual extra fees for post entries to these grievously overworked functionaries in the thick of their labors appeared a lanky farmer of the true mountaineer type he was clad in store clothes that sat on his angular figure as might a horse blanket on a washboard by a rope the hillbilly led a large and shaggy dog whose rough tawny coat had been washed and brushed until it shone like bronze and fluffed out like the hair of a circassian beauty collie dog announced jeff owned by ms jeff titus entered for the silver cup patiently the stewards explained to him that a dog must be entered for one or more of the show's regular classes and that the coveted silver cup was to go to the collie adjudged best in the whole show they also informed jeff that as his was a post entry it would cost him an extra fifty cents to exhibit his dog he was told that in addition to this it would cost him a dollar for every class in which he might enter robin 
as most of this was greek to the puzzled exhibitor one of the stewards asked if the dog had ever before been shown on receiving a negative answer he took one look at the uninterested robin and suggested he be entered for the novice class alone as soon as he could be made to understand that a collie winning in the novice class would stand as good a chance for the cup as would any other titus paid over his money and led robin to the stall in the collie section corresponding to the number the steward had tied to the dog's collar after mooring robin's rope to the ring in his wire partitioned bench and getting him some water jeff had leisure to take in his odd surroundings dogs 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 everywhere dogs more dogs than jeff had known existed dogs of all breeds and sizes from peak to st bernard the iron girdered roof was re-echoing with their clangor they were barking or yapping in fifty different keys but all with the same earnestness jeff saw that each breed had a bench section to itself in the hall's centre to which the bench aisles converged were two wood and wire enclosures in each of which were a low central platform and a corner table and a chair on the tables were neat piles of red and yellow and blue ribbons alongside a record ledger handlers were everywhere busy making their pets ready for the judging crowds of onlookers had already begun to filter through the aisles jeff heard someone say that the judging was about to begin and that collies were to be among the first breeds shown end of section twelve recording by denise nordell modesto california Section 13 of Buff, A Collie, and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Nordell. Buff, A Collie, and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. Human Interest Stuff, Part 2. His general curiosity sated, Titus fell to examining the dogs which were to be Robin's competitors, and at once his mountaineer scowl merged into a grin. Here, forsooth, was nothing wherewith the splendid Robin need fear comparison. Why, of all the nineteen collies on exhibition, there was not one within three inches of Robin's height, nor one which bore any real resemblance to him. These others were strongly slender chaps, with thin heads and tapering noses and tulip ears and slant eyes, whereas Robin's mighty head was almost as broad and heavy as a Newfoundland's. His ears were pricked like a wolf's, and his honest brown eyes were large and round. No, most assuredly he was not in the very least like any other collie entered in the show, or in any exhibition of thoroughbreds since the birth of time poor old robin adair was probably more collie than anything else he may even have been a shade more than half collie but in his veins ran also the mixed blood of many another breed newfoundland predominating look over there jeff heard a dapper collie handler in a linen duster say in guarded tones to a woman who was sifting talcum powder into her gold and white collie pup's fluffy coat over at bench eighty nine what is that thing a dog or a hippopotamus as the woman turned to observe the luckless robin jeff titus strolled across to the man who had called her attention to the dog his eyes were glinting flares behind their lowered lids and his lips twisted into something which looked like a smile and wasn't he said softly beggin you all's pardon mister what was you a happenin to call my dog the man in the linen duster gave one lance at the leathern face peering down so intensely into his then shakily he made reply i i wasn't speaking of your dog sir i was speaking of the dog in the next bench to his i i read the number wrong for yours is a a gr a grand collie sir he gulped and sped down the aisles on a new remembered errand somewhere jeff turned back to robin his mind freed of its momentary angry doubt the collie classes were called a few minutes later the first to be judged were, as usual, the male puppies. Jeff, watching the performance of the entrance, saw how the judging was done. First the dogs were made to march around the ring. Then, in ones or twos, they were placed on the platform while the little tweed-clad judge studied them and felt them all over. After that the judge wrote certain numbers in the ring steward's book and handed to the owner of the winning dog a blue ribbon. A red ribbon went to the owner of the second best, a yellow ribbon to the third, and a white ribbon to the fourth every one of the several collie classes it seemed must be judged in that same deliberate way before the winners of all classes could compete for a rosette whose acquisition meant also the winning of the silver cup jeff began to chafe at the needless delay which must ensue before robin could receive his merited prize then directly after the judging of the puppies came the novice class along with only two other entries jeff titus led the majestically unconcerned robin into the ring as he passed a titter swept the quadruple line of railbirds outside the enclosure 
Jeff did not so much as look about him to locate the cause of the mirth. These fool city folks were always laughing at nothing. Nor did he note the glare, almost of horror, which the little tweed-clad judge bestowed upon Robin, as Eve's adored pet paced into the ring. The judge eyed him with much the expression one might expect to see in the visage of a Supreme Court justice who has been asked to hand down an official opinion on a nursery rhyme. "'Walk your dogs, please,' rasped the judge. The parade started. Robin strolled unconcernedly at his lanky master's side. As he was not a thoroughbred, his nerves were not of the hair-trigger order. The racket and the crowd and the new surroundings did not excite or terrify or make him profoundly miserable, as they did some of the high-strung collies about him. Jeff observed this calm demeanor and was proud of his dog's bearing. The parade was halted. The judge motioned Robin's two competitors to the platform, squinted at them for a moment, ran his hand over them, examined the spring of their ribs, then their teeth, and various other details, stood back and studied them, then handed to the owner of one a blue ribbon and to the other a red. The third prize yellow ribbon he tossed back onto the steward's table. The winners of the first and second prizes departed with their collies. The steward chalked up the next class on the blackboard. But Jeff Titus did not leave the ring. Eyes bulging, cheeks slowly turning from tan to brick hue, he strode over to the judge. Look a here, you! He rumbled in a blend of wrath and dazed incredulity. What's the mean of this year? Are you aiming to double cross me? My dog's worth ten of them orny critters. He's a heap bigger and huskier, and he's purtier to look at, too. What the blue blazes do y'all mean by treating him this way, you hard boiled shrimp? He. With much dignity, the little judge turned his back on the angry Titus and started across the ring. But before he had gone two steps, Jeff was once more confronting him. Look a here, snarled Titus again, striving to keep himself in hand. I ain't going to lay down under no frame up. You judged crooked with my dog. I can prove it. Even if you didn't have the sense to see he was the best of the whole bellin', you was bound to anyhow to give him the yaller ribbon for third prize, and I was bound to do nothing of the sort, rapped out the exasperated judge. I am here to judge collies, not dinosaurs. I refuse to countenance the claim that your dog is a collie by giving him a third prize ribbon, even in a class of three. So in this class I have deliberately withheld the third prize. Your dog is not a collie. The Lord alone knows what he is, but he's no collie. That's all. Clear out. For a man with heart or imagination, there is no ordeal more irksome than to judge dogs. For in almost every division there is some such beast as Robin Adair, a dog loved by his owners who know nothing of shows or of show points. A judge, in fairness to the better exhibits, must pass over these poor animals, and thereby must cause heartache and shame to their pathetic owners. It is not a pleasant task, nor is any phase of dog judging pleasant. It is a thankless and nerve-wracking job at best, and it has a magic quality of turning one's friends into enemies. The little judge at the Danica show was hardened by long practice. Also, he had all the bristling pluck of a rat terrier, and he needed it in facing this lean giant in whose slit eyes the murder light was beginning to smolder. Jeff half extended one windmill arm in the general direction of the judge's throat, and he checked himself. It was going to be bad enough to slink home with no cup, but it would be tenfold worse to go to the Huskow for mayhem. He pictured sick Eve's grief over such a disgrace, and his clenched hand dropped again to his side. Grappling with his temper, the mountaineer wheeled about and led the disqualified Robin out of the ring and back to the bench. A sweet mess he had made of everything, he and that parson up yonder. They had wrought on Eve's hopes and made her so gloriously confident that her dear dog was going to sweep all before him and win the cup. She was lying at home this minute, her big eyes shining with anticipation, her vivid mind picturing the triumph scene at the show. How confidently she would be waiting for that cup! Jeff had sought so enthusiastically to work out Steer's theory of a good news cure. And how was the experiment to result? He must go home on the morrow and tell Eve not only that he had no cup to show her, but that the judge had actually refused Robin a third prize ribbon on the grounds that the dog was a mongrel. What effect was that news going to have on a sick woman whose swift recovery depended on her spirits? Knowing Eve as he did, Jeff was ready to believe it would undo most of her hard-won convalescence, and at the very least, in her weak state, it was certain to make her cry. Jeff would rather have faced a machine-gun nest than make his gallant little sweetheart cry. He began to swear very softly, but very, very zealously, and then his resourceful mountaineer brain unlimbered and went into action. Presently he arose from the bench, patted Robin absent-mindedly on the head, and slouched off towards the end of the hall, where, in a high glass case, were displayed the prize cups and the other trophies. Long and minutely he scanned the glittering prizes, especially the cup engraved Best Collie, 
and he spelled out the printed legend over the case which proclaimed that the cups were supplied by the long famous jewelry firm of pincus bernstein of republic street dunica kentucky ten minutes later leaving robin to shift for himself on his bench jeff was hiking towards the business streets of the mountain metropolis he paused for a space at the bank where he had a carefully scraped together little account and he drew forth a goodly share of that sum then he made his way to the jewelry store after a half hour of dickering he emerged from the shop bearing a bumpy parcel returning to the agricultural hall he seated himself once more on the narrow bench beside the exultantly welcoming robin and proceeded to unwind the tissue wrappings of his package robin looked on in mild curiosity his sense of smell had already told the dog that the parcel contained nothing of vital interest to him yet because he had been lonely and a little worried by jeff's long absence robin evinced a polite concern in the undoing of the wrappings the last layer of paper was removed to the dog's view was exposed a huge and gleaming silver cup a cup with much chasing on its polished surface and with three handles and an ebony base it was at least double the size of the cup offered by the committee for best collie see that questioned titus holding the trophy aloft for robin's inspection forty one dollars that set me back and it had been a heap more only it was left over and had that one little gouge under the age robin if that cup don't tickle her something terrible i'm a clay eater y'all won this year vase today robin by bein best collie just keep a rememberin that i ain't never put nothin over on her before y'all knows that robbie but i reckon it's worth doin this year time she he paused in his low-pitched confidence to the blinking, sympathizing dog. Two men had just halted in front of him. One of them was carrying an apparatus which movie camp memories told Jeff was a camera. It chanced to be a moment when no less than two winners' classes were on in the show rings. Accordingly, the ring sides were banked deep with onlookers, and this secluded section of the aisles was almost wholly stripped of spectators. That was why Jeff had ventured to bring forth the cup from its wrappings. The sight of the two keenly interested men set him to scowling in dire embarrassment. The chairman of the dog show committee was also one of the chief stockholders of the Danica Chronicle, wherefore the dictum had gone forth to the Chronicle City Room that the show was to be played up big in both morning and evening editions, and the paper's best descriptive writer, one Graham, had been assigned to do some human interest stuff about it in addition to the sporting editor's regulation account graham was a good reporter and he had a genius for human interest yarns but of dogs he knew little and of dog shows he knew even less yet gleaning such information on the subject as he could he had set forth for the show this morning taking along the paper's sole photographer after pausing near the front entrance to accustom their ears to the frightful din and to take a snapshot of the trophy case the two newspaper men had wandered down the first aisle into which their non-enthusiastic feet had chanced to stray there suddenly graham saw one of the human interest bits for which he was always hunting midway in an aisle labeled collie section sat a tired man a typical mountaineer beside a huge collie and to the civilly interested dog the mountaineer was exhibiting pridefully a silver cup larger than any in the trophy case he was talking to the dog too in a confidential whisper evidently telling the collie what a splendid victory he had scored and how proud of him his master was here was human interest stuff if ever graham had seen it cup for best collie in the show asked graham of the scowling hillbilly yep snapped jeff titus defiantly good boy exclaimed graham seeking by effusive geniality to break down the mountaineer's surly reserve he's sure one peach of a dog what's his name and what's yours his name said jeff with perilous courtesy is robin robin adair he belongs to my wife miss jeff titus up keatsville way she's sick to home i'm showing him for her got any more questions to pester me with before would you mind holding up the cup a second wheedled graham scribbling with a chewed pencil on a doubled wad of copy paper so thanks still defiantly jeff had held forward the cup for inspection his free arm around the majestic robin's shoulders the camera clicked titus did not hear it through the noise of a hundred barks and yelps besides he was focusing his indignant attention on this slick-spoken opponent of his wall he demanded truculently any more y'all wants of me he's our dog and he's good enough for us if y'all don't like him none but i do effused graham a great dog mr titus and his eye running along the collie section he must be close to championship standard to have beaten all these beauties i'd like to ask you i ain't got nothing more to say growled jeff half rising and his yellow eye tooth began to show under his uncurling lip and if y'all is aiming to start trouble about this year cup graham was not aiming to start trouble not at all did he like the new expression nor the voice of the sulking hillbilly he had sought to patronize with a signal to the photographer he moved rapidly away continuing his progress down the aisle jeff glared after him 
If the man were going to inform the committee that Titus had bought a cup when he had not been able to win one, why, let him do it. Jeff wasn't going to run away, so he held his ground, feeling very wrathful, but somewhat scared. He restored the cup to its wrappings. It would be handier to carry it that way, should he be ejected from the show on account of his fraud. But no one ejected him except that people paused now and then through the course of the day to stare amusedly at poor robin and to straighten their faces in comical haste as they encountered jeff's glower no one molested titus at four in the afternoon jeff's raw nerves could stand the strain no longer untying robin from the bench he led him to the entrance of the hall there he sought the superintendent of the show when can me and my dog get out in here and traipse home he asked no dog is supposed to leave the building before ten o'clock tonight when the show ends replied the superintendent adding with a cryptic glance at robin but i don't think i need hold your entry to those rules go when you like the cup under his arm and robin at his heels jeff departed he had come to town on muleback the dog running alongside even at the best pace he could scarce hope to get home very much before midnight he had come to Danica on the preceding day and had planned to stay until next morning, but already his imagination was afire with the thought of bursting in on Eve that very night with the glittering trophy. So he bent his steps towards the stable where he housed his mule. Across the fairgrounds from the cityward gate a bevy of bare-legged newsboys was scampering with armfuls of newspapers, copies of the Chronicle's first afternoon edition. One of them ran past Jeff. Jeff's keen mountaineer eyes chanced on a dark blotch near the bottom of the swaying sheet's first page. With an unbelieving gasp, he stopped short in his tracks and bawled to the fleeing newsboy to come back. The boy returned, holding out the paper. Jeff snatched it from him, riveting his incredulous gaze upon that dark blotch on the front page. The blotch, at close range, resolved itself into a two-column cut, a picture of Robin lying majestically at full length in his bench, his trustful gaze fixed on the lank man who squatted beside him and who held aloft an ornate silver cup. Above the cut ran the caption, a prize winner and his prize. Beneath the picture were the lines, Mrs. Jeff Titus, Robin Adair, winner of cup for best collie in show. Doubled in single column space under this was one of the two stick human interest stories with which Graham was wont to strew the Chronicle's pages. Jeff's fascinated eyes tore themselves from the picture and caught a glimpse of his own name midway of this explanatory yarn. He read the sentence containing the name, then the next line or so. Slowly and painfully he spelled out, Mr. Titus exhibited the dog for his wife, who is ill at their Keatsville home. With characteristic mountaineer modesty, Mr. Titus refused to sound his splendid exhibit's praises. When congratulated by throngs of admirers who paid homage to the peerless Robin Adair, Mr. Titus's sole comment on Robin's sensational victory was, He's good enough for us! Robin Adair was good enough for the judges, too, and good enough to win over one of the finest aggregations of high-bred collies ever shown in this part of the South. The brief story switched back to the human interest note, to the man's evident rapture in the triumph of his sick wife's pet, and his shy pride in the magnificent cup. But Jeff read no more just then. Whirling on the impatiently waiting newsboy, he demanded thickly, "'Give me all them newspapers you're totin', and then scuttle off and fetch me a dozen more. Scat!' Again he stared in idiotic bliss at the smudged two-column cut. What did it matter to Jeff Titus that the picture and its erroneous caption were to be lifted out of the next edition, and that Graham was to incur the sharpest call-down of his career for the break he had made? Not three copies of the Chronicle a week made their way to Keatsville, and even should the next day's full account of the dog show reach the Titus region, no mountaineer in the state would possess the technical show lore to decipher the cryptic summary of wins and thus learn of Robin's defeat. No, in the mountains the printed word was accepted as gospel fact by those who had education to read it, and its pictures were accepted as such by those who had not bothered to master the effete arts of reading and writing. Jeff was going to take home enough papers to go around the whole sparse neighborhood, in addition to those which were to be mailed to Eve's people at Louisville and to any other distant kin or friends of hers. Not in the very least did Jeff Titus understand the meaning of this newspaper tribute, nor did he bother his overwrought brain about it, he had the required good news for Eve. He had printed and pictured proofs thereof. If this didn't help along her tardy cure by leaps and bounds, I ain't never lied to her yet, Robin, he informed the prize winner as they ambled homeward at dusk over the purpling miles of hilly trail. Nor yet I don't aim to now. We'll walk in on her with the cup. And when she asks, all pleased and tickled like, why, whatever is this here for? We'll just stick a copy of the newspaper up in front of her. I'm bettin' the recordin' angel is due to strain his poor ears till they ache him if he lots on catchin' me tellin' a lie to that God blessed gal. End of section thirteen. Recording by Denise Nordell, Modesto, California.
Section 14 of Buff, A Collie, and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Buff, A Collie, and Other Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. One Minute Longer. Wolf was a collie, red gold and white of coat, with a shape more like his long-ago wolf ancestors than like a domesticated dog's. It was from this ancestral throwback that he was named Wolf. He looked not at all like his great sire, Sunnybank Lad, nor like his dainty, thoroughbred mother, Lady. Nor was he like them in any other way, except that he inherited old Lad's staunchly gallant spirit and loyalty and uncanny brain. No, in traits as well as in looks he was more wolf than dog. He almost never barked, his snarl supplying all vocal needs. The mistress, or the master, or the boy— any of these three could romp with him, roll him over, tickle him, or subject him to all sorts of playful indignities, and Wolf entered gleefully into the fun of the romp, but let any human besides these three lay a hand on his slender body, and a snarling plunge for the offender's throat was Wolf's invariable reply to the caress. It had been so since his puppyhood. He did not fly at accredited guests, nor indeed pay any heed to their presence, so long as they kept their hands off him. But to all of these the boy was forced to say, at the very outset of the visit, "'Pack, lad, and Bruce all you want to, but please leave Wolf alone. He doesn't care for people. We've taught him to stand for a pat on the head from guests, but don't touch his body.' Then, to prove his own immunity, the boy would proceed to tumble Wolf about, to the delight of them both. In romping with humans, whom they love, most dogs will bite more or less gently, or pretend to bite as a part of the game. Wolf never did this. In his wildest and roughest romps with the boy, or with the boy's parents, Wolf did not so much as open his mighty jaws, perhaps because he dared not trust himself to bite gently, perhaps because he realized that a bite is not a joke, but an effort to kill. There had been only one exception to Wolf's hatred for mauling at strangers' hands. A man came to the place, on a business call, bringing along a chubby two-year-old daughter, the master warned the baby that she must not go near Wolf, although she might pet any of the other collies. Then he became so much interested in the business talk that he and his guest forgot all about the child. Ten minutes later the master chanced to shift his gaze to the far end of the room, and he broke off with a gasp in the very middle of a sentence. The baby was seated astride Wolf's back her tiny heels digging into the dog's sensitive ribs, and each of her chubby fists gripping one of his ears. Wolf was lying there with an idiotically happy grin on his face, and wagging his tail in ecstasy. No one knew why he had submitted to the baby's tugging hands, except because she was a baby, and because the gallant heart of the dog had gone out to her helplessness. Wolf was the official watchdog of the place, and his name carried dread to the loafers and tramps of the region. Also, he was the boy's own special dog. He had been born on the boy's tenth birthday, five years before this story of ours begins, and ever since then the two had been inseparable chums. One sloppy afternoon in late winter, Wolf and the boy were sprawled side by side on the fur rug in front of the library fire. The mistress and the master had gone to town for the day. The house was lonely, and the two chums were left to entertain each other. The boy was reading a magazine. The dog beside him was blinking in drowsy comfort at the fire. Presently, finishing the story he had been reading, the boy looked across at the sleepy dog. Wolf, he said, here's a story about a dog. I think he must have been something like you. Maybe he was your great-great-great-great-grandfather. He lived an awfully long time ago in Pompeii. Ever hear of Pompeii? Now the boy was fifteen years old, and he had too much sense to imagine that Wolf could possibly understand the story he was about to tell him but long since he had fallen into a way of talking to his dog, sometimes, as if to another human. It was fun for him to note the almost pathetic eagerness wherewith Wolf listened and tried to grasp the meaning of what he was saying. Again and again, at sound of some familiar word or voice inflection, the collie would pick up his ears or wag his tail, as if in the joyous hope that he had at last found a clue to his owner's meaning. "'You see,' went on the boy, "'this dog lived in Pompeii, as I told you, You've never been there, Wolf. Wolf was looking up at the boy in wistful excitement, seeking vainly to guess what was expected of him. And, continued the boy, the kid who owned him seemed to have a regular knack of getting into trouble, 
all the time. And his dog was always on hand to get him out of it. It's a true story, the magazine says. The kid's father was so grateful to the dog that he bought him a solid silver collar. Solid silver? Get that, Wolfie? Wolf did not get it, but he wagged his tail hopefully, his eyes alight with bewildered interest. And, said the boy, what do you suppose was engraved on the collar? Well, I'll tell you. This dog has thrice saved his little master from death, once by fire, once by flood, and once at the hand of robbers. How's that for a record, Wolf, for one dog, too? At the words Wolf and Dog, the collie's tail smote the floor in glad comprehension. Then he edged closer to the boy, as the narrator's voice presently took on a sadder note. But at last, resumed the boy, there came a time when the dog couldn't save the kid. Mount Vesuvius erupted. All the sky was pitch dark, as black as midnight, and Pompeii was buried under lava and ashes. The dog could easily have got away by himself. Dogs can see in the dark, can't they, Wolf? But he couldn't get the kid away, and he wouldn't go without him. You wouldn't have gone without me, either, would you, Wolf? Pretty near two thousand years later, some people dug through the lava that covered Pompeii. What do you suppose they found? Of course, they found a whole lot of things. One of them was that dog, silver collar and inscription and all. He was lying at the feet of a child, the child he couldn't save. He was one grand dog, hey, Wolf? The continued strain of trying to understand began to get on the collie's high-strung nerves. He rose to his feet, quivering, and sought to lick the boy's face, thrusting one upraised forepaw at him in appeal for a handshake. The boy slammed shut the magazine. "'It's slow in the house here with nothing to do,' he said to his chum. "'I'm going up to the lake with my gun to see if any wild ducks have landed in the marshes yet. It's almost time for them. Want to come along?' The last sentence Wolf understood perfectly. On the instant he was dancing with excitement at the prospect of a walk. Being a collie, he was of no earthly help in a hunting trip, but on such tramps as everywhere else he was the boy's inseparable companion. Out over the slushy snow the two started, the boy with his light single-barreled shotgun slung over one shoulder, the dog trotting close at his heels. The March thaw was changing to a sharp freeze. The deep and soggy snow was crusted over, just thick enough to make walking a genuine difficulty for both dog and boy. The place was a promontory that ran out into the lake, on the opposite bank from the mile-distant village. Behind across the high road lay the winter-choked forest. At the lake's northerly end, two miles beyond the place, were the reedy marshes, where a month's hence wild duck would congregate. Thither with wolf, the boy ploughed his way through the biting cold. The going was heavy and heavier. A quarter mile below the marshes the boy struck out across the upper corner of the lake. Here the ice was rotten at the top, where the thaw had nibbled at it, but beneath it was still a full eight inches thick, easily strong enough to bear the boy's weight. Along the grey ice field the two plodded. The skim of water which the thaw had spread an inch thick over the ice had frozen in the day's cold spell. It crackled like broken glass as the chums walked over it. The boy had on big hunting boots, so apart from the extra effort the glass-like ice did not bother him. To Wolf it gave acute pain. The sharp particles were forever getting between the callous black pads of his feet, pricking and cutting him acutely. Little smears of blood began to mark the dog's course, but it never occurred to Wolf to turn back, or to betray by any sign that he was suffering. It was all a part of the day's work, a cheap price to pay for the joy of tramping with his adored young master. Then, forty yards or so, on the hither side of the marshes, Wolf beheld a right amazing phenomenon. The boy had been walking directly in front of him, gun over shoulder. With no warning at all, the youthful hunter fell, feet foremost, out of sight through the ice. The light shell of new frozen water that covered the lake's thicker ice also masked an air hole nearly three feet wide. Into this, as he strode carelessly along, the boy had stepped. Straight down he had gone, with all the force of his hundred twenty pounds, and with all the impetus of his forward stride. Instinctively he threw out his hands to restore his balance. The only effect of this was to send the gun flying ten feet away. Down went the boy through less than three feet of water, for the bottom of the lake at this point had started to slope upward toward the marshes, and through nearly two feet more of sticky marsh mud that underlay the lake bed. His outflung hands struck against the ice on the edges of the air hole and clung there. Sputtering and gurgling, the boy brought his head above the surface and tried to raise himself by his hands, high enough to wriggle out upon the surface of the ice. 
Ordinarily this would have been simple enough for so strong a lad, but the glue-like mud had imprisoned his feet and the lower parts of his legs, and held them powerless. Try as he would, the boy could not wrench himself free of the slough. The water, as he stood upright, was on a level with his mouth. The air-hole was too wide for him, at such a depth, to get a good purchase on its edges, and lift himself bodily to safety. Gaining such a finger-hold as he could, he heaved with all his might, throwing every muscle of his body into the struggle. One leg was pulled almost free of the mud, but the other was driven deeper into it. And, as the boy's fingers slipped from the smooth, wet ice edge, the attempt to restore his balance drove the free leg back, knee-deep into the mire. Ten minutes of this hopeless fighting left the boy panting and tired out. The icy water was numbing his nerves and chilling his blood into torpidity. His hands were without sense of feeling as far up as the wrists. Even if he could have shaken free his legs from the mud now, he had not the strength enough left to crawl out of the hole. He ceased his uselessly frantic battle and stood dazed. Then he came sharply to himself, for as he stood the water crept upward from his lips to his nostrils. He knew why the water seemed to be rising. It was not rising, it was he who was sinking. As soon as he stopped moving the mud began very slowly but very steadily to suck him downward. This was not a quicksand, but it was a deep mud bed, and only by constant motion could he avoid sinking farther and further down into it. He had less than two inches to spare, at best, before the water should fill his nostrils, less than two inches of life, even if he could keep the water down to the level of his lips. There was a moment of utter panic. Then the boy's brain cleared. His only hope was to keep on fighting, to rest when he must for a moment or so, and then to renew his numbed grip on the ice edge and try to pull his feet a few inches higher out of the mud. He must do this as long as his chilled body could be scourged into obeying his will. He struggled again, but with virtually no result in raising himself. A second struggle, however, brought him chin-high above the water. He remembered confusedly that some of these earlier struggles had scarcely budged him, while others had gained him two or three inches. Vaguely, he wondered why. Then, turning his head, he realized. Wolf, as he turned, was just loosing his hold on the wide collar of the boy's mackinaw. His cut forepaws were still braced against a flaw of ragged ice on the air hole's edge, and all his tawny body was tense. His body was dripping wet, too. The boy noted that, and realized that the repeated effort to draw his master to safety must have resulted at least once in pulling the dog down into the water with the floundering boy. "'Once more, Wolfie! Once more!' chattered the boy through teeth that clicked together like castanets. The dog darted forward, caught his grip afresh on the edge of the boy's collar, and tugged with all his fierce strength, growling and whining ferociously the while. The boy seconded the collie's tuggings by a supreme struggle that lifted him higher than before. He was able to get one arm and shoulder clear. His numb fingers closed about an upthrust tree limb which had been washed downstream in the autumn freshets and had been frozen into the lake ice. With this new purchase and aided by the dog, the boy tried to drag himself out of the hole. But the chill of the water had done its work. He had not the strength to move further. The mud still sucked at his calves and ankles. The big hunting boots were full of water that seemed to weigh a ton. Then, through the gathering twilight, his eyes fell on the gun, lying ten feet away. Wolf, he ordered, nodding toward the weapon. Get it! Get it! Not in vain had the boy talked to Wolf for years, as if the dog were human. At the words and the nod, the collie trotted over to the gun, lifted it by the stock, and hauled it awkwardly along over the bumpy ice to his master, where he laid it down at the edge of the air hall. The dog's eyes were cloudy with trouble, and he shivered and whined as with ague. The water on his thick coat was freezing to a mass of ice, but it was from anxiety that he shivered, not from cold. Still keeping his numb grasp on the tree branch, the boy balanced himself as best he could, and thrust two fingers of his free hand into his mouth, to warm them into sensation again. When this was done, he reached out to where the gun lay and pulled its trigger. The shot boomed deafeningly through the twilight winter silences. The recoil sent the weapon sliding sharply back along the ice, spraining the boy's trigger finger and cutting it to the bone. "'That's all I can do,' said the boy to himself. "'If anyone hears it, well and good. I can't get at another cartridge. I couldn't put it in the breech if I had it. My hands are too numb.' For several endless minutes he clung there listening, but this was a desolate part of the lake, far from any road, and the season was too early for the other hunters to be abroad. The bitter cold, in any case, tended to make sane folk hug the fireside, rather than to venture out so far into the open. Nor was the single report of a gun uncommon enough to call for investigation, 
in such weather. All this the boy told himself as the minutes dragged by. Then he looked again at Wolf. The dog, head on one side, still stood protectingly above him. The dog was cold and in pain, but, being only a dog, it didn't occur to him to trot off home to the comfort of the library fire and leave his master to fend for himself. Presently, with a little sigh, Wolf lay down on the ice, his nose across the boy's arm. Even if he lacked strength to save his beloved master, he could stay and share the boy's sufferings. But the boy himself thought otherwise. He was not at all minded to freeze to death, nor was he willing to let Wolf imitate the dog of Pompeii by dying helplessly at his master's side. Controlling for an instant the chattering of his teeth, he called, Wolf! The dog was on his feet again at the word, alert, eager. Wolf! repeated the boy. Go! Hear me? Go! He pointed homeward. Wolf stared at him, hesitant. Again the boy called in vehement command, Go! The collie lifted his head to the twilight sky, with a wolf howl hideous in its grief and appeal, a howl as wild and discordant as that of any of his savage ancestors. Then, stooping first to lick the numb hand that clung to the branch, Wolf turned and fled. Across the cruelly sharp film of ice he tore, at top speed, head down, whirling through the deepening dusk like a flash of tawny light. Wolf understood what was wanted of him. Wolf always understood. The pain in his feet was as nothing. The stiffness of his numbed body was forgotten in the urgency for speed. The boy looked drearily after the swift vanishing figure which the dusk was swallowing. He knew the dog would try to bring help, as has many another and lesser dog in times of need. Whether or not that help could arrive in time, or at all, was a point on which the boy would not let himself dwell. Into his benumbed brain crept the memory of an old Norse proverb he had read in school. Heroism consists in hanging on one minute longer. Unconsciously, he tightened his feeble hold on the tree branch and braced himself. From the marshes to the place was a full two miles. Despite the deep and sticky snow, Wolf covered the distance in less than nine minutes. He paused in front of the gate lodge at the highway entrance to the drive, but the superintendent and his wife had gone to Patterson, shopping that afternoon. Down the drive to the house he dashed. The maids had taken advantage of their employer's day in New York to walk across the lake to the village, to a motion picture show. Wise men claim that dogs have not the power to think, or to reason out things in a logical way, so perhaps it was mere chance that next sent Wolf's flying feet across the lake to the village. Perhaps it was chance and not the knowledge that where there is a village, there are people. Again and again in the car he had sat upon the front seat alongside the mistress when she drove to the station to meet guests. There were always people at the station, and to the station Wolf now raced. The usual group of platform idlers had been dispersed by the cold. A solitary baggage man was hauling a trunk and some boxes out of the express coupe onto the platform to be put aboard the five o'clock train from New York. As the baggage man passed under the clump of station lights, he came to a sudden halt, for out of the darkness dashed a dog. Full tilt, the animal rushed up to him and seized him by the skirt of the overcoat. The man cried out in scared surprise. He dropped the box he was carrying and struck at the dog to ward off the seemingly murderous attack. He recognized Wolf, and he knew the collie's repute. But Wolf was not attacking. Holding tight to the coat skirt, he backed away, trying to draw the man with him, all the while whimpering aloud like a nervous puppy. A kick from the heavy-shod boot broke the dog's hold on the coat skirt, even as a second yell from the man brought four or five other people running out from the station waiting room. One of these, the telegraph operator, took in the scene at a single glance. With great presence of mind, he bawled loudly, Mad dog! This, as Wolf, reeling from the kick, sought to gain another grip on the coat skirt. A second kick sent him rolling over and over on the tracks, while other voices took up the panic cry of mad dog. Now a mad dog is supposed to be a dog afflicted by rabies. Once in ten thousand times, at the very most, a mad dog hue and cry is justified. Certainly not oftener. A harmless and friendly dog loses his master on the street. He runs about confused and frightened, looking for the owner he has lost. A boy throws a stone at him. Other boys chase him. His tongue hangs out, and his eyes glaze with terror. Then some fool bellows mad dog, and the cruel chase is on. A chase that ends in the pitiful victim's death. Yes, in every crowd there is a voice ready to raise that asinine and murderously cruel shout. So it was with the men who witnessed Wolf's frenzied effort to take aid to the imperiled boy. Voice after voice repeated the cry. Men groped along the platform edge for stones to throw. The village policeman ran puffingly upon the scene, drawing his revolver. 
finding it useless to make a further attempt to drag the baggage man to the rescue wolf leaped back facing the ever larger group back went his head again in that hideous wolf howl then he galloped away a few yards trotted back howled once more and again galloped lakeward all of which only confirmed the panicky crowd in the belief that they were threatened by a mad dog a shower of stones hurtled about Wolf as he came back a third time to lure these dull humans into following him. One pointed rock smote the collie's shoulder, glancingly, cutting it to the bone. A shot from the policeman's revolver fanned the fur of his ruff as it whizzed past. Knowing that he faced death, he nevertheless stood his ground, not troubling to dodge the fusillade of stones, but continuing to run lakeward then trot back, whining with excitement. A second pistol shot flew wide a third grazed the dog's hip from all directions people were running toward the station a man darted into a house next door and emerged carrying a shotgun this he steadied on the veranda rail not forty feet from the leaping dog and made ready to fire it was then that the train from new york came in and momentarily the sport of mad dog killing was abandoned while the crowd scattered to each side of the track from a front car of the train the mistress and master emerged into the bedlam of noise and confusion "'Best hide in the station, ma'am,' shouted the telegraph operator at sight of the mistress. "'There is a mad dog loose out here. He's chasing folks around and—' "'Mad dog,' repeated the mistress in high contempt. "'If you knew anything about dogs, you'd know the mad ones never chase folks around, any more than diphtheria patients do. Then—' A flash of tawny light beneath the station lamp, a scurrying of frightened idlers, a final wasted shot from the policeman's pistol, as Wolf dived headlong through the frightened crowd toward the voice he heard and recognized. Up to the mistress and master galloped Wolf. He was bleeding, his eyes were bloodshot, his fur was rumpled. He seized the astounded master's gloved hands lightly between his teeth and sought to pull him across the tracks and toward the lake. The master knew dogs, especially he knew wolf and without a word he suffered himself to be led the mistress and one or two inquisitive men followed presently wolf loosed his hold on the master's hand and ran on ahead darting back every few moments to make certain he was followed heroism consists in hanging on one minute longer the boy was whispering deliriously to himself for the hundredth time as wolf pattered up to him in triumph across the ice with the human rescuers a scant ten yards behind. End of section 14、section、15 of Buff, A Collie, and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Buff, a collie, and other dog stories by Albert Payson Terhune, The Foul Fancier, Part One. In the sixth round of his fight with Kid Feltman, the end came, and it was not at all the end that anybody but Dan Work and Keegan, his manager, looked for. For the outclassed and battered and wabbling Rourke won. Two minutes earlier, no one in the Pastime Athletic Club Auditorium would have bet a cancelled lottery ticket on Rourke's chances and the result left the crowd as puzzled as was the raging Feltman himself. No, Rourke did not see one sweet face among the throng, a face that nerved him to superhuman effort and victory, nor did he spur himself to a Herculean last stand that won him the fight. That was not Dan Rourke's way, and most assuredly it was not the way of his manager and mentor, Red Keegan. The victory was won by subtler and less hackneyed methods. Here, in brief, was the procedure— at the end of the fifth round, Dan had slumped back in his corner, dizzy and gone. Red Keegan's practiced eye summed up his condition as it had summed up his chances during the past two rounds, and he whispered, "'Time's come for it, Danny boy. He's too many for you.' Danny boy needed no further amplifying of the order. Twenty times in the gym, under Keegan's shrewd tutelage, he had rehearsed what now he was about to do. Rourke rose sluggishly, groggily, staggering to the summons for the sixth round, he swayed drunkenly toward the center of the ring, seeing which the crowd screeched to Feltman to sail in and finish him. Obligingly, Feltman prepared to obey the behest of his patrons. He took no chances of a possible trick by laying himself open, but, with all the zest that could include caution, he went for his worn-down opponent. Rourke met the onslaught right gamely. 
He called on all his waning strength for one last desperate rally, and the crowd did homage to his gameness by howling approval. Feltman was a wise man. He knew this false burst of power could not last. Sooner than waste himself in fighting back, he covered and waited for the momentary flash to burn out. But the cheering of the fickle crowd was too much for him. After an instant of blocking and retreating, he met the pathetically brief rally, foot to foot. There was a flurrying exchange of close-quarters blows, Rourke spinning about so that his back was toward the referee, and as he spun, Rourke screamed out in mortal agony. His gloved hands flew heavenward, pawing the air. He sank to the canvas floor, doubled up like a jackknife, his hands clutching spasmodically at his abdomen some two or three inches below the belt. Feltman stepped back in astonishment. He had not struck below the belt. He could not account for Rourke's posture of anguish. But for the fallen's man face, both Feltman and the perplexed referee would have branded the squirming and groaning antics as a pure fake. But there was nothing fake-like in the face that twitched above the writhing body. Rourke's swarthy visage had gone green-white. It had the ghastly hue of death. On the instant, Red Keegan was leaning over the ropes, shaking his fist in Feltman's face and squalling shrilly, "'Foul! Did you see that, Mr. Referee? You saw it! You couldn't miss seeing it! Foul! Look at the poor lad, will ya? He's dying!' The referee, Honest Roy Constantin, lived up to the record that had given him his nickname. Rourke was rolling about the floor in torment. His face was better endorsement of his condition than would have been fifty doctor's certificates. Only by a foul could such agony have been caused. Not alone was Rourke's manager claiming it, but fifty voices from boxes and bleachers were taking up the yell in the wantonly sheep-like fashion of fight fans. Honest Roy himself had been behind Rourke at the moment the blow was struck, but he had seen that Feltman was leading for the body, and he could deduce the rest. While Kid Feltman wrought at the mouth with impotent fury, Honest Roy Constantin therefore awarded the fight to Rourke on a flagrant foul and the whole thing was done on the strength of Rourke's facial aspect. If Constantin had chanced to be an actor instead of a pool-room czar, he would have never been taken in by so simple a trick, for even in those days it was a common ruse on the stage. Dan Rourke at the outset of the round had drawn in a deep breath, and he had held it. This, together with his wild exertions, had turned his complexion to a purple-red, then, suddenly, as he fell, he had relaxed his muscles and his breathing, and had at once taken another breath, and rolled his eyes upward. The receding blood had left his face a chalky green. Long rehearsed acting had done the rest. After that first frenzied glare at the referee, he had let his head droop, and had hidden his slowly incarnadining cheeks from further view. The one glimpse of his corpse-like face was enough for Honest Roy. "'You see, Danny,' apologized Keegan, when he had half carried his principal to the dressing-room, "'it was the only way out. We either misjudged that Feltman bird wrong, or else we overplayed the big improvement you've been making these past few months. One or the other, it don't matter which. The way it lays, you ain't good enough, not yet, to go up against a top-notcher like him. I seen that before you'd been in the ring two rounds. He was a-eating you up. It was either pull the good old foul claim, or stand for a knockout. I didn't dast give you the office for any funny business. Not with Honest Roy refereeing. He's a crank on square fighting, Roy Constantin is. He'd have spotted any of our best ones, so I had to frame it other way round. But it was a close call at that. When Red Keegan picked Dan Rourke out of the night shift puddler crew at the Pitvale Steelworks, he did so after a long psychological study. This study dealt much with the young middleweight's rugged strength and gameness and his natural skill as a fighter but it concerned itself equally with Rourke's innate gift for more subtle things, among the rest a certain crude ability for acting. Then he had moulded the ignorant boy according to his own wily plans. As a man, Keegan was not a marked success. As a crooked diplomatist, he had a spark of genius. Too fragile and too timid to hit a blow himself, he was a born ring general, and it was his joy and his talent to study out more foul tactics than occur to the normal fighter's bovine brain in the course of a lifetime. None of these maneuvers came under the head of rough stuff, or even of coarse work. There was a finesse to them all. They could be pulled, rightly learned by the right man, under the very nose of the average referee. Not once, but six times had Dan Rourke gone into the ring, coached by Keegan, and bested men who were his superiors. He had done it by a succession of crafty and murderous fouls which the referee failed to bring home to him. 
Twice, by unobtrusive butting in the course of a clinch, he had ripened his half-stun antagonist for an easy knockout. Again, he had driven his specially shod heel down the instep of Spider Boyce with such scientific force as to make the sufferer drop his guard long enough to let in a haymaker to the jaw. Surreptitious kneeing was another of his arts. All these tricks seemed broad and obvious in the telling, so would a full description of the method whereby a conjurer hauls a kicking rabbit out of an empty hat. It is all in the way it is done, and, thanks to Red Keegan's tireless rehearsing and to his own peculiar talents, Rourke did it in a way to defy casual detection. When an over-keen referee happened to be the third man in the ring, there were other tactics to fall back on. In such event, and with a too formidable opponent, there were still diverse means for wooing victory. The claim of foul and the white-faced anguish, for example. Twice before, in other sections of the fight map, had Rourke and Keegan worked this bit of acting. As a result, Dan Rourke was rising fairly fast in his profession. He was not of championship timber. He would never develop into such a contender, nor does one real-life fighter in fifty, but he was good enough to do all manner of things to dozens of fairly good men in the rank and file of the middleweight army. And the dollars were drifting in. To Dan Rourke himself, fresh from the puddling gang, and seeing the fight game only through Red Keegan's gimlet eyes, there was nothing wrong or even doubtful in his own methods. He took his orders from Keegan, and his share of the cash profits. He did not bother his thick head about ethics. It was a week after the Rourke-Feltman battle, and while Kid Feltman was still making the sporting world ring with his cries of trickery and his clamor for a return match, Rourke and his manager had gone back to their hometown of Pitvale, not only for a needed rest, but to let certain unjust and cruel accusations blow over. Rourke, some months earlier, had been installed in the biggest room of the manager's Pitvale bungalow, and had settled thus into the first semblance of a home he had ever known since his graduation from the orphan asylum twelve years agone. Behind the bungalow was the rickety barn which served as his training quarters. Dan's old fellow toilers of the Pitvale Steelworks had bet loyally on their former associate in his fight with the redoubtable Feltman. Even though their paladin had won on a foul, still he had won, and they had cashed in on their bets. Gratitude welled high in their souls, and it took a practical form. On the morning of the eighth day, after the match, a delegation of five puddlers invaded the Keegan bungalow at breakfast time, escorting among them a big young collie dog, gold and white in hue, classic in outline, kingly in bearing. The pup had belonged to the foreman of the night shift, who was taking a job somewhere out west, and could not carry his pet along. So the boys had bought him cheap, and now presented him in due and ancient form to Dan Rourke, as a pledge of their hero-worship. In all his twenty-four years, Rourke never before had had a dog of his very own. Such luxuries had not been encouraged at the orphan asylum, nor at any of the steel works boarding houses where he had since lived. Now, at sight of the splendid beast, the friendship of a normal man for a good dog woke within him. In spite of Keegan's sour protests, the pup was installed in the bungalow as a permanent member of the household. In honor of the champion, who just then was the idol of Rourke's profession, the newcomer received the historic name of Jeff. An instant and perfect liking sprang up between Jeff and his middleweight master. From the first, the two were inseparable. For some reason best known to himself, the young collie accepted the fighter as his one and eternal lord, and lavished on him a single-hearted devotion he had never granted to his former, uninterested owner. To Rourke, the dog was a revelation. His starved heart went out to the collie's staunch friendliness. His sluggish imagination was stirred to unguessed depths by the dog's flashes of cleverness and of gay loyalty. His vanity, and something deeper, was touched to the quick by the deathless worship in his pet's eyes. If Dan Rourke strayed through the town for the sake of giving the Pitvalians the privilege of gazing on their foremost citizen, Jeff was always trotting gravely at his side. If he suppled his hard muscles by a ten-mile hike through woodland and over mountain, the collie's plumed tail was ever just ahead as pacemaker for the trip. At meals, Jeff stretched himself out on the floor beside Rourke's chair, scorning to beg, but eagerly receptive of such food bits as were tossed to him. At night the dog slept outside Rourke's door, a keenly alert sentinel over his master's rest. Once, down on Main Street, a Rourke fan swatted the fighter applaudingly on the back. In practically the same instant the swatter was on his own back in the street, with Jeff's teeth menacing him. The collie had misunderstood the motive of the blow, and after the manner of his kind, had sprung to his demigod's defense. This sealed once and forever Rourke's love for Jeff. The dog had risked dire punishment to ward off a fancied danger from him. It was wonderful, tremendous, 
Dan told of it for the next six weeks, whenever he could find anyone to listen to his marvellous yarn, and he added so many unconscious details in the repeated telling that latecomers in the succession of listeners were left with a vague impression that Jeff had beaten off fully a dozen armed men who had assailed the fighter. Keegan used to groan in spirit whenever Dan pointed out Jeff to some chance caller and began the oft-told saga. One dog-man earned Rourke's lifelong hatred and the many-adjectived appellation of liar by his tactlessness in saying, Why, most any good pup will do as much as that if he thinks someone's trying to hurt the feller that owns him. Dan Rourke was calmly certain that no other dog on earth would have had the pluck and the loyalty to do it, and gradually Jeff became to him a sort of fetish for everything that was noblest, which perhaps was quite as natural as that a high-bred collie should deem Dan Rourke worthy of adoration. End of section 15section 16 of buff a collie and other dog stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ellen preckle buff a collie and other dog stories by albert pace and Trahune. the foul fancier part 2 on a slippery and slushy morning in early spring some 6 months after dog and man formed their life partnership dan started through a corner of pitvale for his daily hike he had just won a foul-encrusted battle, and had not yet signed up for another. In the interval, before hard training should set in, he was keeping in shape by means of these daily tramps, and by a little gym work. He and Jeff came abreast of Vining's livery stable, and were about to swing past it, when out through the open doorway flashed something tawny and big and ponderous. In other words, Vining's vile-tempered old mongrel English mastiff had caught scent of the approaching collie, and had dashed forth to do battle with the stranger. That was a cute trick of Vining's dog. He was a terror in the neighborhood, this huge mastiff with the quarter streak of St. Bernard and the temper of a sick wildcat. And for years he had maintained his repute as local bully. Even now, when age and weight were beginning to slow him down, he still reveled in the prospect of springing out upon some unwary and less warlike dog as it passed the stable, and doing his industrious best to kill it. As it chanced, this was a street seldom used by Rourke, and Jeff and the Mastiff had never before met. Jeff, mincing along on fastidious white toes through the slush, close behind his master, had no warning of the attack. The first hint of danger came when, out of the ever-watchful corner of his slanting dark eye, he chanced to see the whizzing, brindled bulk bearing down upon him. There was no time to get out of the way, even had Jeff been of the breed that gets out of the way when peril shows its shining face. To the average dog there would have been no chance to prepare for the impact, but the best type of collie is not an average dog. In his brain, though never in his heart, he harks back to his wolf ancestors. It was this ancient wolf strain now that made the sedately pacing Jeff spin sideways as though on a pivot, letting the mastiff fly past him, the flaring jaws missing his head by an inch. The mastiff whirled almost in mid-air and came back to the assault, but as he charged a second time Jeff was not there. The collie had not run, he had merely sidestepped, and in the same motion his white eye-tooth scored a deep furrow in the side of the charging foe. Dan Rourke had swung aloft his walking-stick to stop the unequal fight and rescue his chum, for he had heard of the brindled monster's prowess. But at this move from Jeff he let his striking arm drop, idle, and he sputtered aloud in stark admiration. Footwork, Bajee, and countering, too! Lord, but Jim Corbett might have been proud of that stunt! Again the Mastiff was charging in, lurching craftily, to drive his nimbler foe into the angle of door and wall, and thus to corner him and render his footwork useless. Jeff saw through the ruse, but he saw too late to escape. Now the collie was a scant eighteen months old. His chest and shoulders had not yet gained the proportions that would be theirs in another two years. Moreover, this was his first battle. Left to himself he would never have sought trouble, for he was a friendly and frolicsome youngster who had met with nothing but kindliness in all his brief life. But his every muscle and joint was as lithe as oiled whipcord. There was not a fleck of loose flesh on his wiry sixty-six-pound body, and behind his conscious brain burned not only the battle prowess, but the uncanny shrewdness of his ancient vulpine forebears. Back in the wilderness days, the wolf that could not hold his own in warfare and be ready for all surprises was the wolf that died exceeding young and left no progeny. The wolf that won the right to have descendants was the wolf brave enough and quick-witted enough to transmit his life-saving traits to those descendants. 
all this a thousand years ago, and Dan Rourke's pet collie was profiting by it. When the Mastiff charged him, Jeff acted on pure instinct. Having shown his resentment at the effort to chew him up, he was now quite content to let the quarrel rest where it was. But apparently this dog mountain who had attacked him would not have it so. In fact, the Mastiff had cornered him, and the only road to safety was to go through a foe nearly twice as big as himself. This looked like an impossible task, yet Jeff tackled it. His hindquarters were wedged between the open door and the street wall. In front was the Mastiff. The big dog was not charging now. No need to waste speed and rashness on a helplessly cornered victim. Head down, legs crouched, the Mastiff crept on his waiting prey. There was a hideous menace in the crawling, savage advance. Up went Dan Work's stick again. Dan had gripped the weapon by the ferrule, and he was measuring the distance between its clubbed handle and the giant mongrel's head. But as before, he did not strike, for there was no need. The Mastiff gathered himself for a death spring, but Jeff sprang without waiting to gather himself. Jeff did not spring aloft as did the other. He dived under the rearing forelegs, slashing one of them to the bone as he sped. The Mastiff snapped murderously at his whizzing foe as Jeff passed under him. His ravening teeth closed on nothing but a bunch of golden rough hair instead of reaching their goal in the collie's vertebrae and the mouthful of fur was his sole asset from the encounter. Roaring aloud with rage and with the pain of his flesh wounds, the mongrel bounded out of the corner and made for his escaped victim. Now Jeff had fought his way out of the trap at no worse loss than a bunch of neck hair. The whole world lay before him as an avenue of retreat. No domestic animal but the greyhound can pass a strong young collie in a foot race, and assuredly this unwieldy mastiff could never have hoped to overhaul him. But a queer change had come to the friendly youngster during that ugly moment in the corner. He, who had always been on jolly terms with everyone, had been set upon in unprovoked fashion, while he was minding his own business. He had been threatened with death, for a less clever dog than Jeff could not have failed to read red murder in the Mastiff's bloodshot eyes. More, a wad of his fur had been yanked out in most painful fashion, and for the first time in his eighteen pleasant months of life, hot wrath surged up in the collie's friendly heart. This giant was not going to treat him so and get away with it scot-free. The battle yell of his wolf ancestors burst from Jeff's furry throat. As the mastiff turned, he faced a wholly different antagonist from the astonished puppy he had set upon in the corner. Rough a bristle, head down, snowy fangs glinting from under his upwrithing lip, young Jeff flew to meet him like a fluffy catapult, and a truly epical fight was on. The Mastiff went at his work with veteran ferocity and method, born of fifty death fights, but he had run up against something unique in his long experience. Jeff was not there, or rather, Jeff was everywhere at once, and nowhere in particular. He was in and out and over and under, never wasting time in seeking for a permanent hold, but nipping, tearing or slashing, and then striking at almost the same instant for some totally different part of the mongrel's big body. The Mastiff reared and thrashed about, ever striving to pin his eel-like adversary under him, to crush him down by dint of vast weight, to pinion him while the heavy foam-flecked jaws should find their death-hold. But Jeff had an annoying fashion of not staying in any one place long enough to be annihilated. And at every impact his white teeth were leaving their red mark. "'It's Corbett and Sullivan all over again,' blithered Dan Rourke, his expert eye following each move his soul afire with prideful ecstasy at his untried chum's marvellous war genius. Will you look at that footwork, he exhorted high heaven and the fast-gathering knot of spectators. Then his triumph song became a grunt. The mastiff, in one of his mad plunges, had found his mark. His jaws closed on Jeff's fur-padded shoulder, and he hung on. With one wrench of his bull head, he bore the slighter dog to the earth and began to grind his jaws into the shoulder he had seized. For a moment Jeff writhed and flung himself about impotently in the fearsome grip. In that instant of futile heaving, his eyes sought and met Rourke's, and in the flashing gaze there was no tinge of fear or of appeal. It was as though he tried to assure the man he had fought his best, and that he was sorry he could do no better. But before Dan's stick could go up there was a new flurry of fur and flesh, and Jeff's sharp teeth had sunk in agonizing style deep into one of the mongrel's thick pads. The pain was so sudden and acute that the Mastiff loosed his merciless shoulder-grip to lunge for the collie's head, and in that brief instant Jeff was not only on his feet and free, but was back at the assault with all his primal zest. The Mastiff, bleeding and almost breathless, reared for another attack. His cut hind foot clawed at a film of ice on the slippery pavement. He lost his balance and fell, floundering on his back in the slush. 
For a second he lay there, stunned, for his head had hit the edge of the open door as he fell, and his brindled throat was exposed and defenseless. "'Now's your chance, Jeff,' chortled Rourke deliriously. "'Finish him!' But the collie did not take the chance. As the mongrel tumbled backward, Jeff had darted in at him, but when he saw the huge brute prone and helpless on the ground, the collie, for some innate sportsmanly reason, forbore to fly at the inviting throat and rip out the jugular. Instead, looking down in grave wonder at the sprawling, kicking mastiff, Jeff took a step backward and stood, ears cocked, head on one side, slender body still braced for action, waiting for the fallen dog to rise. Dan gasped, then he swore aloud. The worn-out mongrel staggered to his feet, all the fight knocked out of him by the stunning head blow and by loss of blood. Jeff danced forward afresh to the fray, but, tail between legs, the mastiff turned and limped off into the stable. His back and the slipping hind legs offered rare chance for the victor to clinch his hard-won conquest, but Jeff only stared in mild interest after his beaten enemy. Then, limping a bit from his shoulder wound and panting fast from his fierce exertions, he trotted over to Dan Rourke and thrust his wet muzzle into his master's hand, as if in quest of sympathy or praise. He got both. Barely crowing with exultation, Dan dropped his stick and flung both arms about his scarred pet in a breathtaking bear hug. "'Gee, but you're the real thing, Jeffy,' he caroled, fondling the inordinately happy dog. "'Of all the pups that ever happened, you're—you're you're that pup. Say,' appealing to the crowd, "'did you birds ever see the like of this feller's footwork? Did ya? And did you see how he wouldn't pitch into that big stiff when he was down and out? Some white man, I'll say. Come on home, Jeff. That shoulder of yourn will stand some patching. Come on, champ. Gee, but I sure named you after the right man. There ain't anything double your weight can lay a glove on you. Red Keegan pattered home excitedly from a morning visit to the Pitvale Hotel. In his hand he was brandishing a telegram that had been received at the hotel telegraph desk while he was there. He made his way on hurrying feet to the barn back of the bungalow, which served his fighters as a gym, and where, at this time of day, Rourke was reasonably certain to be dawdling with the punching bag. He came upon Dan, kneeling beside his collie, washing out lovingly a deeply ragged cut in the dog's right shoulder. At sight of the manager, Rourke broke forth into a gleeful recital of the bout between Jeff and the Mastiff, but he had scarcely gotten through the first sentence when Keegan cut him short. "'That can wait,' decreed the manager, waving the telegram. "'This can't. Listen, I've clinched Feltman, at last, for right here in Pitvale. Main bout for the athletic carnival next month. Four thousand dollars. Biggest purse ever. Those carnival guys don't seem to care how they spend it, and they count on your being a star attraction here in Pitvale. Remember, we figured they'd do that. Uh-huh, assented Rourke, unimpressed. But, say, Red, you'd ought to have seen the way Jeff lit into him after he'd fought his way out of that corner. He Shut up, commanded Keegan, with the exquisite courtesy of his kind. Here we're landing the biggest thing we've ever pulled off, and you go gassing about a measly dog fight. I tell you, well retorted Dan, nettled at his manager's tone, and still more at his total dearth of appreciation for Jeff. I don't see as there's anything to put on a silk shirt for, in the bunch of news you've lugged home with you. When I fought Feltman back in August, you and Bud Curley would have had to carry me out of the thing heels forward if we hadn't been able to swing that white-in-the-face claim of foul. I've gone ahead some since then, I know, but I don't figure I've gone ahead far enough to stop Kid Feltman. And we can't try the same white-faced stunt a second time. He'll be watching for it. So will the referee, whoever he is. You act like you'd bring home a gold mine, Red. Looks to me like you'd carted back a hornet's nest. How's the purse going to be split? A lad like Feltman'll want it. Danny, interposed Keegan with a weary scorn. You talk even foolisher than you look, and you look foolisher than any other man the Lord ever bothered to pin a face on to. I told you, a month ago, the way I was aiming to work this thing. If you've got more interest in how you're bandaging that cur's shoulder than in the way we're due to make a killing, there's no use going over it all again to you. I remember, last time, you were so busy teaching Jeff to speak for bones that you didn't more than half listen to me, and now I suppose i got to say it all over again. He sighed. It was the sigh of a martyr. But Dan did not answer. With worried tenderness he was twining about Jeff's hurt shoulder a festoon of witch hazel soaked bandage. With patience, and ostentatious and grunt-punctuated patience, Keegan waited until the first aid task was ended and the bandaged collie was curled up at his master's feet. Then he spoke. Feltman's been after that return fight with us, he began, with labored detail, and as if talking to a mental defective, till he's got so he'd pretty near be willing to get into the ring with you blindfolded and with both hands tied behind him. Maybe you know that, if you know anything, which you don't. 
He's itching to square himself for that one on foul of ours, and I've been letting him itch till he wouldn't gag on terms. But at that, it's a miracle we've landed him. Anyone with a grain of sense ought to see through it. First, I juggle the carnival crowd into making him and his manager stand for Saul Krampfmuller as referee. If there's anything Saul knows less about than refereeing a fight, I'd like to know what it is. Being sporting editor of the Chronicle here, he thinks he knows it all, and what he don't know, he suspects. I've seen him referee two fights. Why, that porosity wouldn't know a foul if it was printed out for him on a raised map. Anyone could get by with murder with him as referee. It's most a shame to try the real classy stunts on him. Any raw work would do. Feltman's nearer a top notch than you'll ever get to be in a fifty years, but he's a numbwit. You could hit him with an axe in the ring before he'd find out he was being fouled. So there's your combination, a chucklehead referee and a fair fighting guy who don't know how to watch out for fouls. And then there's you, who I've learned to be the best lad at slick fouling in the whole business. Why, it's too easy. It's a crime. You can cripple or dizzy him in the very first round if you've a mind to, and as often after that as you need. Then keep remembering that $4,000 purse with 80% for the winner, and even a minus brain like yours ought to be able to figure out the answer. We'll start your training tomorrow. I've a couple of corking new ones I've worked out lately. One of them's a killer, and both of them smooth enough to get past most any referee, let alone Saul Kampfmuller and that carnival crowd. We'll work em out and brush up on a few of the old ones, too. So, funny thing, spoke up Rourke, his hand on the dog's head. Funny thing about Jeffy here. He had a dandy chance to rip the throat out of that mining dog, and he wouldn't do it, just because the dog was down and couldn't help himself. What do you think of that, Red? Just because the other dog was down. No referee to penalize him for fouling, either. He just stepped back, kind of polite-like, and... For the love of Mike, groaned the irate manager, will you stop jawing about that bum cur and... Then pursued Rourke serenely. When Vining's dog turned tail and sneaked away, Jeff had the chance of his life to tear in and do all sorts of damage, but he didn't. Wouldn't fight foul, the grand little cuss. Rourke fell silent. The manager stared at him in lofty and wordless contempt, but Dan did not see him. Still patting Jeff's head aimlessly and brooding over the couch and dog with puckered, half-shut eyes, he sat there. Dan Rourke was thinking, and thought, to him, was as difficult as it was rare. Presently he spoke again, in a rumbling, ruminating mutter. "'Wouldn't fight foul, Jeff wouldn't,' he repeated. "'Fought like a bearcat, so long as the scrap was even, but not a foul stunt from first to last. Wouldn't win on a foul. He couldn't tell but what that big mutt would get up and tear him in half, like he'd just come plenty close to doing. But Jeff wouldn't tackle him while he was down. Wouldn't—' "'Say,' put in Keegan, "'I'm going to the house to write a letter and then send off a wire.' Keep right on talking, please, all the while I'm gone. Keep on telling about that dog fight. Then, by the time I get back, maybe the most of it will have gone out of your system, and you can think of real things again. So long. Dan Work did not obey his manager's elephantinely sarcastic request to go on talking of the dog fight in Keegan's half-hour absence, but he did the next thing. He went on thinking about it. At least his wantedly sluggish thoughts fixed themselves on one detail of the fray, clinging to it like leeches and sending forth ramifications into the far and unused recesses of his brain. These thoughts were not put into words, but their gist may be translated roughly into English somewhat as follows. Jeff had fought without training or precept. He had followed his own instincts. He had fought according to his nature. Thus he had fought fair. He had fought clean. Not only had he disdained to make use of any crooked advantage, but he had risked defeat and possible death, sooner than to foul. Jeff was a dog. Dan Rourke was a man. How did Dan Rourke win his fights? Three out of four of them he won by clever fouling. He fought crooked. That was how he made his living, by tactics his own dog would not stoop to. The collie looked on Dan as the greatest person under the sun, yet the dog fought square and Dan fought foul. What was the answer? It was a joke in fistic circles that Dan Wark was the dirtiest fighter in that section of America, and that he managed to get away with it by sheer craftiness. Dan had felt, still felt, a thrill of admiration for Jeff for fighting so fair. Wasn't it possible that the fight public might give that same sort of admiration to a man who was known to fight fair? Going a tottering mental step farther, wasn't it just barely possible that all regular folks had the same little thrill of admiration for a fellow who was on the level in everything? It was a funny idea, of course, but then again it was great to have someone, even a dog, look up to anybody as Jeff looked up to his master, and to think that master was the best man alive. 
What sort of mangy hypocrite was Dan Rourke to make his living crookedly by superfouling while Jeff thought he was a saint? The dog fought clean. The man fought dirty. Was the man lower than the dog? It was a rotten thought, but it had a whole lot of sense to it. If Jeff here could risk death sooner than fight foul, what was the reason why Dan Rourke... At this point in the argument, Dan stopped and started all over again from the beginning. He was on the third complete review of it when Red Keegan came bustling back. Well, queried the manager briskly, have you told yourself enough about the dog fight so you can remember it a while without telling it again? I, I guess so, mumbled Dan uncertainly, and he made excuse to get out of the way. He was still thinking, thinking hard, and with a growing unhappiness. His thoughts were not yet crystallizable into words. But next morning, after a night of less continuous slumber than he could recall in many a year, he dressed and started down to breakfast with a brand new and granite-hard resolve in his tired mind. For once in his life he had solved a problem, had solved it all himself. End of section 16section seventeen of buff a collie and other dog stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by ellen preckle buff a collie and other dog stories by albert payson terhune the foul fancier part three as he opened the door of his bedroom jeff leaped eagerly up from his nightly vigil post across the outer threshold Stiff as he was from his shoulder hurt, the dog gambled gleefully round his master, patting at Dan's knees with his flying white paws, wriggling himself into an ecstatic interrogation mark, and whimpering with delight at the wonderful fact that his adored demigod was once more with him after ten whole hours of absence. Thus, the world over, do the average run of collies give morning salute to the man or woman they have accepted as their deity, and, as ever, the greeting warmed Dan Rourke's long loveless heart. He stooped over and patted the silken head. The collie growled in horrific menace, and caught Dan's big hand between his mighty jaws as if to crush it. But the jaws did not exert the pressure of a fraction of an ounce on the firm flesh they had so playfully imprisoned, and the throaty growls were belied by a furious wagging of the plumed tail. This was Jeff's favorite game with his master. With no one else would he deign to play. Dan rumpled the dog's soft ears and looked with a queer new timidity into the deep-set dark eyes of his chum. At the unquestioning joyous devotion he saw there, he felt a tiny twinge of relief. Something he had let himself fear in the long night's meditations had not yet begun to happen. There was still time, plenty of time. And his resolve firmer than ever, he ran down to the breakfast room, where Red Keegan was already seating himself at the table. "'Chronicle's got a spread on your match with Feltman,' was the manager's morning salutation. First page, and again under Camp Muller's signature, on the sporting page. We've got a good start, all right. Now— "'If it isn't too late,' said Dan hesitantly, "'I kind of wish you'd cancel the match. "'I don't honest think I can stop Kid Feltman, "'for all you say I've gone ahead this half-year, "'and it's more an even bet he can stop me inside the limit. "'So I've been thinking it over, "'and I guess you'd best call it off, "'or get him to substitute some easier guy than Felt. "'Good Lord!' snorted Keegan. "'Do you sit there and tell me you don't even remember "'from yesterday the layout for that fight? "'Of all the—' "'Yep.' answered Rourke, sullenly playing with his food, and glancing down for encouragement at the collie lying on the floor beside him. Yep, I remember it all right. All right, Red. I remember it. But it won't work. That's why I— Won't work, thundered Keegan, glaring across at his embarrassed star. Why the blue hell won't it work? It's the prettiest setup we've ever handled. There ain't a flaw to it. Won't work. Why the— "'Because,' replied Dan sheepishly, yet firm as stone, as he glowered back at his manager, "'because that set-up of yours calls for a heap of fancy fouling, and—and I'm—I'm I'm off fouling, off it for keeps. That's—' Red Keegan broke in on the halting announcement with a sound that a turkey might have produced had its tail feathers been pulled violently at the moment it chanced to be gobbling. The result was a noise that brought Jeff to his feet with a jump, his tulip ears cocked, his eyes aglow with excited inquiry, a series of staccato barks racketing from his furry throat. "'Lay down, Jeffy,' ordered Dan. "'He ain't going to bite me. He's only—' "'Are you plumb crazy, Dan?' sputtered the manager. "'Or is it a bum little joke? Off oh, fouling, hey! What's going to keep you from the hungry house if—' "'If clean scrapping won't keep me fed,' answered Rourke, "'I'll go get my job back in the puddling gang. "'Anyhow, it goes like I said. I'm off fouling. "'Now go ahead and swear.' 
But Red Keegan did not go ahead and swear. Profanity was a very present help to the nerves, in the event of stepping on attack, or mashing one's thumb with a hammer, or on hearing that one's wife had eloped. But this matter lay too deep for swearing. Blusteringly, then flatteringly, then coaxingly, and at last with the tremolo stop pulled far out, he pleaded with Dan. He painted in glowing colors the middleweight's comfortable rise from the ranks and the golden future that awaited him under Keegan's guidance, if only he would have the intelligence to stick to his manager's tuition and not get fool ideas that he could fight on the square well enough to keep himself warm. He foretold a future of failure and gutter poverty should the fool hold to this suicidal new plan, to all of which Dan Rourke answered not a word but sat glumly frowning at the spotty tablecloth, and occasionally letting his fidgety hand rest for a second on Jeff's head. When at last Keegan had run down, and was bereft equally of breath, and vocabulary, and emotion, Dan began to speak. He did not look at the puffingly apoplectic manager, but rambled on as if addressing the hole in his napkin. A feller told me once, he began, that there's mighty little a collie dog don't know, and I've seen enough of Jeff here to find out that's so. Jeff can tell when I'm blue, and when I'm tickled, just by looking at me. It, it'd be funny, wouldn't it, if he could get to telling, by looking at me, that I'm not on the square. A dog with Jeff's breeding and Jeff's sense would sure be too high-toned to pal with a crook, if he knowed it. And he knows a lot of things I'd never supposed an animal could know. He looked down again at the collie as if for moral support. At the worry in his master's glance, Jeff's dark eyes took on a glint of eager concern, he laid one white little forepaw on Dan's muddy boot and whined softly far down in his throat. Thus encouraged, Rourke went on. That's only one end of it. Here's another. A man's pretty low down in the list, ain't he, if he can't even fight as square as his dog can fight? A clean dog sure got a right to a clean master. Them folks yesterday was all praising Jeff. They wasn't praising him so much for licking the big feller as for licking him clean, and for not fouling when he had a chance to. I could see that myself. Well, I should think folks would feel that way about a man that fights clean. Anyhow, he finished defiantly, no poor dog's going to have the right to say he's a whiter man than what I am. I've been thinking it all over, and that's the answer. I'm off fouling, like I said. For the next twenty-four hours, the bungalow and the gym were vibrant with the sounds of argument and vituperation. Keegan exhausted his every battery, and, like most men who think slowly and seldomly, Dan Rourke grew more and more firmly set in his queer resolution the more he discussed it. Even stolid Bud Curley, his sparring partner and general handyman round the gym, was moved to bewilderment by the once docile fighter's firmness in resisting the all-powerful boss. Only once, in a day and night of abusive exhortation on Red's part, did Dan lose for an instant his sullen calm. That was when Keegan grumbled, "'It's all the damn dog's fault. It's him that's turned you loony. I've got a good mind to shoot him. Then maybe you'll—' "'You shoot that dog,' flared Work striding up to the little manager, his thick fingers working convulsively, and by the good Lord I swear I'll break your neck over my knee if I go to the chair for it. That goes for you, too, Curly. If you think I'm bluffing, you'd best change your mind, unless you're sick of staying alive. It goes. To Bud Curly's surprise, the irascible Red did not retort. Instead, he stood looking long and earnestly at the raging fighter. Then he said with conciliatory calm, Nobody wants to hurt the pup, Dan. Climb down off the ceiling, and if you're so dead set on playing the fool, well, I suppose I'll have to trail my bets along with yours. You can't lick Feltman on the square, but it won't be my fault if you don't put up the best fight of your life again him. It's too late to cancel the match now. All me and Curly can do is to train you to the minute and trust to luck for the rest. Glad to have won his sorry point, Dan settled down with grim energy to the task of training. He knew how slight were his chances of victory, yet he was ready to meet the suddenly reconciled Keegan halfway by training at his level best. Feltman and a little retinue came to Pitvale in order to be on the ground and to avoid travel before the fight. They set up training quarters scarce two blocks away from Keegan's bungalow. For nearly a month the two rivals wrought at their preparations for the battle. Once or twice on a hike or a sprint they chanced to meet in street or high road, and such well-rehearsed chance meetings with their mutual scowling frigidity, served Camp Miller as a splendid grudge-fight copy for the Chronicle. The fight was to be held in the Pitvale Coliseum, a vast and barn-like structure, originally built for state conventions and for summer Chautauqua lectures. It was scheduled for ten o'clock on the night of April 2nd. On the morning of April 2nd, Dan Rourke awoke from a ten-hour sleep, ran under the shower, 
rubbed down, slipped into his clothes, and started for breakfast with the appetite of a longshoreman. His nerves, as well as his physique, had profited by his hard, wise training. If he was due to end the day in defeat, at least the thought of it had not marred his night's rest or his appetite. Outside his bedroom door he paused as usual for his morning frolic with Jeff. But Jeff was not there. In all their long months of chumship, this was the first morning that Jeff had not been on hand to greet with noisy delight his new awakened master, and the dog's absence perplexed Rourke. Downstairs he went, hoping to find the collie waiting for him in the dining room. The room was empty. Whistling for the missing Jeff, Dan went out on the tiny front porch. No dog was in view, but he saw Keegan and Bud working with scrambly haste at the far end of the yard, piling shovelfuls of fresh dirt into what looked like a new dug hole under the yard's one fruit tree. Before Dan could call out, Curly happened to look up from his toil and caught sight of him as he stood on the porch steps. Curly nudged Keegan and said something out of the corner of his mouth. The two exchanged nervous whispers. Then Red dropped his spade and came hurrying toward the house, a laboredly artificial smile of greeting on his bothered face. "'Seen Jeff anywhere?' asked Rourke, his puzzled eyes still on Curly, who was now patting the crumbly earth smooth over the filled excavation. "'Sure I've seen him,' babbled Keegan with forced joviality, and looked anywhere rather than at Dan. "'He was frisking around here just a minute ago. Must have run down street a ways. He'll be back soon. Come on in and eat. Sleep all right? I wasn't expecting you down for another ten minutes.' He had mounted the steps and almost forcibly was propelling Dan indoors. "'Looking for Jeff?' hollowly queried Bud Curly, coming up the steps behind him. "'He's all right. Good old Jeff's all right. He was playing around in the gym just now.' Dan Rourke was the least subtle of men, and his brain was too small to hold suspicion, but a five-year-old child would have been keenly aware of the guilt and furtiveness in the manner of the two. Dan stopped short. He looked from one to the other of them, and then at the fresh earth under the fruit tree. "'Red, you told me Jeff went down the street,' he accused. "'And now Bud says he's out in the gym. "'Which of you is lying? "'And why is either of you lying? "'And what were you burying out there? "'Speak up, one of you, or I'll go out there and dig till I find out.' He spoke with rising excitement. As he finished, he made as if to start across the yard toward the tree. Both men seized him, and both began speaking at once. "'Jeff's all right,' insisted Red. "'And we was just spading up the earth to make that tree grow better. "'It's too spindly, and—' Yes, declared Bud in the same breath. Jeff's feeling fine. He'll be back presently. We was trying to see could we bury some garbage out yonder instead of bothering to burn it. We— Jeff is dead, interrupted Dan, his voice all at once lifeless and flat. You've been burying him. You don't want me to know. He— The two others fidgeted guiltily. Then, clearing his throat, Keegan said, I wanted to keep it from you till after tonight, Danny. I'm sorry. Sorry right down to the ground. "'But since you guessed that much of it, I'd best tell you the whole thing. "'Buck up and take it like a he-man, son. "'After all, he was only just a dog. "'I'll buy you another one, and—' "'There ain't any other one,' denied Rourke chokingly. "'There was only one, just Jeff. "'Him and me. "'And he was the chum I—' "'What happened to him?' he demanded fiercely, "'swallowing very hard and trying to keep his voice steady and his eyes dry. "'Spill it!' "'Then take it,' cried Keegan harshly. "'Take it straight, like a he-man had ought to take the rotten news. "'This morning, when I went past your door, there lay Jeff. "'He was stone dead. "'I picked him up and brang him down on the porch. "'I knowed how it would queer your nerve to find out he was gone. "'So I aimed to bury him and tell you he had just strayed off like, "'and he would come home by and by. "'When I got him out on the porch, I noticed he was all strained backward, "'and I'd seen dogs poisoned by strychnia before. "'There ain't any other poison that makes him look that way. "'He poisoned!' yelled Dan in a blind fury catching at the word. I'll find the swine that did it, if it takes every cent I got, and when I once get hold of him. I beat you to it, Danny, continued Red's sorrowing tones. I got Curly here to start digging a grave, and I piked down to Reuter's drug store. I had a sneaking suspicion already. Reuter was just opening up for the day when I got there. I asked him who had brought strychnia of him lately. The only strychnia he's sold in the past week was what he sold to a man yesterday. A feller who had a doctor's prescription for it, said he wanted it to poison cats that kept him awake by yowling under his window. He got Reuter to tell him how to fix it up in a piece of meat. Who was he? broke in Rourke, his eye teeth showing, his deep voice a half-coherent growl. Who? The doctor that gave the man the prescription, said Keegan slowly, was that old down-and-out M.D. slob that Feltman has for a handyman. The feller that brought the poison and asked Reuter how to fix it was Kid Feltman. He— 
The manager got no further. Dan Rourke was out the door and down the steps in one bound. It was only as he stopped to yank madly at the gate latch that Red and Curly overtook him and threw themselves bodily on the raging man. Even then it was a matter of minutes before their combined strength and Bud's wrestling grip from behind could quell him. Let me go, he snarled, straining and biting at the detaining arms. I'll settle with him before Jeff's cold. I'll— you'll settle with him a heap better and by trying to beat him up now with his handlers and them to keep you from doing it promised keegan there's better ways lots better ways you listen to me danny boy momentarily spent with his own fury rourke suffered himself to be dragged indoors there keegan faced him and said you want to square yourself with feltman and more and square yourself good then here's the way feltman's always hated you ever since he lost to you that time he's told fifty folks he'd get even he's seen and he's heard how much store you set by jeff so he poisoned him to get back at you. Now here's how you'll get back at him. You was going to fight him clean, and he'd a most likely won. So that ain't the way to fight him. If you want to settle with him for poor Jeff, the way to do it is sail in with every foul that can get past Camp Mueller. And a hayload of em can get past that ivory mine. Foul him from the start with the murderingest set of fouls I've ever learned you. Cripple him so he'll be in the hospital for a year. Foul him into a dead one, and then punch his head off at him and win as early in the fight as you want to. Get the idea? Foul him to death if you like. It's no worse than he treated Jeff. The ring's the place to finish him. Not now, where you likely end up in the hooskow before you'd more than half hit him. Go to it. Dan grunted avid assent, and after breakfast, careful rehearsing of old foul tactics and a study of new ones began. As Dan Rourke, stripped and eager, sat in his hot dressing room under the auditorium that night, waiting for the summons to enter the ring, he had his first minute of solitary reflection throughout the whole Keegan-infested day. His manager was upstairs, wrangling with the carnival treasurer. Curly had gone to the ring to watch the wind-up of the second preliminary bout. Dan was alone. In his heart still raged black hate and a craving for revenge, and he was sick with grief over his chum's murder. While he sat there in the faint challenge bark of a dog, a collie perhaps, from nowhere in particular, drifted to him through the ill-boarded dressing-room walls. At the sound, Dan started violently. Jeff, he whispered under his breath. As if in answer to his call, the room all at once seemed a throb with the presence of his loved dog. In superstitious awe, Dan peered about him. Then he straightened his bent body, and to an unseen something he began to speak. We're going to pay up the bill in a few minutes now, Jeffy, he promised. Watch me. The foolish words started a new train of thoughts in the tormented brain. Watch him? The clean-fighting dog watch his master, put up the foulest fight of his career? With the vision came sharp revulsion. Watch me, Jeff, he repeated out loud. Watch me do it. Watch me do it square. Square, Jeffy boy. While the odd exultation was still upon him, Keegan and Curly came back to the dressing-room to escort him to the arena. The Pitvale Athletic Carnival crowd that night witnessed the bloodiest and most spectacularly ferocious battle in the annals of the local ring. From the sound of the gong, Dan Rourke was at his antagonist, forcing the fight at every point. Never once for the fraction of a second did he abandon the aggressive. Feltman showered upon him an avalanche of scientific punishment, but it failed to slow down the homicidal attack. To Red Keegan's goggle-eyed dismay, and despite his dumbfounded interround pleas, Rourke fought as clean as a Galahad. Not once would he make use of even the safest foul, not once would he seek to elude the dull referee by using the easiest of Keegan's carefully taught ruses. He fought like a wild beast, but he fought like a fair one. Buoyed by his insane hate for his enemy, and by his stark craving for vengeance, he was as a man in delirium. The hideous punishment meted out to him had no visible effect on his maniac strength or speed. His madness did not preclude the use of all the skill he could muster, but it made him impervious to pain and to shock. Round after round the fight slashed on, while the crowd screamed and pounded in delight, and while Red Keegan and Curly watched their madman with anguished eyes. Willing to take the heaviest blow, if only he might land his heaviest smash in return, Dan tore away at his foe. Four times he was knocked down, once he was unconscious for five seconds, but, borne ever onward by that wild urge of revenge, he came flying back to the combat with undiminished fury. Flesh and blood could not stand the fearful tax indefinitely. Through all his mania, Rourke began dimly to realize that there was a trifle less crushing vehemence in his own punches, and less whirlwind speed in his onslaught. With every atom of will and of rage and of resolve in his whole cosmos, he scourged himself to renewed effort. 
the welter of blows avalanched upon him unfelt over and over in his hot brain he was saying watch me do it jeff watch me do it square and he fought on as dan reeled back to his corner at the end of the hammer and tongs ninth round he heard as from miles off keegan's voice whispering to him try out the good old stunts danny tain't too late even yet he's groggy try him curly tells me he's making a joke of how he killed jeff says he kicked the poor pup yesterday too when he met him in the street he dan heard no more the minute's rest was over almost before it began his ears ringing with the tail of the kick he plunged back into the fight feltman met him mid-ring a horribly battered and staggering feltman who sought to improve on his minute's rest by feinting with the left and then aiming a great right swing for the head the swing did not land disregarding the feint rourke had bored in the swing passed beyond him while his two fists were greedily busy with infighting at his tired adversary's body across the ring and to the ropes with all his ebbing force he hammered feltman against the ropes he drove him then as feltman rebounded from the impact dan flung every remaining sinew of strength into a cross body right for the jaw it was a reckless blow except as a counter and feltman saw it coming in time but his worn-out guard would not obey the dazed brain's mandate quickly enough to block the mighty punch rourke's rage-driven right fist caught his opponent flush on the point of the chin and feltman sprawled prone on his face quietly non-dramatically he lay there dead to the world while the referee counted at the count of eight feltman tried instinctively to get up but he succeeded only in rolling over on his back cut to ribbons bleeding bruised aching and all but blinded dan rourke suffered the exultant keegan and bud to guide him down to his dressing room he had won he had thrashed the man who had poisoned jeff this much his dizzy senses told him but feltman was still alive and jeff was dead dan's heart was like cold lead beneath his bruised ribs his sensational victory was as ashes and dust to him he was deaf to keegan's hysterical adulation nothing mattered bud curly swung open the dressing-room door over the threshold swept a whirlwind of gold and white barking rapturously and flinging itself upon rourke's bleeding chest long afterward dan listened with a foolish grin on his swollen face while keegan confessed the truly keeganesque trick whereby he had sought to lure back his man to an acceptance of the sure-to-win foul tactics of the hiding of jeff in a neighbor's cellar for the day of the spiriting him into the dressing-room after the fight began of the coaching of curly into endorsing the tale of poison and of bud's part in the mock grave digging a digging timed nicely to coincide with dan's appearance on the porch all this much later but for the instant the only thing dan rourke knew was that his dead pet or its ghost it did not matter which had come back to him and that everything was once more tremendously worth while and that the world was a gorgeous place to do one's living in forgetful of hurts and of weakness he gathered the ecstatically squirming collie into his battered bare arms and babbled sobbingly i did it square jeff i did it square you you saw me do it square end of section seventeen Section 18 of Buff, a Collie, and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Buff, a Collie, and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. The Grudge, Part 1. This is the strange yarn of three dogs. If the dogs had been humans, the story would have been on stage and screen long ago. Frayne's Farms is the alliterative name for the hundred-acre tract of rich bottom land in the shadow of the Ramapo Mountains, a range that splits North Jersey's farm country for some twenty-odd miles. Back in these mountains are queer folk, whose exploits sometimes serve as a page story for some Sunday newspaper within forty miles of new york city as the crow flies the handful of mountaineers are well nigh as primitive as any south sea islanders they are a race apart and with their own barbarous codes and customs down from the mountains in the starvingly barren winter time every few years a band of huge black mongrel dogs used to swoop upon the valley harrying it from end to end in search of food 
and leaving a trail of ravaged hen roosts and sheep folds in their wake. These plunderers were half wild black dogs of the mountaineers, dogs blended originally from a tangle of diverse breeds, hound predominating, and with a splash of wolf blood in their rangy carcasses. When famine and cold gripped the folk of the mountains, the dogs were deprived of even such scanty crusts and bones as were their summer portion. And under the goad of hunger, the black brutes banded for a raid on the richer pickings of the valley. At such times, every able bodied farmer, from Trask Frayne to the members of the Italian garden truck colony up Suffern Way, would arm himself and join the hunt. Rounding up the horde of mongrels, they would shoot fast and unnearingly. Such few members of the pack as managed to break through the cordon and make a dash for the mountains were followed hotly up into the fastnesses of their gray rocks and were exterminated by trained huntsmen. The mountaineers were too shrewd to make any effort to protect their sheep slaying and chicken stealing pets from the hunters, much as they affected to despise the stolid toilers of the valley. Yet they had learned from more than one bitter and long bygone experience that the valley men were not safe to trifle with when once righteous indignation drove them to the warpath. For years after such a battle, the valley was wholly free from the marauding black dog pack. Not only did the dogs seem to shun, by experience, the peril of invading the lowlands, but their numbers were so depleted that there was more than enough food for all of the few survivors in the meager garbage of the mountain shacks. Not until numbers and forgetfulness again joined hands with famine did the pack renew its valley forays. When this story begins, a mere two years had passed since the latest of the mongrel hunts. Forty farmers and hired men, marshaled and led by young Trask Frayne, had rounded up not less than seventy-five of the great black raiders at the bank of the frozen little Ramapo River, which winds along at the base of the mountain wall, dividing the valley from the savage hinterland. The pack's depredations had beaten all records that season, and the farmers were grimly vengeful. Mercilessly they had poured volley after volley into the milling swarm of freebooters, led by a giant dog, ebony black, and with the forequarters of a timber wolf. The handful of remaining pillagers had burst through the cordon and crossed the river to the safety of the bleak hills. It was Trask Freen who guided the posse of trackers in pursuit. For the best part of two days the farmers kept up the hunt. An occasional far-off report of a shotgun would be wafted to the valley below, in token of some quarry trailed to within buckshot range. The gaunt black giant leading the pack seemed to be invulnerable. No less than five times during that two-day pursuit some farmer had caught momentary sight of him, only to miss aim by reason of the beast's uncanny craftiness and speed. Trask Frayne himself was able to take a hurried shot at the ebony creature as the fugitive slunk shadow-like between two hillock boulders. At the report of Trask's gun, the huge mongrel had whirled about, snarling and foaming at the mouth, and had snapped savagely at his own shoulder, where a single buckshot had just seared a jagged groove. But before Frayne could fire a second shot, the dog had vanished. Thus the hunt ended. Nearly all the black dogs of the mountaineers had met the death penalty. It was the most thorough and successful of the historic list of such battles. The raiders were practically exterminated. Many a year must pass before the pack could hope again to muster numbers for an invasion, and the valley breathed easier. Yet Trask Frayne was not content. He knew dog nature as it is given to few humans to know it, and he could not forget the wily black giant that had led the band of mongrels. The black was a super dog for cunning and strength and elusiveness. That had been proven by certain ultra-devastating features of the raid, as well as by his own escape from the hunters. And the black still lived, still lived and with no worse reminder of his flight than a bullet cut on one mighty shoulder. Such a dog was a menace, so long as he should continue alive. Wherefore Trask Frayne wanted to kick himself for his own ill luck in not killing him, and he was obsessed by a foreboding that the valley had not seen the last of the black, 
He could not explain this premonition. He could not explain it even to himself. For valley history showed that each battle served as a wholesome lesson to the black dogs for years thereafter. Never between forays was one of them seen on the hither side of the Ramapo. And yet the idea would not get out of Frayne's head. Trask had hated the necessary job of destroying the mongrels, for he loved dogs. Nothing short of stark need would have lured him into shooting one of them. His own two thoroughbred collies, Tam O'Shanter and Wisp, were honored members of the Frayne household. Dogs of the same breed differ as much in character as do humans of the same race. For example, no two humans could have been more widely divergent in nature than were these two collies of Trask's. Tam O'Shanter was deep-chested, mighty of coat, tawny, and befitted the son of his illustrious sire, old Sunnybank Lad. Iron firm of purpose and staunchly loyal to his master, Tam was as steady of soul as a rock, whether guarding the farm buildings or rounding up a bunch of scattered sheep that had broken bounds, he was calmly reliable. He adored Trask Frayne with a worship that was none the less all-absorbing because it was so undemonstrative. And he cared for nothing and nobody else on earth except Wisp. Wisp had been the runt of a thoroughbred litter. He was slender and fragile and wholly lovable, a dainty little tricolor, scarce forty pounds in weight, not strong enough for heavy work, yet Wisp was a gallant guard and a gaily affectionate house-dog, the cherished pet and playfellow of the three frame babies. Also he was Tam's dearest friend. The larger collie from puppyhood had established a protection over Wisp, ever conceding to him the warmest corner of the winter hearth, the shadiest spot in the dooryard in summer, the best morsels of their joint daily meal. He would descend from his calm loftiness to romp with the frolicsome wisp, though the sight of stately Tam trying to romp was somehow suggestive of Marshal Joffrey playing pat-a-cake. In short, he loved Wisp, as he loved not even Trask Frayne. More than once in the village, when a stray cur misunderstood Wisp's gay friendliness and showed his teeth at the frail little dog, Tam so far departed from his wonted noble dignity as to hurl himself upon the aggressor and thrash the luckless canine into howling submission. He was Wisp's guardian as well as his dearest comrade. Once in a very great while such inseparable friendships spring up between two collies. One morning in June Trask set forth for Suffern with a flock of sixty sheep. The day was hot, and the journey promised to be tiresome. So when the two collies had worked the sixty out from the rest of the frame bunch of sheep, and had started them bleeding and milling toward the high road, Trask whistled Wisp back to him. Home, boy, he ordered, patting the friendly uplifted head and playfully rumpling the collie's silken ears. Back home and take care of things there today. It's a long, hot trip for a pup that hasn't any more stamina than you have, Wispy. Tam and I can handle them all right. Chase back home. The soft brown eyes of the collie filled with infinitely pathetic pleading. Wisp understood the meaning of his master's words, as well as might any of the Frayne children. From birth he had been talked to, and his quick brain had responded as does every clever collie's. Wisp knew that he'd been bidden to stay at home from this delightful outing, and every inch of his body, as well as his eloquent eyes, cried aloud in appeal to be taken along. Yet when once more Frayne petted his head and pointed towards the dooryard, the good little chap turned obediently back. As he passed Tam, the two dogs touched noses, as if exchanging speech of some sort, as perhaps they were. Then, disconsolately, Wisp trotted to the house and curled up on the doormat in a small and furry and miserably unhappy heap. There he was still lying, his sorrowful eyes fixed on his master and on his busily herding chum, as the huddle of sheep were guided out of the gateway into the high road beyond. Glancing back, Frayne smiled encouragingly at the pathetic little waiting figure at the door. Tam, too, paused as he maneuvered the last silly sheep into the high road and stood beside Frayne for a second, peering back at his chum. Under their momentary glance, 
Wisp made shift to wag his plummy tail once by way of affectionate farewell. Long afterward, Trask Frayne could summon up memory of the daintily graceful little dog, lying so obediently on the doormat, and wagging such a brave goodbye to the master, who had just deprived him of a jolly day's outing. Possibly the picture remained in Tam O'Shander's memory, too. It is to be hoped so, for never again were Frayne or Tam to see their lovable little collie chum. Dusk was sifting down the valley from beyond the mountain wall that afternoon when Trask Frayne turned once more into the gateway leading to his farm. At his side trotted Tam. It had been a hard day, both for dog and man. At best it is no light task to marshal a flock of sixty bolting sheep along miles of winding road. But when that road is infested with terrifying motor cars, and when it goes past two or three blast-emitting stone quarries and a railway, the labor is spectacular in spots, and arduous at all times. But at last, thanks to Tam, the sheep had reached Suffern without a single mishap, and had been driven skillfully into the herd pens. The seven-mile homeward tramp had been, by contrast, a mere pleasure stroll, and yet both the collie and his master were glad of the prospect of rest and of supper. Frayne, reviewing the labor of the day, was pleased with his own foresight in making Wisp stay at home. He knew such an ordeal in such weather would have tired the delicate collie half to death. Coming up the dusky lane from the house to meet the returning wanderers was a slender, white-clad woman. As he saw her, Frayne waved his hat and hurried forward at new speed. Thus always, after one of his few absences from home, his pretty young wife came up the lane to welcome him, and, as ever, the sight of her made him forget his fatigue. Yet now, after that first glance, worry took the place of eagerness in Frayne's mind, for his wife was advancing slowly and spiritlessly, and not in the very least with her wonted springy walk. The heat's been too much for her, he muttered worriedly to Tam. It's been a broiling day. She ought to have. But Tam was no longer beside him. The big collie had started ahead toward the oncoming woman. Usually, when Mildred Frayne came thus to greet her returning husband, Wisp was with her. The little dog would bound ahead of his mistress as Frayne appeared and come galloping merrily up to him and Tam. Tam, too, always cantered forward to touch noses with his chum. But by this evening's dim light, Frayne could not see Wisp, nor did Tam rush forward as usual. Instead, he was pacing slowly toward Mildred, with his head and tail a-droop. As Tam had turned in at the gate beside his master, the collie had come to a convulsive halt. His nostrils had gone upward, in a series of eagerly suspicious sniffs. Then his shaggy body had quivered all over, as with a spasm of physical pain. At that moment, Mildred's white-clad figure had caught his wandering eye and he had moved forward, downcast and trembling, to meet her. It was Tam, long before Trask, who discovered that Mildred was weeping, and this phenomena, for the instant, turned his attention from his vain search for Wisp and from the confusingly menacing sense which had just assailed his nostrils. Departing from his lifelong calm, the big dog whined softly as he came up with Mildred, and he thrust his cold muzzle sympathizingly into her loose hanging hand. Within him stirred all his splendor race's pitiful yearning to comfort a human in grief. So poignant was this craving that it almost made him forget the increasingly keen sense which had put him on his guard when he came in through the gateway. Hello, called Trask cheerily as he neared his wife. Tired, dear? You shouldn't have bothered to walk all this way out to meet me. After a rotten day like this, you ought to be resting. Where's Wisp? Is he disciplining me for making him stay home? I... Then he too saw Mildred was crying. And before he could speak again, she had thrown her arms around his neck and was sobbing out an incoherent story, broken by an occasional involuntary shiver. Holding her close to him and asking eagerly futile questions, Trask Frayne, bit by bit, drew forth the reason for her grief. Harry and Janet, the two older children, had gone down to the river that noon to fish off the dock for perch. Mildred, at an upper window where she was sewing, had watched them from time to time, for the river was high and rapid from recent rains. But Wisp was with them, 
and she had experience in the little collie's sleepless care over the youngsters. More than once indoors, Wisp had thrust his own slight body between a frayed child and the fire. Again and again at the dock, he had interposed his puny bulk and had shoved with all his force when one or another of the babies ventured too close to the edge. Today, as she looked up from her sewing, she had seen the trio leave the dock and start homeward. Janet had been in the lead, swinging the string of perch and sunfish and shiners they had caught. They had skirted a riverside thicket on their way to the home path. Out from the bushes had sprung a gigantic lean dog, jet black, except for a zigzag patch of white on one shoulder. The wind had been strong in the other direction, so no scent of the dog had reached Wisp, who was dawdling along a bit to the rear of the children. The black had made a lightning grab at the carelessly swung string of fish, and had snatched them away from Janet. As he turned to bolt back into the thicket with his stolen feast, Harry had caught up a stick and had charged in pursuit of the string of laboriously caught fish. The child had brought his stick down with a resounding thwack on the head of the escaping beast. The blow must have stung, for instantly the black dropped the fish and leaped upon the tiny chap, all this in a single second or less. But before the mongrel's teeth could reach their mark, Wisp had flashed past the two startled children and had launched his weak body straight at the black's throat. Down went the two dogs in a tearing, snarling heap. Mildred, realizing how hopelessly unequal was the contest, had run to the aid of her beloved Wisp. Fleeing downstairs, she had snatched Trask's gun from its peg above the mantel, had seized at random a handful of shells, and ran out of the house and towards the river, loading the gun as she went. By the time she came in sight, the black had already recovered the advantage he had lost by Wisp's unexpected spring. By dint of strength and of weight, he had torn himself free of Wisp's weak grip, had flung the lighter dog to earth, and had pinned him there. Right gallantly did little Wisp battle in the vice-like grasp of the giant. Fiercely he strove to bite at the rending jaws, and to rip free from the crushing weight above him. But as ever, mere courage could not atone for dearth of brute strength and ferocity. Undeterred by his foe's puny efforts, or by the fusillade of blows from Harry's stick and from Janet's pudgy fists, the black had slung Wisp to one side, and had lunged once more at him. This time he found the mark he sought the back of the neck, just below the base of the brain. He threw all his vast jaw power into one terrific bite, and little Wisp's frantic struggles ceased. The valiant collie lay inert and moveless, his neck broken. Maddened by conquest, the black tossed the lifeless body in the air. It came to ground on the edge of the river. There, from the momentum of the toss, it had rebounded into the water. The swift current had caught it and borne it downstream. Then, for the first time, the black seemed to realize that both frantically screaming children were showering futile blows on him, and with a snarl he turned on Harry. But as he did so, Mildred's flying feet brought her within range. Halting, she raised the gun and fired. She was a good shot, and excitement had not robbed her aim of steadiness, but excitement had made her catch up a handful of cartridges loaded lightly with number eight shot, instead of anything more deadly. The small pellets buzzed hornet-like about the black's head and shoulders, several of them stinging hotly, but at that distance the birdshot could do no lasting damage, nor did any of it chance to reach one of his eyes. With a yell of pain he wheeled to face the woman, and she let him have the second barrel. Memories of former clashes with gunners seemed to wake in the brute's crafty brain. Snarling, snapping, shaking his tormented head, he turned and plunged into the narrow river, gaining the farther bank and diving into the waterside bushes before Mildred could think to reload. The balance of the day had been spent in a vain search of the bank downstream for Wisp's lost body, and in trying to comfort the heartbroken children. Not until she had gotten the babies to bed and had soothed them to sleep, did Mildred have scope to think of her own grief in the loss of the gentle dog who had been so dear to her? He, he gave his life for them, she finished her sobbing recital. He knew, he must have known, that he had no chance against that horrible monster. And Wisp had never fought, you know, from the day he was born. He knew that brute would kill him, and he never hesitated at all. He gave his life for the children. 
and and we can't can't even say a prayer over his grave the trask frayne just then was not thinking of prayers deep down in his throat he was cursing softly but with much venom and the nails of his hard clenched fists bit deep into his palms black with a white scar on the shoulder he said at last his own harsh voice not unlike a dog's growl hound ears and the build of a timber wolf almost as big as a dane and bone thin hmm. that's my buckshot scar on his shoulder that zigzag white mark tomorrow morning i'm going hunting up in the mountains want to come along tam but as before tam was not there when his master turned to speak to him the collie had waited only long enough to note that the task of comforting the weeping mildred had been taken over by more expert powers than his then he had trotted off towards the house not only to solve the problem of those sinister scents which hung so heavy on the moist night air but to find his strangely absent chum wisp circling the house he caught wisp's trail it was some hours old but by no means too cold to be followed by a collie whose scenting powers had once tracked the lost sheep for five miles through a blizzard with wisp's trail was mingled that of two of the children and it led to the river path true there were other trails of wisps that the sensitive nostrils caught but all of them were older than this which led to the water therefore as any tracking dog would have known wisp had gone riverward since he had been near the house and down the path nose to ground followed tam o' shanter he did not move with his wonted stolidity for over and above the mere trail scent his nostrils were assailed by other and more distressingly foreboding smells the smells he had caught as he had entered the gate the smells which grew ranker at every loping step he took in half a minute he was at the bank and before that time he had abandoned the nose to earth tracking for now all around him was that terrible scent back and forth dashed and circled and doubled tam and every evolution told him more of the gruesome story here among the bushes had lain a strange animal an unwashen and pungent and huge animal apparently sleeping after a gorge of chicken or lamb here along the path had come the children with wisp behind them here the strange dog had leaped forth and here alongside that string of forgotten and sun-blown fish on the ground wisp and the stranger had clashed the dullest of sense could have told the story from that point the trampled earth the spatters of dried blood the indentation in the grass where wisp's writhing body had striven so heroically to free itself from the crushing weight above it and to renew the hopeless battle wisp was dead he was slain by that huge and rank scented creature his body had touched the river brink fully five feet from the scene of the fight after that it had disappeared for running water will not hold a scent yes wisp was dead he had been murdered he had been murdered this adored chum of his by the great beast whose scent was already graven so indelibly on tam's heartsick memory there at the river edge a few minutes later trask frayne found tam o shanter padding restlessly about from spot to spot of the tragedy whimpering under his breath but the whimper carried no hint of pathos rather was it the expression of a wrath that lay too deep for mere growling at his master's touch the great collie started nervously and shrunk away from the caress he had always craved and his furtively swift motion in eluding the loved hand savored far more of the wolf than of the trained house dog the collie in look and in action had reverted to the wild tam trotted for the tenth time to the spot at the river shore where the black had bounded into the water impatiently always with that queer little throaty whimper he cast up and down along the bank in quest of some place where wisp's slayer might perhaps have doubled back to land end of section eighteen section nineteen of buff a collie and other dog stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Buff, a Collie and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. The Grudge, Part Two. Presently, Trask called to him. For the first time in his blameless life, Tam hesitated before obeying. He was standing hock deep in the swirling water, sniffing the air and peering through the dusk along the wooded banks on the far side of the stream. Again and more imperatively, Frayne called him. With visible distaste, the collie turned and made his way back towards his master. Frayne had finished his own fruitless investigations and was starting homeward. Halfway to the house, he paused and looked back. Tam had ceased to follow him and was staring once more at the patches of trampled and dyed earth. A third and sharper call from Trask brought the collie to heel. "'I don't blame you, old boy,' said Frayne, as they made their way towards the lighted kitchen. "'But you can't find him that way. Tomorrow you and I are going to take a little trip through the mountains. I'd rather have your help on a hunt like that than any hounds. You won't forget his scent in a hurry, and you know as well as I what he's done.' On the way to the house, Frayne paused at the sheepfold and made a careful detour of it. But the inspection satisfied him at the fence built long ago with special regard to the mountain pack's forays was still too stout to permit of any dogs breaking through it. And he passed on to the house, again having to summon the newly furtive collie from an attempt to go back to the river. He won't pay us another visit tonight, Tam. He told the sullen dog as they went indoors he's tricky and if he's really on the rampage here in the valley he'll strike next in some place miles away from here wait till tomorrow but once more tam did not follow his overlord's bidding for at dawn on the morrow when trask came out of the house shotgun in hand the dog was nowhere to be found never before had tam forsaken his duties as guardian of the farm to wander afield without Frayne. The jingle of the telephone brought Trask back into the house. On the other end of the wire was an irate farmer. I'm sending word all along the line, came his message. Last night a dog bust into my hencoop and killed every last one of my prize Hamburgs and fifty-three other chickens besides. He worked as quiet as a fox. Twas until I heard a chicken squawk that I came out. And that must have been the last of the lot and the dog had got careless I had just a glimpse of him as he sneaked off in the dark Great big cuss he was as big as a house Looked something like a wolf by that bum light and something like a collie too Last evening I got news that Grice up Suffern way lost a lamb night before from some prowling dog Do you suppose the dogs from the mountains is loose again? One of them is returned Frayne I'm going after him now. He hung up the receiver and gun under arm, made his way to the scow lying at the side of the dock. Crossing the river, he explored the bank for half a mile in both directions, failing to find sign or trail of the black. He struck into the mountains. It was late that night when Trask slouched wearily into his own house and laid aside his gun. Any trace of him? asked Mildred eagerly. Not a trace, answered Frayne. I quartered the range farther back than we ever hunted before, and I asked a lot of questions at that godforsaken mountaineer settlement up there, and that's all the good it did. I might hunt for a year and not get any track of the beast. Those mountaineers are all liars, of course. Not one of them would admit they ever seen or heard of the dog. If I'd had Tam with me, he might have caught the trail. Tomorrow I'll see he goes along. He— Tam repeated Mildred in surprise why wasn't he with you he hasn't been home all day he hasn't been home do you mean to say he didn't come back no said his wife worriedly when I got up this morning and found you both gone I thought of course you'd taken him along as you said you were going to didn't he wasn't anywhere around when I started replied Frayne he's he's never been away for a whole day or even for a whole hour before I wonder Oh, do you suppose that horrible brute has killed Tam, too? quavered Mildred, in new terror. Not he, Trask reassured her. Not he or any other mortal dog. But, he hesitated, then went on shamefacedly, But I'll tell you what I do think. I believe Tam has gone hunting on his own account. 
I believe he's trailing that mongrel. If he is, he has a man-sized job cut out for him, for the black is as tricky as a weasel. Tam thought more of Wisp than he thought of anything else, and he was like another animal when he found what had happened down yonder. Take my word for it, he's after the dog that murdered his chum. Whether he'll ever get him is another matter, but if he's really after him, he'll never give up the hunt as long as he has a breath of life left in him. Either he'll overhaul the cur or... Well, either that or we'll never see him again. There's no sense in my poking around in the mountains without him. All we can do is wait. That and try to find Tam and chain him up until he forgets this crazy revenge idea. But even though the friends did not see their cherished collie when they arose next morning, they did not lack for news of him. In the middle of a silent and doleful breakfast, a telephone ring summoned Trask from the table. That you, Frayne? queried a truculent voice. This is Tripler, at Darlington. I got rotten news for you, but it's a whole lot rottener for me. Last night my cow yard was raided by a dog. He killed two of the month-old Jersey calves and pretty near ripped the throat out of one of my yearlings. I heard the racket, and I ran out with my gun and a flashlight. The cow yard looked like a battlefield. That dog had skipped. Couldn't see a sign of him anywheres. But about a half hour later he came back. He came back while I was redding up the yard and trying to quiet the scared critters. He came right to the cow yard gate and stood sniffing there bold as brass, like he was trying to catch the scent of more of my stock to kill. I heard his feet a pattering, and I turned the flashlight on him. He was your dog, Frayne, that big dark colored collie dog of yours. I saw him as plain as day. I up with my gun and I let him have it, for I was pretty sore. But I must have missed him clean, for there wasn't any blood near his footprints in the mud when I looked. He just lit out. But I'm calling up to tell you you'll have a big bill to pay on this, and— Hold on, interrupted Frayne quietly. I'll be up there in twenty minutes. Goodbye. As fast as his car could carry him, Trask made his way up the valley to Darlington, and then to the Tripler farm. There an irately unloving host awaited him. Before you go telling me the whole story all over again, Trask broke in on an explosive recital, take me over to the exact spot where you saw Tam standing and sniffing. The ground all around here is soaked from the shower we had last evening. I want to see the tracks you were speaking of. Muttering dire threats and whining lamentations for his lost calves, Tripler led the way to the cow yard, pointing presently to a gap in the privet hedge which shut off the barns from the truck garden. Frayne went over to the gap and proceeded to inspect the muddy earth inch by inch. It was here Tam stood when you turned the light on him, he asked. Right just there, declared Tripler, and I can swear to him he— Come over here, invited Trask. There are his footprints, as you said, and I'd know them anywhere. There's no other dog of his size with such tiny feet. He gets them from his sire, Sunnybank Lad. Those are Tam's footprints, I admit that. I'd know them anywhere, even if they didn't show the gash in the outer pad of his left forefoot where he gouged himself on Bob Wire when he was a pup. You admit it was him, then, orated Tripler. That's all I need to hear you say. Now how much— No, no, gently denied Frayne. It isn't anywhere near all you need to hear. Now let's go back into the cow yard as I crossed it just now. I saw dozens of dog footprints among the hoof marks of the calves. Let's take another look at them. Grumblingly, yet eager to add this corroboratory evidence, Tripler followed him to the wallow of churned mud which marked the scene of slaughter. At the first clearly defined set of footprints, Trask halted. Take a good look at these, he adjured. Study them carefully. Here, these, for instance, where the dog planted all fours firmly for a spring. They're the marks of splay feet a third larger than Tam's, and not one of them has a gash in the pad. The one I pointed out to you back at the gap, look for yourself. Nonsense, fumed Tripler, albeit a shade uneasily as he stood up stiffly after a peering study of the prints. Anyhow, he went on, all this proves is that there was two of them. This big splay-footed cuss and your collie, they was working in couples like killers often does. Were they? Frayne caught him up. Were they? Then suppose you look carefully all through this welter of cow-yard mud, and see if you can find a single footprint of tarns, and while you're looking, let me tell you something. 
As Tripler went over the yard's mud with gimlet eyes, Trask related the story of Wisp's killing and his own theory as to Tam. He's trailing that black dog, he finished. He struck his scent somewhere and followed him. He got here a half hour too late, and then when you fired at him, he run off to pick up the trail again. But I doubt if he got it, for the black would probably be cunning enough to take to the river after a raid like this. He'd have sense enough to know somebody would track him. That brute has true wolf cunning. Maybe, maybe you're right, hesitated Tripler after a minute's search of the yard had failed to reveal a footprint corresponding with Tam's. And the county's got to pay for any damage done to stock by an unknown dog. That's the law. I'm kind of glad, too. You see, I like old Tam. Besides, I can collect more damages from the county than I could collect a lawsuit with a neighbor. What'll we do now? Fix up a posse like we did the other times? No, replied Trask. It would do no good. The black is too clever. And in summer there are too many ways to throw off the scent. Tam will get him, if anyone can. Let's leave it to him. But other farmers were not so well content to leave the punishment of the mysterious raider to Tam. As the days went on, there were more and more tidings of the killer. Up and down the valley he worked, never twice in succession in the same vicinity. Twice an hour or so after his visits, men saw Tam prowling along the mongrel's cooling tracks. They reported to Frayne that the collie had grown lean and gaunt, and that his beautiful coat was one mass of briar and burr, and that he had slunk away wolf-fashion when they called to him. Frayne himself caught no slightest sight of his beloved dog, though occasionally in the mornings he found empty the dish of food he had set out on the previous night. Trask was working out the problem for himself nowadays, deaf to all requests that he head another band of hunters into the mountains. He was getting no sleep to speak of, but he was thrilling with the suspense of what sportsmen know as the still hunt. Every evening, when his chores and supper were finished, Frayne went to the sheepfold and led thence a fat wether that had a real genius for loud bleeding. This vocal sheep he would tether to a stake near the river bank. Then he himself would study the trend of the faint evening breeze and would take up a position in the bushes somewhere to leeward of the sheep. There, gun across knees, he would sit until early daylight. Sometimes he dozed. Oftener he crouched, tense and wakeful, in his covert, straining his eyes through the gloom for the hoped-for sight of a slinking black shadow creeping towards the decoy. Not alone to avenge the death of Wisp, and to rid the valley of a scourge did he spend his nights in this way. He knew Tam, as only a born dogman can know his dog. He missed the collie keenly, and he had solid faith that on the death of the black the miserable quest would end, and Tam would return to his old home and to his old habits. So night after night, Frayne would keep his vigil. Morning after morning he would plod home, there to hear a telephone tale of the black's depredations at some other point of the valley. At first his nightly watch was kept in dense darkness, but soon the waxing moon lightened the river bank and made the first hours of the sentry duty easier. Frayne began to lose faith in his own scheme. He had an odd feeling that the black somehow knew of his presence in the thicket, and that Frayne's farms was left unvisited for that reason. Trask's immunity from the black's depredations was the theme of much neighborhood talk as time went on. Once more was revived Tripler's theory that Tam and the black were hunting in couples, and that the collie, like so many dogs which have gone bad, was sparing his late master's property. On all these unpleasant themes, Trask Frayne was brooding. One night, late in the month, as he sat in uncomfortable stillness amid the bushes and stared glumly out at the occasionally bleeding weather. He had had a hard day, and the weeks of semi-sleeplessness were beginning to tell cruelly on him. His senses had taken to tricking him of late. For instance, at one moment this night, he was crouching there, waiting patiently for the full moon to rise above the eastern hills to brighten his vigil. The next moment, though he was certain he had not closed his eyes, the moon had risen, and was riding high in the clear heavens. Frayne started a little and blinked. As he did so, his disturbed mind told him he had not awakened naturally, but that he had been disturbed by some sound. 
He shifted his drowsy gaze towards the tethered sheep, and at once all slumber was wiped from his brain. The weather was lying sprawled on the ground in a posture that nature neither intends nor permits. Its upflung legs were still jerking convulsively like galvanized stilts, and above it was bending a huge dark shape. The moon beat down mercilessly on the tableau of the slain sheep and of the black with his fangs buried deep in the twisting throat. Now that the longed-for moment had at last come, Trask found himself seized by an unaccountable numbness of mind and of body. By a mighty effort he regained control of his faculties. Slowly and in utter silence he lifted the cocked gun from his knees and put its butt to the hollow of his shoulder. The black looked up in quick suspicion from his meal. Even in the excitement of the instant, Frayne found scope to wonder at the brute's ability to hear so noiseless a motion and his sleep-numbed fingers sought the trigger. Then in a flash he knew why the black's great head had lurched so suddenly up from the interrupted meal. From out a clump of alder, twenty feet to shoreward of the river-bank orgy, whirled a tawny shape. With the speed of a flung spear it sped straight for the feasting mongrel, and in the mere breath of time it took to dash through the intervening patch of moonlight, Frayne recognized the newcomer. The black sprang up from beside the dead sheep, and faced the foe he could no longer elude. Barely had he gained his feet when Tam was upon him. Yet the mongrel was not taken unaware. His crafty brain was alert, and the master of his sinewy body. As Tam leaped, the black dog reared to meet him, and then in practically the same gesture, the black shifted his direction and dived beneath the charging collie, lunging for the latter's unprotected stomach. It was a maneuver worthy of a wolf, and one against which the average dog must have been helpless. But the black's opponent was a collie, and in the back of his brain, though never in his chivalric heart, a collie is forever reverting to his own wolf ancestors. Thus as the black changed the course of his lunge, Tam in mid-air changed his, by a violent twist of every whalebone muscle, Tam whirled himself sidewise, and the black's ravening jaws closed on nothing. In another instant, even before he had touched ground, Tam had slashed with his curving eye-teeth. This is another trick known to practically no animal save the wolf and the wolf's direct descendant, the collie. The razor-like teeth cut the black's left ear and cheek as cleanly as might a blade. But in the same motion, the black's flying head had veered, and his jaws had found a hold above Tam's jugular. Again, with a normal dog, such a hold might well have ended the fight. But the providence which ordained that a collie should guard sheep on icy highland moors also gave him an unbelievably thick coat to fend off the weather. And this coat serves as an almost invulnerable armor, especially at the side of the throat. The black's teeth closed upon a quantity of tangled fur, but only on the merest patch of skin, and on none of the underflesh at all. Tam ripped himself free, leaving a double handful of rough between the black's grinding jaws. As the mongrel spat out the encumbering gag of fur, Tam's curved fang laid bare the scarred shoulder once grazed by Trask Frayne's buckshot, and in a rolling, fighting heap the two enemies rolled over and over together on the dew-drenched grass. Frayne's gun was leveled, but the man did not dare fire. By that deceptive light he had no assurance of hitting one dog without also killing the other, and chafing at his own impotence, he stood stock-still, watching the battle. Both dogs were on their feet again, rearing and rending in mute fury. No sound issued from the back-curled lips of either. This was no mere dog-fight. As noisy as it was pugnacious, it was a struggle to the death, and the dogs realized it. Thrice more the black struck for the jugular. Twice, thanks to Tam's lightning quickness, he scored a clean miss. The third time he annexed only another handful of hair. With his slashes he was luckier. One of Tam's forelegs was bleeding freely, so was a cut on his stomach where the black had sought to disembowel him, and one side of his muzzle was laid open, but the collie had given over such mere fencing tactics as slashing. He was tearing into his powerful and wily foe with all the concentrated fury of his month's vain pursuit of vengeance. The black dived for the collie's forelegs, seeking to crack their bones in his mighty jaws and thus render his foe helpless. Nimbly, Tam's tiny white forefeet whisked away from the peril of each dive, 
In redoubled fury he drove for the throat, and the two clashed shoulder to shoulder. Then amid the welter came the final phase of the fight. The black, as the two reared, lunged again for the collie's hurt throat. Tam jerked his head and neck aside to avoid the grip, and as once before the black changed the direction of his lunge, with the swiftness of a striking snake he made the change, and before the other could thwart or so much as divine his purpose, he had secured the coveted hold far up on Tam's left foreleg. No mere snap or slash this, but a death grip. The black's teeth sank deep into the captured leg, grinding with a force which presently must snap the bones of the upper leg and leave the collie crippled against a practically uninjured and terrible antagonist. The rest would be slaughter. Tam knew his own mortal peril. He knew it even before Trask Frayne came rushing out from his watching place, brandishing the gun club fashion. The collie did not try to wrench free, and thereby to hurry the process of breaking his leg, or of tearing out of the shoulder muscles. He thought as quickly as the mongrel had lunged. Rearing his head aloft, he drove down at the black. The latter was clinging with all his might to the collie's foreleg, and in the rapture of having gained at last a disabling grip, he ignored the fact that he had left an opening in his own defense, an opening seldom sought in a fight, except by a wolf or a wolf's descendant. It was for this opening that Tam O'Shanter struck. In a trice his white teeth had buried themselves in the exposed nape of the black's neck. Here at the brain's base lies the spinal cord, dangerously within reach of long and hard-driven fangs, and here Tam had fastened himself. An instant later, but an instant too late, the black knew his peril. Releasing his grip on the collie's leg, before the bone had begun to yield, he threw his great body madly from side to side, fighting crazily to shake off the death hold. With all his mighty strength, he thrashed about. Twice he lifted the seventy-pound collie clean off the ground. Once he fell with Tam under him. But the collie held on. Tam did more than hold on. Exerting every remaining atom of his waning power, he let his body be flung here and there in the black struggles, and he concentrated his force upon cleaving deeper and deeper into the neck nape. This was the grip whereby the black a month agone had crushed the life out of friendly little Wisp. And by chance or by fate, Tam had been enabled to gain the same hold. Spasmodically, he set his fangs in a vice-like tightening of his grip. At one instant, the black was whirling and writhing in the fullness of his wiry might. At the next, with a sickening snapping sound, his giant body went limp, and his forequarters hung a lifeless weight from his conqueror's jaws. Tam relaxed his hold. The big black's body slumped to earth and lay there. The collie panting and swaying stood over his dead enemy the bitterly long quest was ended heavenward went his bleeding muzzle and he waked the solemn stillnesses of the summer night with an eerie wolf howl the awesome primal yell of victory for a few seconds trask frayne unnoticed stared at his dog and as he looked it seemed to him that he could see the collie change gradually back from a wild thing of the forests to the staunch and adoring watchdog of other days. Then the man spoke. Tam, he said quietly. Tam, old friend. The exhausted victor lurched dizzily about at sound of the voice. Catching sight of Trask, he trembled all over. He took a dazed step towards Frayne. Then, with something queerly like a human sob, the collie sprang forward and gambled weakly about the man, licking Trask's feet and hands, springing up in a groggy effort to kiss his face, patting his master's chest with eager forepaws, crying aloud in an ecstasy of joy at the reunion. Then, all at once, he seemed to remember he was a staid and dignified middle-aged dog and not a hoodlum puppy. Ceasing his unheard of demonstrations, he stood close beside Frayne, looking up into Trask's eyes in silent worship. "'You've done a grand night's work, Tam,' said Frayne, seeking to steady his own voice. "'And your hurts need bathing. Come home.' His plumed tail proudly wagging, his splendid head aloft, Tam O'Shanter turned and led the way to the house he loved. 
End of section 19. Section 20 of Buff, A Collie and Other Dog Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Dore. Buff, A Collie and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune. The Sunnybank Collies. Here at Sunnybank, at Pompton Lakes in New Jersey, we raise thoroughbred collies. For many years we have been breeding them. For many years longer I have been studying them. The more I study them, the more I realize that there is something about a collie, a mysterious, elusive something that makes him different from any other dog, something nearer human than beast. And for all that, he is 100% dog. There is much to learn from him, much to puzzle over, as perhaps the following discursive yarns about a few members of the long line of Sunnybank Collies may show. Greatest of them all was Lad. One would soon have thought of teaching nursery rhymes to Emerson as of teaching Lad tricks. Beyond the common babyhood lessons of obedience and of the place's simple law, he went untaught. And he taught himself, being that type of dog. For example, the mistress had been dangerously ill with pneumonia. In my book, Lad, a Dog, I tell how Laddie kept vigil outside her door, day and night, until she was out of danger, and how he celebrated her convalescence with a brainstorm which would have disgraced a three-month's puppy. Well, on the first day she was able to be carried out of doors, the mistress lay in a veranda hammock, with Lad on the porch floor at her side. Friends, several installments of them, drove to the place to congratulate the mistress on her recovery, and to bring gifts of flowers, fruit, jellies, books. All morning Lad lay there, watching the various relays of guests and eyeing the presents they laid in her lap. After the fifth group of callers had gone, the big collie got up and trotted off into the forest. For nearly an hour he was absent. Then he came back, traveling with difficulty by reason of the heavy burden he bore. Somewhere, far away in the woods, he had found or revisited the carcass of a dead horse, of an excessively dead horse. From it he had wrenched two ribs and some of the vertebrae. Dragging this horrible gift along, he returned to the veranda, before any of us were well aware of his presence, the wind setting in the other direction. He had mounted the steps, and with one mighty heave, had lifted the ribs and vertebrae over the hammock edge and laid them in the lap of his dismayed mistress. Humans had celebrated her recovery with presents, and he, watching, had imitated them. He had gone far and had toiled hard to bring her an offering that his canine mind deemed all desirable. It was carrion, but it represented to a dog everything that a present should be. Dogs do not eat carrion. They merely rub their shoulders in it, on the same principle that women use perfumes. It is a purely aesthetic pleasure to them, and carrion is probably no more malodorous to a human being than is the reek of tobacco or of whiskey or even of some fifteen-dollar-an-ounce scent to a dog. It is all a matter of taste and education. Noting that his gift awoke no joy whatever in its recipient's heart, Lad was monstrous crestfallen. Nor from that day on did he ever bring Carrie into the place. He even abstained henceforth from rubbing his shoulders in it. Evidently, he gathered from our reception of his present, that it is not done. When Lad was training his little son Wolf to become a decent canine citizen, he was much annoyed by the puppy's trick of watching his sire bury bones and then of exhuming and gnawing them himself. Lad did not punish the puppy for this. He adopted a shrewder and surer way of saving his buried treasures from theft. Thereafter he would bury the choice bone deeper in the ground than had been his habit, and directly above it, just below the surface of the earth, he would inter a second and older bone, a bone that had long been denuded of all meat and was of no further value to any dog. Wolf, galloping eagerly up to the spot of burial, as soon as Lad moved away, would dig where his father had dug. Presently he would unearth the topmost and worthless bone. Satisfied that he had exhausted the possibilities of the cache, he dug no deeper, but left the new and toothsome bone undiscovered. By the way, did it ever occur to you that a dog is almost the only animal to bury food? And did you ever stop to think why? The reason is simple. Dogs, alone of all wild animals, dogs and their blood brethren, the wolves, 
used to hunt in packs. All other beasts hunted alone, or at most in pairs. When prey was slain, the dog that did not bolt his food with all possible haste was the dog that got the smallest share or none at all. When there was more food than could be devoured at one meal, he had the sense to lay up provision for the next day's dinner. He knew if he left the carcass lying where it was, it would be devoured by the rest of the hungry pack, so he buried as much of it as he could, to prevent his brethren from finding and eating it. Thus the dog, alone of all quadrupeds, still bolts his food in huge and half-chewed mouthfuls, and the dog buries food for future use. These two traits are as purely ancestral as is the dog's habit of turning around several times before settling himself to sleep for the night. His wild ancestors did that to crush the stiff grasses and reeds into a softer bed, and to scare therefrom any lurking snakes or scorpions. Lad's talking was a byword at Sunnybank. Only to the mistress and myself would he dine to speak, but to us he would sometimes talk for five minutes at a time. Of course, there were no actual words in his speech, but no words were needed to show his meaning. His conversation used to run the full gamut of sounds, in a way that was as eerie as it was laughable. He could and did express every shade of meaning he chose to. Indignation or disgust was voiced in fierce grumbles and mutters that were run together in sentence lengths. Sympathy found vent in queer crooning sounds, accompanied by swift light pats of his absurdly tiny white forepaws. Grief was expressed in something too much like human sobs to be funny. And so on through every possible emotion, except fear. The great dog did not know fear. No one, listening when Lad talked, could doubt he was seeking to imitate the intonation and meanings of the human voice. Once the mistress and I went on a visit of sympathy to a lugubrious old woman, who had lived some miles from Sunnybank and who had been laid up for weeks with a broken arm. The arm had mended, but it was still a source of mental misery to the victim. We took Lad along on our call because the convalescent was fond of him. We had every cause soon to wish we had left him at home. From the instant we entered the old woman's house, a demon of evil mirth seemed to possess the dog. Outwardly, he was calm and sedate as usual. He curled up beside the mistress, and with head gravely on one side, proceeded to listen to our hostess's tale of the long and painful illness. But scarcely had the whiningly groaning accents framed a single sentence of the recital, when Lad took up the woeful tale on his own account. His voice pitched in precisely the same key as the speaker's. He began to whine and to mumble. When the woman paused for breath, Lad filled in the brief interval with the most heart-rendingly lamentable groans, then continued his plaint with her. And all the time his deep-set, sorrowful eyes were fairly a dance with mischief, and the tip of his plumy tail was quivering in a tense effort not to betray his sinful glee by wagging. It was too much for me. I got out of the room as fast as I could. I escaped barely in time to hear the hostess moan. Isn't it wonderful how that dog understands my terrible suffering? He carries on just as if it were his own agony. But I knew better. In spite of Lad's affirmative groan and personal agony, Lad could never be lured into making a sound. And when the mistress or myself was unhappy, his swift and heartbroken sympathy did not take the form of lamentable ululations or of such impudent copying of our voices. It was just one of Lad's jokes. He realized as well as we did that the old lady was no longer in pain, and that she was a chronic calamity howler. That was his way of guying the mock sufferer. Genuine trouble always stirred him to the depths. But, his life long, he hated fraud. Lad's story is told in detail elsewhere, and I have here written overlong about him. But his human traits were myriad, and it's hard for me to condense an account of him. Then there was Bruce, hero of my dog book of the same name. Bruce's pedigree name was Sunnybank Goldsmith, and for many years he brought local dog show fame to the place by an unbroken succession of victories. A score of cups and medals and an armful of blue ribbons attest his physical perfection. But dog shows take no heed of a collie's mentality, nor of the thousand wistfully lovable traits which make him what he is. When we carved on Bruce's headstone the inscription, the dog without a fault. We referred less to his physical magnificence than to the soul and the heart of him. He was wholly different from Lad. He lacked Lad's d'Artagnan-like dash and gaiety and uncanny wisdom. Yet he was clever, and he had a strange sweetness of nature that I have found in no other dog, that and a perfect one-man dog obedience and goodness. 
Like Lad, he was never struck or otherwise punished, and never needed such punishment. He and Laddie were dear friends from the moment they met, and each was the only grown male dog with which the other would consent to be on terms of cordiality. Bruce had a melancholy dignity behind which lurked an elusive sense of fun. For his children, he had many dozens of them, he felt an eternal disgust, even aversion. Let visitors start to walk towards the puppy yards, and Bruce at once lowered his head and tail and slunk away. When a group of the puppies, out for a gallop, caught sight of their sire and bore down gleefully upon him, Bruce would stalk off in utter gloom. Too chivalric to hurt or even to growl at any one of the scrambling oncoming babies, he would nonetheless take himself out of their way with all possible haste. But on occasion he could rise to a sense of his duties as a parent, as when one of the young dogs was left tied for a few minutes to a clothesline three summers ago. The youngster gnawed the line in two and pranced merrily away on a rabbit hunt, dragging ten feet of rope with him. When I came home and saw the severed clothesline, I knew what must be happening, somewhere out in the woods. The dangling rope was certain to catch in some bush or stump, and the puppy in his struggles would snarl himself inextricably. There, unless help should come, he must starve to death. For twenty-four hours, two of the men and the mistress and myself scoured the forests and hills for a radius of several miles. We looked everywhere a luckless puppy would be likely to entangle himself. We shouted ourselves hoarse, in hope of an answering cry from the lost one. After a day and night of this fruitless search, the mistress and I set off again, this time taking Bruce along. At least, we started off taking him. After the first hundred yards, he took us. Why I bothered to follow him, I don't yet know. He struck a beeline through woods and brambles, traveling at a hard gallop and stopping every few moments for me to catch up with him. At the end of a mile, he plunged into a copse that was choked with briars. In the center of this he gave tongue, with a salvo of thunderous barks. Twice before I had searched this copse, but at his urgency I entered it again. In its exact center, hidden from view by a matted screen of briars and leaves, I found the runaway. His rope had caught in a root. He had then wound himself up in it, until the line enmeshed him and held him close to earth. A twist of it around his jaws had kept him from making a sound. He was half dead from fright and thirst. Having found and saved the younger dog, Bruce promptly lost all interest in him. He seemed ashamed, rather than pleased, at our laudations. On such few times as we went motoring without him, Bruce was always on hand to greet us on return. And his greeting took an odd form. Near the foot of the drive was a big forsythia bush. At sight of the approaching car, Bruce invariably rushed over to this bush and hid behind it. At least he bent his head until a branch of the bush hid it from view. Then, tail a quiver, he would crouch there, not realizing that all of him except his head was in plain sight to us. When at last the car was almost alongside, he would jump out and stand wagging his plumed tail excitedly to note our surprise at his unforeseen presence. Never did this jest pall on him. Never did he have the faintest idea that his head was the only part of his beautiful self which was not clearly visible. Bruce slept in my bedroom. In the morning, when one of the maids knocked at the door to wake me, he would get to his feet, cross the room to the bed, and lay his cold muzzle against my face, tapping at my arm or shoulder with his paw, until I opened my eyes. Then, at once, he went back to his rug and lay down again. Nor, if I failed to climb out of bed for another two hours, would he disturb me a second time. He had waked me once. After that, it was up to me to obey the summons, or to disregard it. That was no concern of Bruce's. His duty was done. But how did a mere dog know that the knock on the door was a signal for me to get up? Never by any chance did he disturb me until he heard that knock. He was psychic, too. Rex, a dog that I had had long before, used to sleep in a certain corner of the lower hall. He slept there for years. He was killed. Never afterward would Bruce set foot on the spot where Rex had been wont to lie. Time and again I have seen him skirt that part of the floor, making a semicircular detour in order to avoid stepping there. I have tested him a dozen times in the presence of guests. Always the result was the same. Peace to his stately, lovable, whimsical soul. He was my dear chum, and his going has left an ache. Wolf is Lad's son, wiry and undersized, yet he is as golden as Catherine Lee Bates's immortal Sigurd. He inherits his sire's wonderful brain as well as Laddie's keen sense of humor. Savage and hating strangers, Wolf has learned the law to the extent. 
no one walking or motoring down the drive from the gate and coming straight to the front door must be molested though no stranger crossing the grounds or prowling within their limits need be tolerated a guest may pat him on the head at will and wolf must make no sign of resentment but all my years of training do not prevent him from snarling in fierce menace if a visitor seeks to pat his sensitive body very young children are the only exceptions to this rule of his toddling babies may maul him to their heart's content and wolf revels in the discomfort like lad he is the mistress's dog not merely because he belongs to her but because he has adopted her for his deity when we leave sunnybank for two or three months yearly in midwinter wolf knows we are going even before the trunks are brought from the attic for packing and from that time on he is in dire silent misery when at last the car carries us out of the gate he sits down points his muzzle skyward and shakes the air with a series of raucous wolf howls after five minutes of which he sullenly stoically takes up the burden of loneliness until our return the queer part of it is that he knows as lad and bruce used to know in some occult way when we are coming home and for hours before our return he is in a state of crazy excitement i don't try to explain this i have no explanation for it but it can be proven by anyone at sunnybank the ancestral herding instinct is strong in wolf it made itself known first when a car was coming down the drive towards the house at a somewhat reckless pace several years ago in the center of the drive several of the collie pups were playing when the car was almost on top of the heedless bevy of youngsters wolf darted out from the veranda rushed in among the pups and shouldered them off the drive and up onto the bank at either side he cleared the drive of every one of them then bounded aside barely in time to escape the car's front wheels he was praised for this bit of quick thought and quicker action and the praise made him inordinately proud from that day on he has hustled every pup or grown dog off the drive whenever a car has come in sight through the gateway when the pups are too far scattered for him to round them up and shove them out of harm's way in so short a time he adopts a still better mode of clearing the drive barking in wild ecstasy he rushes at top speed down the lawn as though in pursuit of some highly alluring prey no living pup can resist such a call every one of the youngsters dashes in pursuit then as soon as the last of them is far enough away from the drive wolf stops and comes trotting back to the house he has done this again and again to me it savors of human reasoning in the car wolf is as efficient a guard as any policeman when the mistress drives alone he sits on the front seat beside her if she stops in front of any shop he is at once on the alert at such times a woman acquaintance may come alongside for a word with her wolf pays no heed to the newcomer but let a man approach the car and wolf is up on his toes and ready for trouble if the man lays a hand on the automobile in the course of the chat wolf is at his throat when i am driving with the mistress he lies on the rear seat and does not bother to act as policeman except when we leave the car in his keeping people hereabouts know this trait of wolf's and his aversion to any stranger and they forbear to touch the car when talking with us last year a friend came alongside while we were waiting one evening for the mail to be sorted wolf had never before seen this man yet after a single glance the dog lost his usual air of hostility there was a slight tremble in our friend's voice as he said to us my collie was run over today and killed we are mighty unhappy at our house this evening as he spoke he laid his hand on the door of the car wolf lurched forward as usual but to our amazement instead of attacking he whimpered softly and licked the man's face never before or since have i seen him show any sign of friendly interest in a stranger not even to this same man when they chanced to meet again a few months later bruce's son jock was the finest pup from a dog show point of view and in every other way that we have been able to breed jock was physical perfection and he had a brain too an abundant charm and a most intensely haunting personality he had from earliest puppyhood all the steadfast qualities of a veteran dog and at the same time a baby-like friendliness and love of play nor did he know what it was to be afraid always in presence of danger he met the menace with a furious charge accompanied by a clear trumpet bark of gay defiance once for instance he had been lying beside my chair on the veranda suddenly he jumped to his feet with that same gay fierce bark i turned to see what had excited him a huge copperhead snake had crawled up the vines to the porch floor and wriggled on to within a foot or two of my chair 
Jock was barely six months old, yet he flew to the assault with more sense than would many a grown dog. All dogs have a horror of copperheads, and Jock was no exception. By instinct, he seemed to know what the snake's tactics would be, for he strove to catch the foe by the back of the neck before the copperhead could coil. He was a fraction of a second too late, yet he was nimble and wise enough to spring back out of reach before the coiling serpent could strike. Then, with that same glad bark of defiance, he danced about his enemy, trying to take the snake from the rear, and to flash in and get a neck grip before the copperhead could recoil after each futile strike. I put an end to the battle by a bullet in the snake's ugly head, and Jacques was mortally offended with me for hours thereafter for spoiling his fun. When he was eight months old, I took the little chap to Patterson to his first and last dog show. Never before had he been off the place or in a house. Yet he bore himself like a seasoned traveler, and he showed with the perfection of a champion. He won in class after class, annexing two silver cups and several blue ribbons. His peerless sire, Bruce, was the only collie in the whole show able to win over him that day. Jock beat every other contestant. He seemed to enjoy showing and to delight in the novelty and excitement of it all. He was at the show for only a few hours, and it was a triumph day for him. Yet cheerfully would I give a thousand dollars not to have taken him there, for he brought home not only as many prizes, but a virulent case of distemper, as did other dogs that attended the same show. Of course, I had had him, as well as all my other dogs, inoculated against distemper long before, and such precautions are supposed to be effective. But the disease got through the inoculation and infected him. He made a gallant fight of it. Oh, a gallant fight. The fearless little thoroughbred. But it was too much for him. For five weeks, he and I fought that grindingly losing battle. Then, in the dim gray of a November dawn, he lifted his head from my knee and peered through the shadows towards one black corner of the room. No one watching him could have doubted that he saw something lurking there in the dark. Sharply, he eyed the dim room corner for an instant. Then from his throat burst forth that glad, fierce, defiance bark of his, his fearlessly gay battle shout, and he fell back dead. What did he see, waiting for him, there in the murk of shadows? Perhaps nothing. Perhaps the arch-fear and visible shape. Who knows? In any case, whatever it was, he did not fear it. He challenged it as fiercely as ever he had challenged mortal foe and his hero spirit went forth to do battle with it, unafraid. God grant us all so gallant an ending. His little mother, Sunnybank Jean, had never cast Jock off, as do most dog mothers when their pups are weaned. To the day, I quarantined him for distemper. She and her son had been inseparable. A week after Jock's death, Jean came running up to me, shaking with glad eagerness, and led me to the grave where the puppy had been buried. It was far off and I had hoped she would not be able to find it. But she had been searching very patiently, whenever she was free, and now, when she had led me to the grave, she lay down close beside it, not despondently, but wagging her plume tail gently, and as if she had found at last a clue in her long search. Scent, or some other sense, told her she was nearer her baby than she had been in days, and she was well content to wait there until he should come back. All of which is maudlin, perhaps, but it is true. Perhaps it is also maudlin to wonder why a sane human should be fool enough to let himself care for a dog when he knows that at best he is due for a man-sized headache within a pitifully brief span of years. Dogs live so short a time, and we humans so long. This rambling tale of my dogs leaves no room to tell at length of the collie who was never allowed in the dining room until after the dinner coffee was served, and who came the length of the hall and up to the table the moment the maid brought in the coffee cups. How he timed it to the very second, none of us knew. Yet not once did he miss connections by the slightest fraction of a minute. Nor does it permit the tale of the collie pup who was proud of his stunt in learning to take the morning paper off the front steps and carry it into the dining room, and whose pride in the accomplishment led him presently to collect all the morning papers from all the doorsteps within the radius of a mile and deposit them happily at my feet. Nor can I tell of the collie that caught and followed the trail of my footsteps, through the rain, along a crowded city street, in and out of a maze of turnings, and came up with me inside of three minutes, nor of a long line of other collies, some of whom showed human intelligence, and some intelligence that was almost more than human, not even of the clown pup that was so elated over rounding up his first bunch of sheep 
that he proceeded to round up chickens and cats and every living and round upable creature that he could find. Nor of the collie, who, taught to fetch my hat, was wont to romp up to me in the presence of many outsiders, bearing proudly in his teeth an assortment of humble, not to say intimate and humiliating garments. Comedian dogs, spectacular dogs, gloriously human dogs, Sunnybank collies, of every phase of heart and brain and soul, one common and pathetically early tragedy has waited or waits for you all. Among you, you have taught me more of true loyalty and patience, and courtesy and divine forgiveness, and solid sanity, and fun, and a hundred other worthwhile lessons than all the masters I've studied under. I wonder if it's heretical to believe that when at last my tired feet shall tread the other shore, a madly welcoming swirl of exultant collies, the splendid sunny-banked dogs that have been my chums here, will bound forward, circling and barking around me, to lead me home. Heretical or otherwise, I want to believe it. And if I fail to find them there, I shall know I have taken the wrong turning and have reached a goal other than I had hoped for. End of section 20 End of Buff A Collie and Other Dog Stories by Albert Payson Terhune